one look at the patience. He just has to send away two of the lineup. One, two. Oh, Doki. What a play. That is why he is one of the best players in the world right now. Oh, no, adapt and he can swing this with the Ella Striker. And they're not ready for with the Ella. SMG. Yeah, he's gonna get botted. Tyrant fires the oh. on the second shot. He's dropped the pistol. He's dropped into pro on this ten <laughs> seconds left. Tyrant, what a round! He's in position to strike. He's able to land his shots here. He's got oh. a huge oh. swing. Picks up two. That's surprising that no, he didn't fall back at that point. And now we're left in a very tight situation. Ryan has just walked his way through. He gets two. Unica is gonna take a little bit of damage as well. But oh, with his back against Unica, Roth is gonna go down, but instantly traded. Harold with a double there. That's huge. Once again, welcome to the Rainbow Six Northern Premier League. We are into player day seven. Can you believe it? This season is well and truly flying by. Blink and you'll miss it. My name's Ian Chambers. I am delighted to be back as your host once again. And I'm going to bring in a couple of analysts. A couple of wonderful analysts to kick things off here tonight for player day seven. It is X and Grace on our virtual analyst desk. Here they come. Zoom. Just like that. Just like magic. <laughs> Guys, Welcome. And you know what, Grace? There's a, there's a bit of an issue going on here. I, I feel like you didn't get the memo. You know what I'm talking about. Oh, spectacles. <laughs> spectacles. Yeah. I'm sorry. Next time I'll do better. You still look wonderful. And you've got 2020 20 vision. So you're the real I really one don't. <laughs> I, really, <laughs> I think I need to go and get my eyes tested genuinely. But maybe next week I'll have spectacles. Spectacles. We'll bring them on. <laughs> X, X, are you excited for another player day of the NPL? Always. Can't wait to get stuck into a little bit of Siege. I feel like the play days are whizzing us by at the moment. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to getting in 7 and 8. Yeah, it's going quickly, isn't it, Grace? Before you know it, we're going to mm. be at the final stage of this. 100%. Uh, it's getting to that kind of like almost midway point now. So this is where things are going to start getting a little bit a little bit fruity. A few teams starting to get on the ropes a little bit. Glorious stuff. Well, I'm back off the ropes. Last time I was here, I was feeling a bit ropey, but I am well and truly... Back in business, so let's get into this. Let's first take a look back at our end of day results from play day six. Um, last time we were here, this is how it all went down and how it all unfolded. I'm going to come to you first, Gracie. I think 10 star versus heroic was pretty spicy. Uh, that's it, isn't it? We were just talking about people being on the ropes a little bit, and I think certainly 10 star gave heroic their money's worth there. Um, again, I believe that was actually a bank, which 10 star, uh, weirdly, this season they've mostly gone to kind of clubhouse bank situations and they've had a good a good shout with it and I think they are very very strong on bank so that scoreline is not surprising obviously as well heroic not really f using their full set strats as they do have the major coming up as well so um I think really that's a nice one to look at because it shows the the skill level of 10 star and how they are willing to really even push those t1 teams to their limit yeah x we, we've seen in, in the past if you ever get to the bottom end of a table it can be really difficult to climb your way back out if you get on a run of bad form it can be sometimes tough to break that spell and we're seeing more of that for arctic riddle and uh, coalesce yeah they're really not having the best of time here are they and it's uh it's getting a little bit tricky you know because you want to be you want to be looking at these games and thinking yeah we've got some you know really close matchups tonight but you and you look at play day six there was two close matches and is a seven four close you know it's, it's it's a bit of a stretch to say it was a close game um, it, it was at least competitive and Riddle got a couple of rounds against Viperio, but it was by no means, uh, you know, the, the sort of 7-8 we saw from 10 Star versus Heroic or, you know, two teams really battling it out for uh, for every single round. There's been, you know, quite a couple of uh, sort of cleanish sweeps and it's going to be all about how Arctic Riddle and Coalesce really respond to that. Yeah, well, we've seen the numbers on paper. That's how it all played out. But let's <laughs> take a look back at some of the action here, taking... A glance first at Coalesce versus Victor. So I'll, I'll let you discuss some of the players that we're seeing before ours here, Grace. I know, I just, I'll just start it off that knife kill in the closet. Just it showed the chaos that Coalesce were bringing to that. And again, Victor's on Villa. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful sight. It's like peanut butter and jam. Uh, I do love that, don't you? I, I, I really do. I, it's one of my favourite sandwiches. And again, one of my favourite things to see is Flexi going absolutely insane. I think, again, just showing the skill level of the Victor's players compared to, you know, Cider Co at Coles. Yeah, Victor's looking decent this season. Ambush versus Navi. This one ended 7-3 to Navi. Not really an unexpected result, would you say, here, X? 
Yeah, I mean, Ambush are known for the cafe, and, you know, we were all sort of sat here, and certainly Snurley for New Bros were very happy to uh, throw us into this game. Uh, they were on the desk, and I think me and Demo were casting it, and it, it was just one of those games where you could just tell that Navi were a step ahead. You could just get that sense and that feeling that, you know, Navi had a very good idea of how they wanted to play this. That, that T1 experience really started to show through, particularly in that game. It's interesting, isn't it? Because I think that when you get those fine margins, that tier one experience can really push you over the line. And then Heroic here versus 10 Star. Like you said, Grace, this was an absolute band burner. It certainly was. Again, 10 Star on Bank just seems to be a really, really good mix at the moment. It's one of their strongest maps, in my opinion. And as I say, that's probably why we are seeing them mostly go to this map. Um, it'd be interesting to see if they actually pick it on today's matchup. But for the most part, yeah, Heroic, obviously being a T1 team, you would expect them to kind of come through a little bit spicy. Of course, the reverse sweep did start to come through and we did end up uh, with, you know, obviously Heroic closing it out. So that's, again, showing the um, amount of form that Heroic have being able to go to overtime from what was a, looking a little bit like a 10-star a win. We can only hope for more best of ones like that. And then we move on to Arctic versus Eminem Academy. Eminem Academy getting a, a convincing win here, Ollie. Yeah, they, uh, they played some really nice siege. I think they were very objective focused. There was plenty of plants getting put down. A clean attack in half as well. Um, I can't remember if it went the full six, no, five, one on the attacks. So you can't really argue with that on bank. If you can win your attacks, usually you're pretty good. Um, and especially with the, the way that Arctic were banning out, Arctic were really conscious of banning out that Finker. It left a lot more utility open. And we really just saw Eminem Academy play into that. Finally, Vaperia 86 versus Riddle Nuther. Loss for Riddle, really struggling at the minute. 86, picking up the dub, and, and they found themselves in third place now, Grace. Yeah, and I think they certainly needed that a little bit. It um, has been a bit of a, a, a confuse. I wouldn't say so much confusing, but more of a um, anticlimactic performance to start the season. So it's starting to see them, you know, get the wind under their sails, so to speak, and start to kind of show why they are by Perio 86. All right, so that's all of the play that we experience in our final play day, which leaves us with these standings. The 10 teams that you see in front of you, here's how it looks going into play day seven. Team Heroic sitting pretty at top with 17 points to their name. It's really tight at the, for the top three, really. And then, as you might expect, X, that mid-table is looking, you know, all up for grabs. Battle of the mid-table, as ever. You know, that three to sixth place is very important indeed. Um, and, and, you know, you look toward that seventh and eighth, ninth and tenth, and you start to think about the prospect of, of relegation potentially. So, you know, you look at the top of the table and you think, yep, heroic, they're going to be sitting pretty. Victor's Viperio, they're locked in as well. You know, these guys, they're not going anywhere now from that top three or four. They're not going to shift too much in and amongst that. There's a chance for Ambush or Ten Star to make a bit of a push for that. Even Eminem Academy, maybe. But I would imagine that the top of the table stays relatively the same. Um, and it's going to be all about the bottom. It's, it's going to be, you know, who can start to pick up some points here? Riddle still yet to pick up any points. Um, and, you know, one win for them could be, could be quite big this week. Yeah, it's, it's interesting, Grace, because you can't really blame Ollie for being confident that those top three are pretty much set in stone. But in mm -hmm. reality, fourth, fifth and sixth, there is room for a surge there. There certainly is. And, you know, in an ideal world, all sunshine and rainbows, we'd maybe have like a, a, ni a nicer mix of kind of UK and Nordics teams with those T1s. But I think this is the interesting thing. Ambush are the ones kind of lighting the beacon, so to speak, for the Nordics teams. They are the ones that are going to be most likely trying to gun for those top positions. And... I think as time goes on, it's it's a bit of a shame to see the rest of the Nordic teams at the bottom and it's mostly wondering whether they can get into that mid table. As we say, this is only kind of the halfway point-ish. So it's um, all about kind of pushing up as far as you can. And um, yeah, as I, I think I agree with what X says with 10 kind of maybe moving up a little bit there. Absolutely. And I would love to see some of these Nordic teams start to, to climb the ladder a little bit. Mm. So best of luck to these guys as we go along. Speaking of going along, here are our next five matches. Well... Four, actually. I'll tell you why in a minute. Uh, here is today's schedule. So as you can see, we've got Riddle versus Eminem Academy to kick things off. Then we move on to Ambush versus Arctic. And then the one that yeah, I'm quite looking forward to. Team Heroic versus Viperia 86. Grace is really looking forward to Victors versus 10 Star. And as you can see, <laughs> Navi versus Coalesce. Hmm. What's happened there? What we can tell you is Navi have forfeited the next two games here in the Northern Premier League. We'll have an update on that when the time comes. 
coalesce, get the forfeit win here tonight. So I'm pretty certain, X, that coalesce will be pretty happy with that result. It's not the, the it's not the best way to get your first three points, is it, Ian? But <laughs> it's, it's not, but you'll take it. You'll take it. You'll take anything you can get at this point, and Coalesce are just going to have to take it and run with it. Um, you know, fortunately for them, they, they do get the default win, um, and they get the seven, full seven rounds as well, so nice little bit of padding for the round difference. Now, you, you know, we, we sort of joke around and stuff, but that could be quite big when, when it comes down to something like relegation, because it's, it could come down to round difference if the points are tied and if the head-to-heads and, you know, all, all those sort of things get taken into consideration um but really really for me the the highlight of the night and, and the two big talking points heroic versus 86 and 10 star yeah. versus victors we've got two matches to watch tonight it's gonna be it's gonna be a, a potentially another long night and that is what we like here on these streams chris it, it's he's it right isn't he there for, from x like if you're at the bottom and you get gifted a forfeit win like that when you get to the final stages it can come down to those final margins yeah 100 percent. that round difference can you know make or break you it can it's almost like a safety net in a way um yeah. so again as time goes on if those bottom of the of the ladder teams can start to fight a little bit harder and really start to get their counter strat on fleek uh we might see them get a little bit higher just off down around uh, round differential alone so um again i think they will be disappointed it happened the way it did but they're mm. probably going to be pretty happy about it when it comes to later on in the season Great. Speaking of on fleek, can I just say your hair is on fleek tonight? It's Thank you. Good. There you go. Thank so I'm feeling you. complimentary tonight. <laughs> yours, yours too, Ollie. Yours too. Thank um, you. Yeah, look, one, thing that, one thing that's become a nice consistent part of our pre-shows is we take a look at some of the top fives um, from the teams across the board. And we're going to take it a look right now, starting with our top five season KD ratio. And here are the names that are popping up this time, X. Yep, um, I, I kind of like these top fives. I think it's good to sort of go through and highlight and maybe at the split, you know, we can start thinking, you know, who got the most top fives or something like that, but uh, or certainly to round it out at the end of the season as a maybe a little reward ceremony. But uh, yeah, Gorgona sitting there at a 2.0 KD. Now, what I will say about Gorgona, that stat isn't entirely sort of, it's a, it's a correct stat. I'm not, I'm not dissing Afi here. But he hasn't played that many games. So this isn't like Gorgona's going out week in, week out and putting in a performance. Whereas on the flip side of it, if you look at the others, they are playing every single week. Uh, we've got Savage, Flexi, Benja, and Nathan. I suspect that Benja flew up in this statistic after his game last week. He got an insane amount of kills. I think he ended up with, I think he ended up with 20 kills. Um, he certainly broke the kill record for NPL in that game um on bank i think if um if gorgona could say anything to you right now ollie it'd be quality not quantity that's what i think it's uh, <laughs> and he'd be right to do so <laughs> <laughs> let's move on to cost grace and i'll let you talk us through some of the numbers here okie kokey well again you know uh, typically you'd say above 60 percent is a good cost for any team but when we get to that 70 percent margin those are the players that are really pulling in an absolute shift for their team unsurprisingly to see, you know, Oscar and Flexi there, to be honest. We have seen them just absolutely showing up every single play day. Um, Jegs as well on 10 star, leader on 10 star. Of course, we've got Mr. Officer there. <laughs> which... I can never get enough of that guy. I can never I get enough of that guy. It's, it's, it looks like some kind of perfect boy band really happening on, on our <laughs> screens right now. But no, um, this is, you know, Officer, of course, it's really lovely to see him there. But I just want to point out that having 10 star and Victor's Fair is the highest cost again. Um, and I can probably feel Snarl and Ubros kind of rolling their eyes a little bit here. But once again, the UK massive on top. There is a reason why Victus and Tenstar are hyped up so much. And the proof is in the pudding. In this case, it's a costy pudding. Costy pudding. Never had, <laughs> never had one of those before. Let's move on to opening kills now. I think this is our final graphic that we're going to bring up of our top fives. And uh, five tip players looking very strong here. Ollie, I'll we've come got, to you. We've got some really impressive opening kill go-getters here in the NPL. And of course, it's it's all backed up. And if we could, we would, believe me, if we could say who has droned the most opening kills, we would do that as a, as a statistic. But poor old <laughs> Affy would probably lose his marbles trying to figure that one out. <laughs> so instead, we've just got to go for the guys that are pulling the trigger. Um, Oscar, Jegs, YZN, Pat and Azza all sporting fairly good opening kds here oscar 18 to 6 that mm. is uh pretty incredible um to go three times positive there on that opener 
So, you know, you've got to you've got to give these guys credit. This is, you know, a large reason as to why the rounds are going in these teams' favour is because they're getting that opening advantage. Yep, and it gives you guys watching a heads up of who you need to be keeping your eye on when we kick things off here for play date number seven. Right, let's talk about the match to watch. We've hyped it up already in bits and pieces leading up to this moment. Grace, I know that you're very, very, very <laughs> excited for Victor's versus so Tenstar. Do you want to tell us, tell us why initially that you are so hyped for this one? It's just, you know, it's it's for two teams that are hyped to be the next ones up. There's so much backstory here. There's the Yukin Rumble at the start of the year. There's Yukin 2 at the start of the year. The way that these two would ultimately going head to head constantly. Um, we did see some upsets as well, especially in Rainbow Rumble, where, um, you know, there was a bit of hesitance as to whether Ten Star would step up to the plate with that because a majority of their wins within that were off of forfeits. And Victors were turning around and kind of being like, Delta Project who? Um, so it was kind of a really exciting matchup that Tenstar then free owed. Um, brilliant stuff. It's what we like to see. And again, I think uh, I, I remember being so excited that weekend. This is the, the extension of the weekend. This is the sequel to that weekend in my eyes. And I think going forward, it's going to be and we will see a lot more of these two rosters going head to head, I reckon. And that's just exciting stuff. Head to head was a wonderful choice of words because we're about to get into one of them right now. Head to head. <laughs> Flexi versus Savage. The two players that you should potentially be keeping a really close eye on here, Ellie. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I mean, Flexi is, is a player that has matured exceptionally well, um, in my opinion, having had the chance to watch him and cast him over in the Nordic League and, and see how he played inside of High Coast, I believe it was back then, um, to see obviously his progression into Delta Project and now into Victus here. Um, it's great to see, you know, how, how he's sort of really fallen into that flex support role that has still got the potential to pop off, um, you know, still very mechanically skilled, but can, uh, you know, get that get that sort of support role down. Um, flank watch, playing a bit of Nomad. I think he's even played a bit of hard breach here and there. Victor's quite flexible in their sort of picks. Um, and then on the flip side of it, you look at somebody like Savage, who can be a big reason as to, you know, why 10 Star could, could credit themselves with some of the games that they've won. Um, you know, Savage can be a, a huge impact player. And I think that the days that Savage, you know, hasn't necessarily popped off, it's, it's sort of been noticed. Um, so, uh, you know, a lot rides on his shoulders. Yeah, he's become a pillar of this team, hasn't he, Grace? Mm, absolutely. Um, again, I think that when we talk about kind of rising stars, ironically, because that is actually on his roster as well, uh, his uh, roster t-shirt as well. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that is completely, you know, true about this player. And it's also true about Flexi as well. I think that they're putting on phenomenal performances within this season already. We've seen, obviously, as I mentioned previously, them putting on phenomenal performances. I think Savage probably being a newer, um, a newer player there, but it's this fact that as time goes on and you see the development of those players, like they're already doing amazing in these rosters. And as time goes on, they just keep getting better and better and better and better. You know, as I say, we saw Tensar completely have heroic on the ropes the other night. And I think that's something we're going to keep seeing from these two teams. Yeah, well, that's the match to watch. So you've got to make sure you're here for that a little bit later on. But for now, let's take a look at some of our predictions. I, I mean, I haven't been fully aware because I've been aware for a while of how you... <laughs> I'll tell you what, right? To the production team, that photo of me was taken in 2019. Come on now. We need to update that, Ollie. What do you think? Well, Did, all, surely... All Jakey, producer Jakey just said in my ear, that's the one I was given. Surely that's on you to send a new one in. Mm. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm kidding. The heat is on me. Nobody cares about that anyway. What am I doing? Let's take a look at our <laughs> talent predictions. Ollie, we were looking like we're on the same page, but then you go out there and choose Viperia. Um, I think it's important to mix things up. I've had, I've had a couple of good weeks on the predictions, um, but there has been a couple of upsets that, you know, have have, have upset a lot of people. Um, and <laughs> I just thought last week in the heroic game, honestly, if Benja doesn't drop an insane amount of kills, heroic lose that game. And 10 star were very unfortunate to lose. 10 star will have walked away from that one thinking that was a game we should have won. It doesn't matter who heroic are they're just they're just five players and if if you just take that game and don't have anybody's name tags up and show anybody that knows anything about siege you know and ask them who should win this game they will say that 10 star should have won that game because it was it, it was incredibly close um so and, I, and that's not to to liken viperio and 10 star too much but it's just to say that heroic have got a loss in them 
and I've said this from the start, they're going to lose one game this season. They, you know, they can't just keep relying on pulling things out of the bag and reverse sweeps, hence going for a little bit of an off pick. I've not decided yet, Ian, if I'm going to pick against them every single time until <laughs> it does or if it does happen. Oh, well, we'll have to wait and see. But one thing I don't like about this prediction graphic is that uh, I, I don't remember them putting at the top how many we got correct. Um, although I've only, I've only got 12 out of 20. That's pretty good. 12 out of 20 is good. 24 out of 30 for you and Grace. Ollie, Grace, you're looking, you're looking strong with your predictions this time around. I, I am. I am, I am indeed. I mean, that's why it's quite... I'm just going to explain to everyone that obviously there is a screaming face uh, as my prediction for Victus versus Tenstar. Um, which might be throwing my prediction ELO slightly because <laughs> oh, obviously yeah. I haven't made a full a full prediction there and it's because I I genuinely cannot predict how that's going to go Ian like I, I, I think at the end well, of the I'm day I'm going to force you to predict so that's I mean that's no, what we're no, going to no, do no. you got, you got to pick somebody right now <laughs> I, I think it's a difficult one because obviously you know as I mentioned before Rainbow Rumble Tensar turned around and free film free nilled Victus and um, mm. there was some incredible counter strategy coming through within that um, best of five as well it was honestly just I, I i think you remember i was losing my mind and yeah at the same time victus given the the standard and quality of those players they've just picked up jake Salster as a coach and um, i think they just got digestive in as an analyst but i think he's still pretty fresh as well but it's this idea that you've got two teams there where the, the player rosters are absolutely cracked. You've then got this amazing pool of support staff behind both of these rosters. There's also the possibility for a revenge arc where if you're Victus, this is the match you want to win. Out of probably most of them that's happened so far, this is for one because it's that revenge arc, and It's that idea yeah. of, well, you've, you've beat us once. We're not going to let it happen again. At the same time, 10 star are going to be like, well, we don't want you to try and beat us. We're obviously going to be trying maintaining that title, maintaining that kind of talking point above you where we can beat you again and be like, yeah, second time in a row. Let's go. Third time, actually, because you can too. Mm. Well, mm. but... We can't hype up that match enough. We need to make sure that everybody is here for it. Call your friends, call your family, call your nana. Tell them to get involved. Victors versus 10 stars coming up later on. I will say as well, whip it. I know you're ready waiting in the wings to get stuck into our first match. You need to start, sort your prediction game out, brother. I think you're on 16 <laughs> out of 30. It's not good enough. Right, we're going to wrap up the pre-show here. And when we come back, we're going to be getting into 12, all the, by the preview. Way. Sorry? The audacity. <laughs> I did 12, by the way, Ian. 12. <laughs> Who had 12? You. you. <laughs> uh, yeah, but man's 12, out, man's 12 out of 20. Uh, Is it 16 out of 30? <laughs> Man, honestly, you can't talk about predictions. <laughs> Oh, I get thrown under the bus as I'm thrown to the break. I can't believe it. <laughs> right. That is the end of the pre-show, the prep phase. When we come back, I don't even know if I'm going to come back now. I don't know if I can be bothered. Oh. Like with these two mugs. No, it's Riddle versus Eminem Academy. We've got all the preview in a few minutes' time. MPL is fully underway now, and it's time to consider what tasty treats these matchups will bring us. For this week's play day, 10 Star versus Victus is our match to watch. Let's get into it. Oscar and YZN previously played together in PG Nats, and then they entered back into their own national scenes with a new roster last December named LFO. After Yukin 2 and Rainbow Rumble, they made further roster changes and were picked up by Victus. Oscar and Flexi are the ones to keep your eyes on for eye-watering plays. Both currently have the highest costs in the entire league, which shows significant plays are being shown by these two. And now over to 10star. The hype around this roster really went 0 to 100 at the start of the year. People were keen to see how the young gunner of Rolo would perform, and the start of the year saw this team really make their mark within the UK and Ireland scene, with incredible performances. Jex is currently battling the Victus lads for the highest cost at 71%, while Savage has been fragging out of his mind, something we are expecting to continue over the coming months. The start of 2022 saw prominent performances from both of these teams within Yukin 2 and Yukin Rainbow Rumble. Within Yukin 2, Victus, under the name of LFO, finished first, only dropping a map to 10 star ironically on Play Day 3, whilst 10 star finished second. Within Rainbow Rumble, both of these teams made it to the Grand Finals. People were curious how it would end after witnessing 10 star win off of forfeits, and LFO Victus beating popular teams like Delta Project and Myperio 86 but 10 star proved themselves to everyone in the finals by beating LFO Victus 3-0 in the weighted best of five. 
bringing us to NPL. This matchup will not only showcase the talents of two teams we all adore for being the next ones up, it will also provide the opportunity for Victus to get a slice of revenge. Alternatively, Tensar could once again take the win. Given that we have seen multiple moments of genius flowing through the mechanics of the Tensar boys, and Victus's pickup of Jake Southster as a coach, combined with the current high progression of the Victus players, it's set to be a scorcher. So grab your snacks, bring a cooling spray, and see you on play day seven.
charge up your the battery that keeps me awake. Reload under your control before I break. Killing frustration, have to do it all to survive the nightfall. When you fight against the tide and you're about to lose your mind, it's easy to cross the Three quick kills, four quick kills coming. And Slothar just picks them apart. And try and put some shots on in and managing to find the last two. Oh, but Blur just decimates. Prince steps up huge for Ambush. Three kills, 41 DCs. And what? Welcome back to the Rainbow Six Northern Premier League with me, Ian Chambers. We've got X and Grace. Um, I was just saying that when we come back on air, I was going to say, Woo! So there you are. I did it. <laughs> doesn't count. That does count, because I'm excited. Count. And I wanted to let one out. Grace, do you want to let one out? or? Woo! There we go. I'm not even going to ask X, because I know what he's like. Right. I would have done back. it. All right, go okay. on, X. Let's do it. No, I'm all right. Oh. <laughs> there we are. <laughs> Real does it. Real does it. Oh, there it is. There he is. Beautiful. Right, we're going to kick things off our first best of one here this evening or wherever you are in the world. I'm not sure what time you're at. It is, of course, Riddle versus Eminem Academy. We'll start by taking a look at this Riddle roster. Rolls off the tongue, that, doesn't it? Um, X, six play days, six losses. They have struggled, to say the least. And that is saying the least. Um, mm. They... It's difficult to find something to say about this Riddle roster. You know, we can look at some of the players and we can look at somebody um, like maybe Kevin and say that they've, they've shown, you know, good signs. Um, Perry as well has, has, has got, you know, one of the higher KDs on the on the team, but no one's really sitting above a 1 KD. Out. Like, I think the highest is a 0.88. Um, so on the, on the whole, it's not really been that easy going. Um, that being said, I think it's certainly worth saying that Riddle have had some tough games. Um, they've done ten star Victus, Navi. Um, who did they play? They played. They played Arctic and lost. Now that was the that was the sort of the clincher there. We were looking to see how these two teams faced off. It was on Skyscraper. Um, but the, but they have played some more of the, the the sort of tougher competition. They played Heroic last week, and they also played Eminem Academy. Um, but they're going to have to start finding wins. Some oh, sorry, they didn't play Eminem Academy. They played um viperio so they've gone through like all of the all of the top table uh sort of teams but they are gonna have to start finding wins somewhere um and tonight might be it you know tonight really might be it but we we just need to see more from them as a roster the the teamwork the timing it, it really is those basics that me and demo have sort of been looking to drill home is that you know if you do your basics well you will be rewarded with rounds and sometimes the basics are just a little bit lacking Ultimately, Grace, if you are this this team, you can't get too bogged down in the losses because mm. there are still achievements to be had here. There are still lessons to learn. You know, mm -hmm. ev everything they've gone through up until this point, they just need to leave in the past and see if they can get something out of this season as, as we push forward here. Yeah, 100%. Um, I know that obviously their first games, they were against very difficult opponents, but it's this idea of eating the frog. Um, which people like to use. And I think once you've got those maybe trickier games out the way, that gives you a lot of data to go off when it comes to working around scrims and things like that. And it's what we were saying from the start with the creation of NPL. It does give the Nordic teams that opportunity to kind of start fine tuning themselves to a higher standard a little bit, given on the incredibly high standard of the Yukin uh, rosters and players that we see historically. So um, yeah, I don't think they're going to be too bummed out about it. I think it is just a really nice learning experience for them really. Staying with you now, Grace, let's take a look at the Eminem Academy roster. We can't yes. get enough of your voice. We're just going to keep on going. Okay, um, okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, for, the, for these guys, it's been a different story. Uh, they've been, I, I would say, quite impressive, um, considering expectations of them coming into this. Mm. Three wins, three losses, sitting in sixth place. They're in a good position. 100%. And again, I think when this roster was announced, I was really, really excited because... Um, 
pretty much this entire roster are people who've been around the UK circuit for like the last two to three years anyway. Um, so it's this idea of, okay, it's almost like a mini super team in the sense that it's familiar faces and names that everybody knows. And I think that when you get a team like that, it means, okay, now you just get that element of teamwork makes a dream work and see how they get on with it. And I really like what they're actually showing and what they're bringing to the table. I think there's been a few stinky moments where perhaps their positioning is a little bit um, left to be desired. But again, that stuff is easily fixed. I think there's so much promise within this roster. And I think going forward in the season, they're going to start really showing everyone why they're here. Yeah, there's, there's room for improvement, X. But, you know, that being said, that there are still positives to take from this side so far. Absolutely. And I think some of the set pieces that they've been playing have been really good. They've obviously got some, um, you know, clear ideas for looking to get the plant down. Um, I think Nerf's definitely going to be up there in terms of, um, you know, the most plants. Um, he's, he's regularly getting it down, currently got five, Akari on two. So as a team, they're getting the diffuser down quite a quite a bit. Um, and, and they've got that skill to back it up. You know, you look at somebody like Skiddy, you look at someone like Akari, and you're going to be expecting them to to really pop off and they've both had both had highlight weeks uh, i think another thing that's quite nice about the academy team is that they sort of take a little bit of inspiration from the main team you know we've seen them play chalet we've seen them try and do very similar things to what we see the 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 eul team do uh in m&m in, in in a chalet attack so they, they've got that sort of bigger brother to learn from um I, I don't know what the dynamic is between the two sides i don't know if they actually do scrim each other it would make sense if they did um but they're going to be in that environment of you know success um and, and we we all know eminem is a, is a fantastic org as well and it, it really does mm. sort of breed talent so um they've, they've impressed me so far and one player that's impressed you so far and a lot of the talent team here is of course akari you mentioned his name a couple of times there ollie let's take a look at this this guy Let's look at some of his stats. Let's ha shine a bit of a spotlight on him because he's worthy of it, Grace. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And again, I think those stats still don't prove the the quality of this player, really. Um, obviously, that is just a seasonal highlight. And again, Akari has been around the block a little bit at this point as well, which again is why it's so exciting that he's within this roster now. And I think going forward, it's going to be pretty pleasant. And I think we're going to see these stats probably get a bit more chunky um again still a, a decent cost still at that 60 percent it's hitting that threshold of like okay this is good um but obviously as well maintaining a positive kd within the tournament always good and as we said yeah plants getting those plants down uh, that's the all-important thing because at the end of the day it is coming down to how much you are focusing the objective when it plays through those rounds so um team akari for the win yeah strong player x absolutely um you know we've seen him have Big weeks. We've seen him have weeks where he's been a little bit quiet, and it's been noticed. Uh, that's always a mark of a player that's mm. you know got a, got a lot of uh, got a really important role in the team. You can see they're playing onto the sledge, playing in that flexible support role. Um, you know, being you know doing doing a lot of the brunt work inside of the mid round, whether that's you know opening up you know sort of vertical angles, getting nade kills out there, you know whatever it might be. Um, yeah, yeah, really really important. And I think you know the cost sixty percent again. It, it sort of sort of. It reinforces that point, as it were. Um, it's not to put too much pressure on these players, though. You know, it's 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 understandable that you know they're going to have the occasional off day, and it, it is noticed. But the, the the real highlight and the spotlight is when they're on; they are really on. Yeah, blips happen, and uh, you've got to admit here that Riddle can't really have another blip. I mean, they can, but ideally, coming into this one, they want to see this as a winnable opportunity and finally get the ball rolling here. Mm. Let's take a look at our map vetoes here. Uh, to find out where we are going for our first match of the evening. Ollie, here we go. Headed to Oregon. Uh, we've not actually seen that many Oregons. It's, uh, at least I don't feel like we have. Um, but we're running through the bands now. We've got Riddle removing anything un unusual, basically. Um, theme Park border, both off chalet gone as well makes sense bank removed it's it's the riddle are looking for a very standard map here riddle really aren't looking to stretch the boat out they want to play some um you know well rehearsed and, and well known siege here and where better to go than a clubhouse or an oregon leave it up to eminem to decide riddle seem happy to go to either i think this is probably the the better ban phase that we've seen from riddle so far um they've sometimes found themselves in a position where they end up on a bit of a squibbly map um but at least they've got a bit of oregon to play very you know fairly well balanced in in, in the current meta uh, i think attackers have got certainly a lot more opportunity than they ever have done on that map but it, it still probably leans a little bit defender 
if Ollie's right here, Grace, and you know, Riddle are looking to take a bit of a more simplistic siege route here, that's probably a good idea. Oh, one hundred percent. Um, again, yeah, as as we say, Clubhouse Oregon, it says even Steven maps Eminem could have either one, and it'd still probably be the same way. Um, Riddle signing on attack as well, as Ollie said, it's kind of a bit more even Stevens now with the attack defender waiting. Of course, defense still being a slightly bit ahead, but. We talk about the nade meta and things like that. There's loads of opportunities bar basement for that to come through, unless you're room clearing, I guess. But um, that's what I'm expecting to hopefully see from Riddle. Again, I know that Snowell's hyped up them up so much, especially certain players like Katal, who I'm going to call Kettle for, for the <laughs> meme. But I'm wanting to see them kind of shine through a little bit more, given on how much they are talked about. So um, I think having more of an equal map and an even map is going to hopefully allow some of that talent to shine through on the side of Riddle. Yeah, I think as you know, as a neutral potentially watching this, uh, there'll be a lot of fans backing Riddle to to finally get off the mark here. But at the same time, it's a real opportunity here for X uh, X for Eminem Gaming to to get some more points on the board. If if they they take the dub here, then they get like twelve points, I think it is, um, and then they're in a a really strong position going into the next play day. Yeah, I don't want to use the phrase it's a must-win game for Eminem, but it's getting toward a must-win because if they do get those next three points, like you say, it leapfrog them in the standings for the time being. Obviously, more games yet to play this week. This is only the first game out of 10 that we're going to be playing over the next two days, but it is a very important game here for Eminem, make no mistake. Uh, and Riddle will know that. You know, Riddle, uh, they're not going to be coming this with their eyes closed. They know that if they put up a good fight, um, they could make this a little bit more difficult. And of course, Riddle battling that relegation fight already. X, Grace, it's been an absolute pleasure catching up with you guys to kick things off here. But it's time to cross over to our casters for this first one. Riddle versus Eminem Academy with Whippet and the other lad from Hull, Fresh! Thank you very much, Ian. And uh, I'm Jack Fresh and I'm joined by Whippet Casts. Uh, it's my first cast, I believe, since Play Day 1 of this. And I think it's your very first cast of MPL, Whippet. It's my MPL debut, and I can't be more excited to dive into, especially alongside you. Ah, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And, you know, I am actually looking forward to this game because, you know, we've talked about how we've got two games of the day, realistically, with Heroic against 86 and 10 Star against Victus. Obviously, you'll have to stay tuned for them once. But I think if there's any kind of propensity for an upset, it's actually in this very first game. Eminem Academy, they've been, you know, kind of 50 50. Riddle have looked good in, you know, in bursts, but overall, obviously, haven't really got the points that they should have. So, you know, I'm hoping to see some good things coming out of them. Yeah, Riddle has slowly been improving this season. I mean, so far, their best result, their magnum opus of the season's been a 7-4 loss to, I believe, Victus. It's not been great from them in terms of results, but slowly but surely, they're gathering information. They've had a very brutal start to the season, lots of tough competition. So maybe now, against Eminem Academy, who's not really hit the, the ground running as much as they would perhaps would have hoped with the momentum they carried out of Yukin 2, this could be the upset, as you mentioned. And, well, not really too surprising, Thatcher is our very first ban. No, and, you know, they did mention on the desk is that we're going for a pretty default uh, map choice in terms of it was going to be Oregon or Clubhouse. I think both teams would have well been aware of that. Um, and a Thatcher ban is, you know, very default, as is a Flores ban, obviously for that elbow, the smoke shield, the extension over there. Flores is just so good at dealing with all that utility, so get gone. And the same with Cade, you know, King of the Hatches, especially those both of those bans coming out of Riddle are targeted completely towards that basement site. Yeah, I mean, Thatcher tends to force that Kaid as well, so it's, I mean, this is going to be a pretty standardized Oregon setup. I'm not seeing too much deviation. The Valkyrie Involved. again, this is something we see all the time. No shock, no surprise. It's Oregon, after all, probably the most linear map. And before it was reworked, before it was put in in this iteration, old Oregon used to be something defined as the map that good teams would go to die. The number of upset results we saw there across all competitions. True. I mean, how many times have people like seen the clip of old USN matches where teams like EG got beat by pickup teams on Oregon or at least suffered heavy round losses there? It is a map and it still has that kind of core philosophy behind it where you can see just by the linearity that good teams might lose rounds and lose it off rounds eventually of course you're gonna lose a matchup yeah so it's, it's always a dangerous one and you know every man and their dog know how to play oregon and and that's the reason for it there's there's not really new things that you can do on this map it's more about who basically turns up on the server i'm gonna quote demo but it's about who turns up on the server and who turns up on the day gets through their checklist as a team and you know gets through it well 
I could say there's not really too much you can do. The introduction of his army might change things when, once we get into that, you know, after the major, into the you know next stage when she's out of quarantine. Some teams, as we will see Eminem Academy actually do, they're going to play a rotate in the closet with a shield set up in the trophy. Um, and Ollie mentioned it actually on the, the pregame desk. He was talking about Eminem Academy, you know, scrimming the main roster, taking some ideas from this roster. And this particular strat is right out of that Eminem roster's playbook. They do the same exact setup inside of EUL. It's a perfect environment to learn. I do love that Eminem have opted to use that Academy slot system, the yeah. place in, in our ecosystem. Uh, this roster really deserves that chance. And as you said, they're pulling straight from that strat book. And something that can catch teams unaware if they're not necessarily expecting it. A decent defense are set up down by the bottom of white stairs. One player by bottom freezer and one player inside a server expecting a push from this western side. And already Eric High sending some shots down range. And they now know Sir Peg at least is going to present themselves as a threat down in this elbow hallway. And so far cautiously not wanting to push. In. No information for Sophia just yet as Kevin's looking to do some verticality inside a kitchen to make that small dorms area just uncomfortable to play in. I'm liking these reinforcements inside the security. It means Akri can just play for free and he's got the hatch drop. It allows Kevin to get into kitchen and start booking below the site from kitchen side, but it doesn't allow him to start booking out towards double window, towards, you know, the, the bed in the kind of um, south side of the room there. And it, it basically means Eminem Academy, they just won't play inside of the kind of kid, the dorms itself. And they'll just play outside of where the book can play vertical. You see, Kevin, he's going to do a lot of booking from below, but not much. As Katal managed to find the first kill onto Nerf, going for quite an aggressive peek there. And Eco finds one straight back onto Katal. 4 4 with a minute 30 to go. It's not looking too great for Riddle right now. No, one kind of benefit of that, you could say, is nerfs on that smoke. Those toxic canisters and the dying embers around can be a massive factor at choking out an execution. But a one-for-one -one trade, not ideal for Riddle. And just keep your eyes peeled on the top of the screen. That time ticking down. There's no punch. There's no pace and a rotation inside of Attic as well, allowing Relaxing to come back to side, essentially completely free. There was no one holding that cross. And now this entire push dedicated towards that western side, this bottom white, this execution is somewhat stalling out. Now under a minute, and they're going to try and force from this big window. You literally can't force from the big window while Akari's staying stuck there. He manages to find himself a kill as Pogo will jump in. Akari actually has a kind of split moment there where he's got to try and transfer the kill, which allows the jump in. I'm liking that, but he does pop the Goyo canister, forces the plant off, and it's 2v2. Eco against Skiddy and Perry and Kevin. Kevin and Perry, they're going to go for it. Kevin's pushing himself into Dorms, finds an engagement with Eco, who wins it out. It's all up to Perry. Knows there's one in Dorms, looking for the fight on the other person. Now knows that he's pit. However, Skiddy will peek and get the kill. 1-0 to Eminem Academy. Overall, I think a good round. Erkery, you know, very stubborn downstairs. They were good with the rotates. They understood exactly where that attack was coming from. That might just be a precursor for how this map might play just in general. Eminem looked like they had the depth of strategy there to really lock out Riddle. That was such a slow round. I think Riddle were trying to spend time to solve the puzzles ahead of them. Not yeah. having a direct answer, a direct solution. You know, you need to clear, you know someone's inside a server. We've got no tools to clear. Maybe you got the can opener on Buck, but even then, that's a risky play to try and get rid of Erekai down below. Holding the cross, good decision, gets that kill. But ultimately, you're sacrificing so much and wasting so much time to figure out everything. It led to a pretty rushed execution, and it's always sketchy having to go through that double window, especially yeah. when Burt's a factor. There were so many redundancies in play as well, so there was obviously the frost mats that he's got to shoot when he vaults in. Usually you've had an Akri below that's shooting him. He was otherwise engaged with the player that was aggressing onto him inside of security, but then he just changed location. He pops the Goyo, you know, hot pocket, canister, whatever it is. He pops the Goyo that forced the change of the plant location, and then his teammates on site just you know, cleared up from there. Once again, we're going to see the Goyo. I think it's relaxing, bringing it out again. And the mirror. So it's a very similar approach. And I'm, I'm going to expect to remember them that they kind of, they get out early on, try and shoot some drones. We're seeing air crew, we're seeing relaxing up on the top floor already. And then fall back. Because the biggest element on this site is time. And also you're using the time with the, in combination with the Goyo, the Jaeger and the Wamai to protect certain bits of utility. And those mirror windows, it's so hard to attack against. This is essentially the worst nightmare for attacking on this setup in terms of time denial. Those Goyos burn for what feels like an eternity. When yeah. you're left stranded in no man's land, as that's burning away and you see the clock at the top of the screen ticking down, you're like, all right, come on, hurry up. And you think it's about to end and it keeps going and seconds, it keeps yeah. going some more. It, it feels so long. One thing to note as well on the side of Riddle um, already is they've got absolutely no burn. I'm seeing an Ayana, an Ash who can, you know, not burn apart from using her breaching charges. 
two nades on the Maverick, cap it out, you don't want to burn with any of that utility, and then the Sledge who has nades, which means these ADS and these Wamai Magnets are just going to stay up and they're going to be able to protect all of the key utility here, which is perhaps a misplay in the composition choice. You know, you maybe want a Sophia instead of an Ash there, so you've got at least some kind of burn to try and get this shield on elbow. Because if not, you're just not going to be able to deal with it. And considering that attacker repicks now in the game, mm -hmm. a composition mistake, like that's getting almost to the point of unforgivable. You need something to burn away. And I mean, they had at that time, they could have spotted out that guy who was in play. They knew a mirror was going to be left up because it wasn't in the ban phase. So now they really have lots of problems to solve once again. And they're not doing a very punchy job about it. It's taking a lot of time. We just have a minute 20 left to go. And now they're trying to put pressure inside a bunker. And it looks like Nerf's going to look to get aggressive, perhaps. And he left the safety of that shield to push him up further. But no, he's fallen back inside. So stay alive and keep in the fight. The nade will come soaring through. It doesn't detonate. Of course, the ADS refreshes. But it will detonate eventually. He has no cook on that one at all. As more utility tossed in. But well, there's that Goyo Hot Pocket burning away. He's stopping this push completely dead. And that's going to take over to that minute round. And Riddle now left once again. No time and looking for an answer. It's going to be a brute force solution. As Raxing will find the opening. That's Kevin who falls. And it might just be a flurry of gunfire now. 50 seconds. Eco looks calm for the whole list. Carl will find one. That's Nerf slain. Another Goyo Hot Pocket burning away. Eco won't be able to find that one. But that's going to be an MM popping off. Filling our kill feed. And with 40 seconds have to go. Riddle now just looking to scrap away. But surely it's all but lost. Well, unless Sir Pagan might find an opening. Relaxing trade. But no, it's getting easier to shut it down. Three versus 130 seconds, and no LMG can save you this time. Eco credit with that final kill, and Eminem once again, depth of strategy holds out, and Riddle just could not find a solution to it. And we talk about compositional mistakes, and I want to talk about it because that shield in elbow did eventually get killed. But it took two nades. It was one nade to burn the ADS, one nade to get the shield. That then meant that the Jaeger that was playing in the Shaiko position, slash Harry Potter, slash near the pillar was just safe in his position. He could just play it. He had an ADS and a Wamai Magnet to protect it. And then ultimately, that nade that you would try and use to nade that position out had been used to burn out the elbow position. Realistically, Eminem just weren't forced out of all of the power positions, which is how you've got to play that basement attack. They got forced out of one on elbow, which I think Nerf still played quite aggressively, despite that fact. And Riddle really had no solution. It's a very similar lineup again, although we're seeing Pogo go on to the Fairmax. So we do have some burn, but once again, I would be expecting, I, as I said, I would be expecting a Jaeger and a Wamai from Eminem, as they um, are not playing either. So they're, they're probably let off the hook a little bit in this round, but they're going for that kind of information game. Two bulletproof shields, uh, two Maestro cams, and obviously the Rooney Gates as well. Um, it, even for the Rooney Gates, there's not a lot of burn other than the Ayana clone. So... You know, that, that's a key kind of win condition, I think, at the minute for Eminem. Or lack of a win condition, I guess, for Riddle is they're going to struggle to actually use all these nades that they're trying to bring because Serpego is really trying to force the Ash pick over, you know, over another operator that could burn out utility or burn out ADSs and Rooney Gates, etc. It is an odd choice. I mean, Ash isn't necessarily the strongest she's ever been. And kind of mm. circle back to what you said, the only kind of consistent, repeatable clear they have is those Yana drones. As you drive that into a Surya gate, it takes the longer cooldown as that counts as enemy damage to destroy it. So it's not going to be even that good. You may have to get one cleared away and you got a gone six and two nades to try and work away. But said this is really kind of a sticking point right now for Riddle. They can't burn away the key utility. There are no ADSs, of course, so they have been a little bit forgiven on that one. A Western push once again and meeting the first Surya gate, that will be Cardinal. And it's just going to be a bit of a slow around Riddle now trying to solve, think about what's ahead of them. And already uh, setting up that exothermic charge, but Nerf set up upstairs will be able to deny this probably. Yes, he will through the doorway, so that impact. Parry will find the opening, though. That's going to use slain deep inside out by Fridge. A good read when Parry finds the opening kill. And that's your Malusi already off the board for Eminem. I absolutely love that impact trick, by the way. It won't make a massive difference because the Fairmite will eventually go off as Kevin's forced himself into Zulu and got himself into security, which means actually an execute can now come in, a 5v4. However, Eco's also on the flank and Nerf gets one from above. If Eco has an idea here that there's one in security, he might be able to get a free kill and retake security. I think neither player kind of, they're at a bit of a cellmate. However, Riddle haven't considered the vertical, which means Nerf's going to play for free above any type of plant spot that they want to play in.
Well, there's information now of Kevin's position. Miko can now try and get that trade. Not going to be in that golden window of three seconds. And that might really be a sticking point of this round. However, he'll polish up and get aggressive. And Kevin will find a second now in this round. No trade for that position. And Miko takes control of server once again. Swings wide of the DMR and finds him through the wall. Can't find a second. He'll get shot down by the Maverick. Now making two in the round. Leaving Irakai in a one versus three upstairs. Not topped up with full HP. And SMG 11 in hand. He also find a down to kill Sir Pagan. Who will be able to shut him down. Riddle find their opening round. And it'll all came down to Kevin sneaking their way into security. Activate crouch mark, crouch walk mode, and he was able to get that off. And I mean, it was it was an interesting choice from Riddle to not commit or contest upstairs, but it worked out for him at the end of the day. They got the round. They went very late on to go and push it, which I think was the right idea. Um, but Kevin had already made that space because he'd already got himself into security and got himself a kill. That forced Nerf to rotate off because he knew the Ash was, Ash was also pushing him. Give up the verticality because he rotated into meetings to try and challenge Kevin. That also died, so it was a big play from Kevin. Um, and I think a good awareness, even if it was late, like you say, to go above... Um, get the plan down good round overall but it is oregon so we do expect the attack teams to win their tertiary sites or you know you know win the defenders tertiary sites should i say um as we go back to primary site m, m academy they're going for exactly the same setup with the rotate into tier two they've got the rotate into uh master bedroom they're gonna have the shielding trophy again with the armory walls reinforced it's all very same setup and there's ads's i'm seeing a Rooney as well. No, why am I? Um, and I think, same old problem. I'm going to keep saying it while we've got the same old problem is that this utility is going to be very hard to come by. And also, if you remember all the way back to the first round, Riddle needs to find a way to deal with Akari insecurity because he was a big kind of power position that they couldn't move that ultimately led to them losing that round. It looks like they might be going for more of a split push here with Rid uh, Kevin going in from tier 1, tier 2 as Relaxing does get droned. I'm wondering if this is going to be a little bit explosive. No, he thinks otherwise of it originally. As Skitty peeks the window and gets one onto Katal. What a shot and it's all going off. Relaxing's found one onto Kevin. That's not how you want to start this round. I'm talking about starting it well and you're in a 3v5 already. Not the, not the best of sorts riddle in this round. And Eminem, I'd imagine, are not going to press the gas too much. They know that they can play for trades. They can play and hold their power positions. They've set up the site fantastically once again. While Riddle might know the opposition that they're facing in those mm -hmm. positions... They now lost a lot of utility to deal with it. The Yana Jones can't get the free information. You lose those grenades and you lose that skeleton key and hardbridge utility as a perfectly placed grenade from down below will find one the nerf. He's playing inside that very dangerous small dorm. Couldn't keep himself protected as Irakai finds some pressure from that wall as Maverick's torch begins to chew it open. Relaxing falls up to the red stairs and now drops down in the freezer will be frost, opting just to stay alive and burn more time. Eminem, of course, still have that player advantage. Four versus three and a minute 35 left in this round. A carry king can actually go on a massive flank here. I don't think there's many drones actually in play it, unless the overlay is trolling me here and I'm seeing both of the dead people spectating their teammates rather than flank drones as a carry will end up shooting a flank drone and moving away. Relaxing finds one onto Pogo so that's a 2v4 now. They know a carry's on the flank so it's an effective 2v3 on site. It's still hard to push. It's going to involve basically walking up staircases. We're seeing Perry trying to bait out a peak. Sir Pega waiting to try and bait out a peak once again. Again, looking through that, he will find a head, only manages to secure the down but not out onto relaxing. But that gives a two effective 2v3 now, as he's, he knows there's somebody on that vet. It's just whether they're going to peek it as Perry makes his way up White Stars. Not going to be an ideal position. This wall should open, will give lots of lines of sight from that. That trophy doorway. Perry's not going to have to be worried about those Goyos that will burn away. He's relaxing, crawls away. His scars of battle somewhat healed now. He's patted down by Echo. He'll get him back in the fray. Perry down below still looking for an entry of Avenue. Sir Pagan now inside of Attic. But that rotate's been long patched with no solution. The long way around. All the way rotating by Armory Window. And Perry will do the same. Trying to back up his teammate. But I think a little bit cautious of a push down below. And that information now given away is that default camera shot. Sir Pagan takes a lot of damage as Skitty's just going to hold on and lock it down. No easy entry for the Ash and is with 18. Oh, perhaps I speak too soon. Sir Pega finds an opening and Perry can find one more. The round might be on, but no. Erikai shuts it down. Sir Pega will get one of the trade, but that's the rear gate. will shut it down, surely. Has to burn that drone, but he doesn't have the option, so he's going to get locked in place. Can't do anything from here. And once again, Eminem will play a perfect round, essentially, and the clock will be the victor. Eminem claim round at number four.
think you saw an absolutely great example there of them redundancies that Eminem have got in play in this strategy. Firstly, the Goyo canisters that can just pop on white stairs, completely deny the player and the push up there late on. And then secondly, that Aruni gate that Sepega just couldn't get past on the ash. Great example of how the Eminem are winning and that big win condition is the utility game. Everyone loves the, the flashy kills, those those frag montages of Siege, but sometimes going to the base picks and using your utility to absolute supreme levels, like what Eminem are doing right now, that's how you can win rounds consistently, relying on what every operator brings and putting it in the perfect position. Riddle did not sound too repetitive, once again, somewhat stumped by the puzzles they have to solve while previous round of course they suffered two early early casualties which didn't make it easy they lost mm -hmm. less tools to solve that puzzle but they seemingly didn't have a solid and concrete answer to it and as these rounds play on of course oregon is actually right now so far in mpl i believe attacker sided so riddle might want to start trying to get a few rounds <laughs> on the board well I'm liking their adaptation already on, on this round five that we've got going on because the last time that they played basement, they could not clear any utility whatsoever. Two key changes. Pogo's now playing Habana instead of Capital, and Serpeg is now playing Sophia instead of Ash, which means they've got the two concussion lifelines and they've got free stuns on the side of Pogo as well, which means they've got five burn, which means that they can actually start clearing out these power positions with proper, you know, clearing out the ADSs, clearing out the one mine magnets, and then nading out the power positions, fully clearing them, and actually putting together somewhat of an actual attack. Because the previous time they attacked it, it didn't resemble that because of the way that Eminem were just able to sit in those power positions. Early drones have been shot, and Eminem Academy, they will just move themselves back to site, back to those power positions, as I say. So it's now all about Riddle, how fast that they can clear the middle floor with their drone, and their drone economy, and then setting up an attack to look to clear out those positions, it looks like they're going to go for a blue kind of big tower side take. That's where most of the people are kind of setting up with maybe one guy who will be set Pega pushing down laundry at the same time. Hatch is opening pretty quick time and they're going to look to try and get rid of the um, Goyo canister. That's That goes there. So they're doing pretty good on time. Um, it's now just working those people out and getting those kills when the opportunities present themselves. That might be the biggest question mark, question mark now. Of course, they have nades to create space to perhaps push players like Pillar out and give them leave them exposed. Of course, they have that double catcher in place. So that won't be too easy. Getting burnt away now. The flashbang sent in a far better lineup. Riddle will use that nade to create space as Kevin on drops. E-box might be his grave. However, his relaxing looks very close. But he's just walking on his side. Once again, Kevin's just going to go all the way deep. And Pogo will find one as well as Perry. A C4 toss out to try and save the round. But Irakai shuts that one down. And Skitty gets one of their own. Two versus two. Just over a minute left in this round. Riddle finds some explosive action to kickstart this. But Perry's now stranded outside. Finally, the hot pocket burn away and now becomes a bit of a waiting game riddle don't seem to have any information the two remaining defenders and second one my man get magnet toss out to help sure up what's so far been a somewhat destroyed defensive setup but they still have no information for the side of riddle and this might be their bane if they can't find these two defenders they might be forced to fly into the blind that could be disastrous they've got to set up a plan but the problem is with setting up a plan is Perry basically has to hold multiple angles here because the defenders can 2v1 onto him specifically. So he's going to try and hold it all the way from highway. Actually, he's going to make a full play, sprint himself through into sight next to the mirror window. Not sure that was the play there. As Skiddy does find himself a kill, leaves Poco in the one versus two, who's also going to potentially try and do the same thing. Will bait out a plan, will draw the defenders towards him, potentially might get off this and look for engagements. Doesn't find either of them as Skiddy finds the kill and that was a little bit hairy there for Eminem Academy who really had to dig deep. I liked the play from Kevin. He dropped with the nade sound to get himself into sight and find that entry before that massive flurry of kills. Um, but in the end I think the miss played 2v2 because a plant really could have been set up and executed there and in the end I think it was just Perry that kind of just sprinted in in deep that, that ultimately cost his team the round there. It was Certainly uh, an unusual, I think perhaps <laughs> is the politest way to put it, strategy. But, I mean, Riddle have found success with that one player dive bomb in the side. Well, it wasn't yeah. the same when Kevin done it when he was pushing into security. Well, he oh. went solo and found it. But it seems like they're looking for that one burst to try and I... capitalize upon. I honestly thought it was genius. What I thought he was trying to do was just nade the highway door and get himself into freezer. Because if he's in freezer and the plant goes down near the door or in the default spot... He knows that both defenders are going to come from laundry side and therefore he has to hold one angle because he can see all the way to the rotate. 
Whereas if he was holding from other angles, the defenders can come in through the blue rotate and, and peek him from, you know, he can't hold like 180 degrees, right? So I was, ho I was hoping that's what he was playing for, so that he just has to hold one line of sight and then take two gunfights. Even if he loses one, the plant should go down and you leave yourself in a 1v1. And then he just carried on running. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> what's going on here? Um, yeah, a bit of a misplay. And I think Eminem Academy, they've been good for this lead. But remember, Riddle, they managed to quite convincingly win this site the last time. But it did involve, as you say, Kevin kind of walking his way from Zulu into security. I don't think he's going to be allowed to do it again. So I think Riddle needs to figure out a way to actually kind of... I, I say, quote-unquote, properly win. Not that they didn't properly win it last time, but... You know, he's not going to be allowed that same luxury this time. In a, perhaps a more concrete solution to breaking down this site. Yeah. Uh, Escadar is just looking for an entryway deep inside his security. But again, you burn away that Surya gate. You're going to have to wait a long time to get that Gemini replicator back. And that's going to provide information. And m, &M seem like a team who are confident to fall back. They're confident to invite pressure. They know their strats are sound. And they can just wait as Pogo was set down this extra thermic charge. And he spits it a little bit more to the side. Will the impact still catch it? No, it doesn't. So it's opened up. And a far more effective and efficient use of the utility for the side of Riddle. Now they can start working on finding that opening pick and getting key map control. One highlight will perhaps be to try and contest upstairs, deny that vertical presence, because that might be the bane of their round once again. I think that's what we're now seeing is we're seeing a silhouette out on the master balcony. It will be Kevin. He's going to try and get a nade in. His problem is he's against two and it looks like by the way that he's pre-firing everything, he doesn't necessarily know where people are. There are two people upstairs as Katal finds the first kill onto Eco. That's on Rooney, so there's no utility kind of plus or minus you don't mind losing that if you have to be in a 4v5 the big fight here is all is aircry and nerf up against the two attackers and how well they can deal with them dangerous peak outside and study huh smg 11 primed and ready and well two versus one here it's not gonna be an easy fight skiddy's there for coverage i believe that's perry who falls Sir Pagan now looks for entryway, but nothing presenting itself. Sitting and holding, perhaps not the most ideal strategy right now. Walking into a lion's den inside a master bedroom. They know there's so many threats. And look at it from the position of Riddle. There's so many angles to hold. What one do you choose? It's going to be a gamble either way. Yana and Weisters might make an impact. There's a few will get caught by some damage. And Kevin bursts on in. We'll find one nerf left in Dibino as well. And Riddle now spring to life in this round. 44 seconds. And now they can pose the threat of an execution. And the trade goes down, but the case has been dropped. Relaxing can recover this and hold on. He is in a one versus two, but with 30 seconds, he can choke out the time. Zerpega not looking good in terms of HP, and they don't know where this mo smoke is sitting. Relaxing, he will hear that drop. He'll swing wide, finds one. He's on for the second here, and he finds it! Eminem Academy close out their defense, and it will come down to a one versus two, but expertly played. Massive clutch there from relaxing and you know who else he's had a mega game so far And I think Riddle they did everything right there to be honest in in terms of that attack They were very patient. I was going to applaud how patient they were in terms of taking the top floor The one thing that they let go was they let go of an aggressive player on site running out of sight Retaking the you know retaking dining retaking the diffuser and ultimately then having all the information from site with those bulletproof cameras, with those maestro cams, to make a play. And relaxing, you know, he was more than happy to make that play, knowing that he was against operators that were low HP and that he had full information on. I mean, I don't, I never doubt an SMG 11 in a 1 versus 2. It's just, <laughs> it, listen, it is the clutch king weapon. Like, the amount of things I have seen happen, I, a smoke clutch is the most glorious thing to see. This is a throwback. I'm full of these random C throwbacks, but Liquid versus Market, Sexy Cake in Master Bedroom on Villa. Back, I mean, how many SIs ago now in the group stage? To get get Liquid through. One of the most iconic moments, Cement Smoke is one of those clutch operators. Yeah. That's uh, some random siege, like, drawback <laughs> sometimes. My mind is stuck and full of those. I can't get them out sometimes. Oh, moving through to round seven then. Obviously, we've got the side swap. Eminem Academy, they're going to be feeling pretty pretty happy with that. A 5-1 defensive half on Oregon. More than happy. You'll be fancying yourselves to go on and win this pretty comfortably. They're attacking the basement, which means they've got a full clear. We're seeing a lot of defender presence on the top two floors. Um, that Eminem needs to deal with. If they don't fully, you know, they've got to make sure they drone every inch of the specifically the top floor if you look at where Katal's playing um but also the middle floors there's a lot of nooks and crannies that the defenders can sit in and then that leads us to the ultimate question on the basement attacks it's all about that time management can they drone it fast can they clear those positions fast if they can then they'll give themselves a lot of time to execute 
Relaxing, seemingly aware of someone, that Tracer will give it away. Narrowly misses the headshot, and I don't think the player on stage shows can be too keen to re-peak that one. Herald will find one opening us off, that's Echo who falls. Grenade primed and ready. Pass in a security, and it will land, but doesn't do enough damage to down or kill. That's huge. They might have just been banking on that being a confirmation. They have to get the information, otherwise they might get caught napping. Relaxing though by backstage, will get slain out. That's going to be a second one for Thunderbird. And that's going to be Sir Pega who tries to run away, but he's going to get caught by the LMG. And a flurry of kills all around the map now. Two versus three in favor of Riddle. A strong and aggressive defense from them. Kind of contesting m as they try to push in and make their initial entryways. There's a little bit of chaos so far. All down to Skiddy and Irikai now standing. Against three, but surely it just should be recoverable. They have lots of time to get information. And they can compose themselves to try and push in and get that opening pick. They can unravel this round. If you look at who they've killed, the big death on the side of Eminem Academy that might cost them here is Nerf. The fact that he's dead and no hatches can be opened means that Skiddy and Aircrate, they have to force doorways. They have to walk down T1, they have to walk down Freezer, they have to walk down Laundry. Take your pick, boys, because you're going to come up against... At least two guns looking at you because you're also outnumbered and you're going to lose the utility game. As we've seen a lot of one by magnets and ADSs. So, realistically, you've got to find a 1v1 engagement and you've got to frag out. And that's simply the only way that Eminem Academy are going to be able to do this. Well, getting to the business end of this round now. 45 seconds. They're going to look to try and pose themselves a dart and dive into sight. Likely facing against all three, all full HP defenders. Thunderbird on the board, of course. Time, though, all important. They can't waste too much more. That smoke will burn away and deny this push easily from the bottom of Laundry. Skiddy now pushing deep inside a freezer. Presented with one, will find some damage, but not enough. Again, we'll use that and they create some space, but it might just not go off in time. He'll get one. This opens up the round. Finds a second! There's the trade! Well, that's gonna be a perfect timing, Eminem! Once again, find a round at the death! And they move themselves even closer to victory here in Oregon. I have absolutely no idea how they've won it. And I've got to, you know, I've got to give props to Skiddy and Aqui there because that's pure FPS gunplay of the pre-fires of, you know, knowing where the operator positions are and just winning your ones. It is literally as simple as that. Riddle played a really aggressive first kind of 90 seconds on the defense. Katal managed to get himself up, get himself a couple of kills. You know, we saw in Serpega doing, you know, sprints from top three to stairs across the security and back again. Very aggressive from Riddle. Got themselves the advantage. And then they played it like... I'm trying to find a word in my head that's nice enough. But they played it so passively in the end. To the point that they allowed Eminem to, you know, push all the way up to Freezer. Push all the way in Laundry. They've got to meet them with gunfights a little bit earlier in those advantageous crossfires that they can set up. You know, I'm thinking if there's one guy in the Laundry basket, one guy in the closet, one guy playing Highway. You can more or less cover... A crossfire on both of those positions because you know they're coming because you had the Malusi gadgets so it was a really again it got to that kind of nervous end of the round the back end of the round where we've seen riddle fall apart that's twice now where we've seen them have things in their favor that they can win the round and then just absolutely fall apart and bottle it the disappointing thing is we saw them meet Eminem with gunfire and fury upon the entry. The early stages of that round came up all for Riddle. That's how they found themselves in such a strong position. And when they needed that little bit of aggression, they didn't have it. They had no one who was confident enough to take a fight. And I think that might be playing into this fact that they were 5-1 down. They want to try and definitely secure that round. And in that more passive play, that more trying to take as minimal risk as possible... They let that slip between their fingers, and that's going to be one of the most sickening feelings, and probably hence why that timeout was called. They're trying to recover. They're trying to rebuild that mental, and now m and Academy, they've guaranteed themselves at least one point, their minimum. Will they be able to make it all three instead of regulation? Judging by their record, it might be the case, but Riddle, I think they've got one more round. I think they can get one, at least, on the defense. <sighs> It's an awful thing is pressure though. You can say, oh, you can get one, but you've just absolutely bottled the primary site that, you know, you should have had in the bag. Um, and realistically, Eminem have now seen this defense. They know that the that Riddle are going to get a little bit active upstairs and really peak them. And I would expect Eminem to be ready for it. That's why relaxing straight on the Aegir. That's why the, the you know, they might really punish Riddle here. Um, and these Romas are kind of useless if you kind of just go for a one-dimensional take. So... <sighs> I don't know. I, I feel worried for Riddle. As I say that, Sir Pegas just taking the head clean off relaxing. The Skiddy finds one straight back onto Perry. 4v4. Rome Claire's not doing too bad, but there's still a couple of people that they need to deal with up on this top floor. 
Eminem are doing a fantastic job of that kind of golden ticket three second trade. They're not giving anything for free, especially now on their offensive side. Riddle will try and look for that freebie, but Ico will find one. That's Sir Pega, who got the opening of this round now slain. Advantage in terms of players once again with Eminem, this time in a far better position than the previous mm -hmm. round to flush out the site, get information, yep. and make that final push. And you just got to be thinking, Riddle might be getting a little bit shaky now, knowing that if they make a single more, or more mistake, Oregon could just slip away. Eminem seemingly just having confidence. They're not rushing. They're not making mistakes. They're taking their time, figuring out what they need to do, and they're slowly going through that process of solving those puzzles, but they're not wasting time either. And there's that, that adaptation. If you look, Nerf was dead in the previous round. Early on, he was in those gunfights. They've kept him outside, completely droning this round. Now he can go and get the hatchet. They've really committed to their own clear. Instead of being in a 2v3 that they're forced to win on gunplay, they're now in a 4v3, speaking about Eminem Academy. With the hatches open, with the utility burn, they can really pick where they want to attack and attack it because ultimately, they can just completely overwhelm. The, f the push can come completely from the front and Echo can drop the back hatch. Or likewise, the push can come from the back and Eco can walk in the front. Riddles simply don't have enough people to face the guns up. As Katal makes a bit of a hero play there, into Freezer and gets a kill onto Skiddy, who was potentially there a little bit too early. Riddle might need more of those hero plays now. Well, that's gonna be Kevin, a wonderful shot from downtown. We'll find Nerf. He can't stay alive in the dying embers of this round. 30 seconds in goes one nade. Pogo looks to catch anyone who's daring enough to drop instead of E-Box, but I think that's gonna be okay. Just thinking better of it, knowing there might be someone lurking and waiting in his teammates inside a freezer. He might want to back this push up from Laundry. Just over 15 seconds left to go, and Eminem need to find some heroics. As Kevin will find one of his own. It's all gonna be down now to the Finca all alone, and LMG has all the rounds to do the job, but with 10 seconds, the clock is not gonna be favoring Eminem here. It's gonna be heroics. It will be a masterpiece if he can find it, but time ultimate nemesis of this one, and Riddle will ride out the clock as Kevin will get that final kill confirmation right at the death and get themselves their second round here in Oregon and showing us there is still a pulse. Oh, everything I think I know about Siege, the opposite is just happening right now. I'm talking about Eminem being, you know, up, up a creek without a paddle um, two rounds ago and they managed to find a win. And then I'm talking about them having the perfect opportunity to set up an execution and then they just get peaked and die and lose the round and... Realistically, I'm glad we're going away from that basement site now. We're going up towards kids' dorms and, you know, another primary site, which Riddle have a good chance of winning. If they do win, it will be 3-6. But like I say, with it, I say it's all about the tertiary sites on Oregon and Riddle are going to have to win both to even try and force an overtime right here. That's not a favourable hand at all. No. It's kind of the evidence of Oregon. You Even in the most dominant of matchups, you see, okay, the defence, they'll win... Upstairs, they'll win the basement. Then they go to that middle floor, it's a bit of a toss-up. It's gonna go either way. That's your 50-50. That's your real sketchy site for either side. Riddle, they really rely on how to be rock solid from this point on, and we've seen they can be shaken. They can get rattled, and Eminem, they have a massive lead. They don't need to really press too hard right now. They can try to manage this game best as possible, and I think that's what they'll do. We won't see mm -hmm. them take too many risks or gambles. I hope they don't get into that one more round mentality. I've seen many teams crumble at this stage, but they are experienced. They've been playing in National League for so long. I yep. really just feel that Riddle, they need to find some sort of answer. And I think that more prolonged aggression, because when they meet Eminem at the entryway, they found loads of damage already to Finca. They can cause problems. And look at this once again in Small Tower relaxing. It's going to get met by the Malusi up on stage there. Or small tower stairs, and that's causing problems. He'll go for a long rotation a back to sides, yeah. and both windows prepped, but again, better start from Riddle, wasting time finding damage, but I think it can, you know, pop up that HP, a much better resolve from Riddle. I think so, yeah. Obviously, he will have been spotted. They know he's rotated, so they can carry on with their attack as usual. He's no longer a problem. So, Pekka, once again, he likes to make himself active around the map. We've seen him really run around on this Jaeger and, you know, kind of just get everywhere he can. Um, we'll rotate all the way downstairs and there's a couple off site here which means if Eminem realize this they could potentially start going fast towards site they're going to burn the uh, mute jammer as Nev's going to go in for the breach on Habana um, and really start to develop a quote unquote normal attack Nade does come in and will do chip damage on Serpega, indicating that Skidding either, you know, just had a, a six sense or knew he was there. Shoots a gone six at Malusi on the staircase and loses the fight to Katal. And I'm a bit disappointed in that because realistically, we know how these defenders are playing it. They're getting very aggressive and in your face. So to just randomly pull out a gone six on the side of Skiddy there, 
Slight misplay, I do have to say. Four versus four now. m M&M now just back to that level playing field. A little bit late on that trade, not in their golden ticket range, but once again an example of how good they are is Kevin just going to wait inside a classroom and there won't be a trade this time too, as Kevin will find one and Perry's going to find one of their own, a flurry for Riddles, they storm Eminem, he will get one back at least, but a three versus one, a minute left to recover this. And now you got to wonder, Eminem, perhaps they might be slipping into that mentality if it's only one more round, we've got an advantage as Riddle seemingly pressing the fight. And I have to say, it will be heroics if Eco wins this round. Surely Riddle can lock it out. But you never know. One pick, and I might start believe, start believing. No. <laughs> nope, <laughs> it does not happen. And I've been waiting to say this ever since play day one. Kevin and Perry go large in that round. They've gone absolutely nuclear. And I think realistically, it's Riddle's win condition is get active, get fracky, get in the face of Eminem Academy. And Eminem Academy are just not respecting that Riddle are trying to do that right now. That's two rounds where they've just lost man advantage, where they don't know where players are because they're just running. You know, Riddle are just running at them. A little bit more considered approach from Eminem, expecting that, very easily punishes Riddle. So we're going on the way of the tertiary site. We're going to meet and kitchen. This is the site that I said you've really got to try and hold. And, you know, you've got to win every site from here. But this is the hardest one to hold if you're Riddle. And Eminem will get two shots at attacking this site, regardless of what happens in this round. If we go back through... Oh, no, they won't. They'll only get the one, because we'll go back for a full rotation. Um, but they've got to win this, basically. It's as simple as that. I don't know where I was going with this statement. Um, I've lost it with it. <laughs> I've just... I've, I've lost all my marbles, because Eminem should have had this game to bed right now, in my opinion. Yes. Um, and, you know, they, they probably will win it, but it really should have been a 7-1 rather than a 7 or 7-5, should we say? Should we get... Yeah. Perhaps this could be an example of just Eminem's game management right now. It's Riddler are going to, I think, start throwing more chaotic strategies at them, getting more aggressive, because at the end of the day, they are they are three rounds down. Eminem have guaranteed locked in that one point, and they look so strong in the opening half of this matchup. Riddler are kind of assuming, okay, we're probably going to go out instead of regulation. Perhaps not saying it, but... That's how internally players might be perceiving it. And they're going to try that more chaotic run and gun, scattered around the map and be more aggressive. They're not finding Eminem in the entry this time. No one's contesting Small Tower, which is going to give that control Eminem completely free. And I always love watching this. Particularly Sledge player, the way they move through the map and mold it, so well rehearsed and choreographed. Mm -hmm. it's, one of my most, it's one of the most satisfying things to watch, especially in Oregon, because they do the same thing inside of a Kitchen, going into security yep. and in the, in the meeting. I don't know why. It's one of the most satisfying things it's to watch in Siege. It's the same with, like, Buck as well. Um, I always think the same with Buck and Sledge on Clubhouse on the Kitchen uh, site. Uh, you know, specifically, we'll see him later, but Gorgona on the Buck. He is, like, he's so eloquent. He knows exactly where to Buck. And you would expect that of a professional player, right? But, you know, it, it's great to watch just how the map can be manipulated. Moving back to this round, Nerf, he's going to get the Breach off. Finds the side where the Mute Jammer just isn't quite covering the Breach. And that's a, perhaps a little bit of a misplacement. The Breach is already off. Um, and the attack's going to start coming in with a minute, minute 30. Perry, Pogo, they're all going to go for this very aggressive approach. As Eminem look like they're going to try and flood sight. Nerf gets the first kill. He's into sight. Perry finds one back onto Aircrane. Nerf peaks Perry again. Perry's gone big again. That's two. Doesn't get the third. And the trade game is coming in strong for Riddle. It's a 2v3. Eco and Skiddy once again. Uh, Skiddy's managed to get himself the diffuser back, which is good. Eco's in dining, looking for a peak that might never come in. It relies on Skiddy realistically here, trying to take control of the vertical, trying to kill Kevin, and then formulating some kind of attack. Kevin will drop straight into the face of Eco, who is then very quickly, once again, or will be traded out by Pogo, and it's all up to Skiddy. Got the vertical, he's going to use his breaching charges to try and get the peek onto the player in security. I don't think he will peek, oh, doesn't matter, he does peek him, didn't think he would. Um, and it really about crossfires, Skiddy's going to try and force his way down the white stairs, doesn't ever get there, Pogo peeking up the vertical with the hatch. Forces an Eminem timeout here. This is where we start to get to the deep water. Eminem now don't have that tertiary site to try to bank on getting this regulation win. Riddle have found a little bit of a second wind, somewhat against the script of what this matchup was looking like. And considering so far this season, Oregon's been attacker sided. I believe a 56% attacker yeah. win rate on Oregon so far this season. Very much bucking the curve just a little bit. And as you said, forced that Eminem timeout. I have the reset, time to think about what to adapt and change, because Riddle really have momentum on their side. 
what do you say if you're Eminem here? Because all I all I would be saying personally if I was on the Eminem Academy coaching staff is I'd be saying, boys, they're just running at us. Like, let's just slow it down. If we lose the round, I would rather we lose it on time than lose it to a player that's stood in classroom or that runs up a staircase or that is in a position that we're not expecting. I would rather us be a little bit more passive and really punish these players, particularly now that you know for definite that you will be attacking laundry. Formulate a plan for that laundry site. Um, and I would expect Eminem to get it over the line here because of the timing of that timeout. They know which site they're going up against. They know what their issues have been. Um, and it's just on them to kind of deal with it, really, I guess, and, you know, formulate a plan. I do hope, I do hope Eminem haven't slipped into that one more round mentality. I really hope for their sake they can get it across the line because as I touched on at the start of this matchup, it's not been the ideal start of the season so far with them. Three wins, three losses. They want to start putting more kind of wins in that column. And this was a game that on paper at least you look at run of form, you'd say Eminem should have been able to close this one out by now yeah. considering they were 6-1 up. If they you look, look at the... Sorry. Right. If you look at the performance of the, the game as well, apart from the past couple of rounds, they were wiping the floor with Riddle. Mm -hmm. And they've just allowed that door's been slightly ajar. And they've just allowed Riddle back into this game. The door's just creaking its way open. Riddle will be full of confidence right now. That's such a scary thing, especially when you have two players in particular going large in these rounds, causing those moments where you see the kill feed go all in Riddle's direction. Your confidence big key factor in that one and somewhat of a critique of Riddle in the opening stages they didn't look like they were playing with a lot of confidence they were somewhat giving too much respect to Eminem and it looks like they really aren't giving any now at all as Pegas are gonna be aggressive crack the window in classroom and just look to brawl instead of lobby like I say it's um it's confident they're getting up and they're getting in the faces Eminem are so much more considered at the minute though look at Ecker is the only one that's in the building so far Lots of drains, uh, drains, lots of drones, lots of information. No idea why I said drains there, um, but lots of drones and information, and they're really going to try and squeeze the players out. Skiddy with the opening on to Serpega. Great opening kill there. Now expect the aggression again. You need to really drone up the top floor. There's still a player lurking up there. It will be Katal. We know that he likes to get a little bit aggressive as well. Make sure these floors are clear, and then set up and go about your attacks. Great start from Eminem. As I say, much more considered much more information and much more expectant of the aggression they use that timeout absolutely perfectly so far they really as you said just far slower far more methodical and back to how they were playing in the opening stages of this matchup taking few risks as possible but being very very point look at nerf all the way outside holding main lobby cautious of someone getting aggressive and you see that blue silhouette creeping on up that's gonna be pogo who's not gonna look to get aggressive as a shotgun very close one shot fired off, and Nerf didn't quite take the bait there. He'll open up this hatch instead of laundry, give themselves an avenue of entryway. But looks like Eminem just going to use his map control, his pressure, to compact Riddle, to compress them deep in the site. And there they can use the linearity of Oregon to pick them off one by one and try and force his execution. Good round from Eminem so far. Good time management. Hatches are open. They've not lost a player. And like I say, I'm going to go into that blurb again. They can set up with exactly where they want with one player poking you know, the backside of their attack because Riddle physically cannot have enough guns up at the various angles that Eminem are coming from. It relies on going together, though. 45 seconds to do so. Don't get picked off early. Skiddy got picked off on Freezer last time quite early on. You've got to go together and you've got to go as one. This toxic smoke will burn away and sink some time. Pogo will find one. That's Skiddy inside a Freezer. That's the pressure relief, though. That's going to be one of those pinches. They have the Finko up above, but they have no real alternative to this primary push. And as those toxic canisters get tossed out, that's going to be the Finko now filling position. A nade primed and ready. Tossed over the top of lockers, but no effect. We now hit 18 seconds, and Perry's going to scrappily find one. The relaxing. So much pressure from Eminem, but that flash is going to work perfectly as Pogo will find one more second in the round. Nerf will get aggressive and finds a down, but time not going to be in their favor. Eminem left all the her, all the nerf alone. He'll try to get this bomb and case planted, but no time. Kevin around that corner, and Riddle find themselves within one round of Eminem Academy here in Oregon. You rewind the six rounds in, we would not have been expecting this at all. Eminem very close to letting the regulation victory slip to an overtime matchup. I think Skiddy is an excellent player. And I'm just going to preface this because this is what they call a um, a sandwich. I think Skiddy is an excellent player. But that's twice. That's twice on that basement attack where he's gone before his teammates and then been peaked 
and died before the rest of the team is ready to go as one. If he could just hold his horses for two or three seconds, Eminem, in my, I believe Eminem have that round. Um, because they had everything else set up. Because he died, it forced Aircury to then go to Freezer. That wasn't Aircury's original intention. He was going to go to the back and kind of backstab. That backstab then can't come off. Riddle can front up the attack. And you saw exactly what they did when they were able to front up the attack there. Bit of a misplay individually on Skiddy's part. That again has cost Eminem a round. And realistically, Riddle is straight back in this. I didn't think I'd be saying this at 6-1. But with 6-5, Riddle have got to win kids' dorms to get themselves to overtime. By the way, I believe if they get to overtime, they'll be starting themselves on the defence. This could be huge for them, and a w massive consequence for Eminem, though. They sit just in P6, so kind of the bottom of those standings to be in those safe positions. One point down behind 10 star. And this is a really scary moment for them. If they let this slip, that's a massive loss of points that they think they should have been able to yeah. get. And I think six rounds in, they should have looked comfortably to ride this map out. Yeah, slight clarification. Medics has just told me that Riddle are actually going to start on attack in overtime. So that would have been uh, their choice. So interesting choice given how this game has played out. But as you say, previously, historically in this league, Oregon was attacker sided and teams generally have quite a good time attacking it. So I'm not too surprised. Anyway, we're going to see Eminem. They're going out for a very, I'd say almost two directional push. This is one that you might see in ranked a lot of the time where you've got a breacher going towards the master bedroom and you're going to take armory and master bedroom control and then a maverick plus one going for big tower control and you're looking to eventually squeeze the defenders all the way back into sight through breaching and through taking those two grounds late on in the round you might then try and go to the big window for example um and try and get a kill from the big window if you've got the man advantage to do so that was my magnet. Pulled that grenade towards that Malusi Banshee, clearing it for the side of, of Eminem. Nice. That's just a mistro of that one. The second one would have cleared it anyway. They didn't have information, so they wouldn't have known. But now they've cleared that doorway. They can push that far freer. So Bigger thought about getting aggressive, but thought better of it as he hears the wall open up. The detonation goes off. And with a minute 25 left to go, Eminem have lots of map control, lots of pressure. All of Riddle have now been compressed to the back part of sight and you start to feel this round getting close to a very explosive conclusion just who's gonna like that fuse it's very clear what eminem are going for we, by seeing that their drone count they've got flank drones all over the place and they know that they're gonna air crew is playing below which is denying the c4 which means they're gonna try and go in for a plan at any moment nade does come out air expects that there's someone close does not find the kill, but does have the Finker LMG to swing. Knows there was also one kicking around in meeting. Does get the kill on to Kevin. That's 5v4. Nobody's going to play below with a C4 Evo, which will allow Nerf potentially at some point to push in once their peg is cleared and go for the plant. Skiddy's in a great position here just to cause some chaos. He can deny that player inside of small doors, but Serpega lurks in the corner, finds two, can't make it three, but that opens up this round. Three players apiece for either side. The plant will get attempted now by Skiddy, but there's the C4. 25 seconds, and it's looking all up Riddle. Relaxing will try it once again, but the cover denied, <gasps> and so's the plant. Riddle, they're going overtime against Eminem, against the script here in Oregon. There is absolutely no way that Riddle have just done this comeback and in that specific round. And once again, it was Eminem not considering just one little factor, which was Serpega in that position, close trophy door. I have no idea actually how he crossed back because he was playing, you know, quite deep when the breach was open. Somebody has let go of an angle there that's allowed him to get into that position to start that big playoff. Obviously, in the end, it came down to the 2v2, and they're so happy. They've got points. This is their first point of the entire season. They were 0 and 6, all complete losses so far. Play day 7, they, whether they win or lose, they will at least take home one point in Riddle, which, for them, may or may not be crucial, because they're at the bottom of the table. They're, you know, they're in a little bit of bother, realistically. You know, the one point at the minute... Well, no, they are bottom of the table, given Coalesque, you know, getting the default win against Na'Vi. So every point obviously matters in terms of relegation and all that sort of stuff. More importantly, though, for Eminem Academy, that's at least one point dropped. Which in the context of the fact that they are in sixth place, you know, really chasing those playoff spots. That's a struggle for them. When realistically, they were 6-1 up, they should have had this game to bed within seven, eight rounds. I'm... I'm utterly bewildered at what Eminem 
Academy are doing right now? This this is the big question mark already of this play day. We have two two of the best matchups in this entire season. This play day arriving later on this evening, and so far game one is not missing that mark. Riddle hard fought first point. They were so <laughs> far down. I believe was it six one down at six one. Yeah. And now tied up in overtime. A far kind of different lineup in terms of operators that we see. The Oso getting brought out. Kevin's on the ying. I mean, I like Kevin on the ying. Kevin's been able to just kind of walk in the site, get aggressive without the use of candelas. Now mm -hmm. they can blind his opposition. He might oh, be able to go after the nuclear. Play. He's just going to lob all of those ying candelas in as Pogo goes straight for the big window. Obviously, the same old happened in the first half is they've got to deal with Valkyrie below. And I'm wondering who's going to do it. Is it going to be Ser Pega? Is it, who's it going to be? Because until you deal with Valkyrie, you are not going in the big window. And that realistically is going to be Riddle's down, down pot. Unless, I'm wondering if they go for actually a, a kid's dorm side through the, the window. Because it's clear as day from the first few rounds that the kid's dorms is not going to be held by m, m Academy. That's the way they do the reinforcements. So I'm actually just wondering if they go for the kid's dorms and try and force the way in there with Yings as well. I'm not sure, but if they do go for big window, they've got to deal with the frost. And that's the biggest hindrance to them right now. A water position set up. Prone beneath the window, waiting to get caught in that frost, man. If it's still up, you're going to be absolutely free. And that SMG does hit quite hard as well if you get caught out. The main wall inside of games room is now getting chewed open by those Selma charges. The case is in the hands of Osa all the way by big window. So, again, that's the indication. That's the play they want. But they might try to fake a push now. to try and cause some chaos to force the players down below to force a retake. But as you say, Frost down below, that might just unravel the dreams of Riddle. The down does come out from the window player from Katal, <laughs> who finishes it off with a gone six. And their plan, I think, at the minute is just throw stuff into sight and be a bit random and see what Eminem Academy do if they get moving. As the big window jumping does eventually happen, Ekri gets that kill. Ying Candelas are going off. Kevin finds another kill. A relaxing finds one back. He's got to get the diffuser. He's got to try and play for a plan. Out of range of Goyo Canisters, relaxing's dead. And they know the frost is below as Kevin's jumped into a frost, man. And what's going on? The shotgun peak will come out. We're in a 1v1 scenario right now. Of course, Aikri doesn't know that unless there's a sound cue. The Goyo Canisters actually going to deny the frost. He's going to run through. Find the peak. Find the kill. And Aikri gets himself a 1 versus 3. I have no idea how he's done that. He got 1 with a frost, man. He got 1 with a shotgun. And then 1 with his main SMG. He's pulled his team into overtime match point. The bravery to push through the flames knowing, okay, I'm gonna run through, they'll hear the sprint, they'll hear the damage, and just to have that confidence. Walking into that frost mat as well, unraveled it for Riddle, and I thought when we saw the kill feeds pop off, the candelas all around sight, I saw it went to myself, surely not. Surely Riddle can't find it. 1v3, that's no problem at all for Eminem Academy. They find themselves an overtime match point, but Riddle, I don't think that's going to knock their confidence too much. They got here. It was a hard-fought battle to get to overtime. And now they're on the defense. On one of the most favorable defensive sites in all of Siege. This basement here in Oregon. Mm -hmm. M&M have struggled a little bit here. At least historically, their main side has. So can Riddle just hold out and push us to round 15? I think regardless of who wins this fixture. Because obviously one team is going to win this fixture now. Whoever wins, whoever loses... The real winners in the kind of heart and the emotion who will go away happy from this fixture, Riddle will go away happy from this fixture. Whether that's an overtime loss or an overtime win, Eminem, regardless of whether they win this fixture or not, are going to go away upset. You know, if we get an interview with Eminem, should they win? Whoever will be on the interview will probably say, we're not happy with this performance, even if they win. If we happen to interview Riddle, they're going to be absolutely ecstatic. Because, you know, as much as Riddle did throw that, don't get me wrong, 3v1, Relies on a hero play from Mercury coming out. Those happen. Did throw it. They would have liked to win it. But they're more than happy with just getting points. You know, we saw them in the chat. So, fair play. They're going to get out on the roam once again. Sepeg is going to get shut down on the roam once again. This is what happened the last time on the basement. So, Eminem, they've got a good idea how to do the first minute, minute 30 seconds of this specific attack. But where we saw them fall apart was that last minute 30 seconds where they're not going as one. You know, we saw Skiddy die on the free to stairs again. Nerf, once again, he's learned from his mistakes of past. He's not giving away his breaching capability. He's not dying in this round until he absolutely needs to. So we need to look for the same from Skiddy when he eventually gets down those freezer stairs. 
Very, uh, it's, it's not the most pleasant of jobs to be tossed on what Nerf has to do outside all the way by main lobby holding that cross, but it is the dirty work supports have to do. Perry's looking to try and clear his service, or security I should say, and that's going to just well, anger the beasts somewhat. Zero K gets aggressive and finds him with the LMG. Five versus three, and that opening pick is unraveled as for Riddle. They are struggling to find a way back in this round, and Eminem feel like they just have their tails up right now. They might start going hunting. That could be their own demise where we've seen them just lack information at times and be punished yep. for it. Rotation of a shield to get ready for that posh potentially down laundry stairs. Change of positioning, I think. I think it's going to be Ekri that's actually going for the freezer stairs this time. They've completely moved Skiddy off that position. He's just holding tier one flank until he eventually has to go down and he's going to be the one backstabbing and it's going to be Ekri taking that position. I think that's a wise adaptation. Ekri have a great bit of FPS play there actually. Waited for the Jaeger to reload then decided to push him, knowing that he had that advantage of just being able to swing that LMG as much as he needed to. And realistically, 5v3, got yourselves in a great position now. It's just about that 3-2-1 go and go exactly the same time and overwhelm the site. We've seen Riddle, though, in these positions, being able to find moments of magic. They can just get one or two early on in this. Evan might be the vocal point of that one. So far, a fantastic game on an individual basis. That drone will spot him out. Lots of guns training the one positions at the same time. And they toss down. That will open a massive hole inside a freezer. That will make Pogo's job harder. But with one that final toxic gas cloud tossed out, he'll have to wait just more 10, 10 more seconds till the pressure from laundry arrives. Kevin can't push up too much further. He's going to be left exposed to the players by bottom laundry. But Pogo will find one. This could be the opening. Surely not, Riddle. Surely you can't do it again. Nerf is going to get find a lot of damage. Relaxing will dart on in. Nerf will be left in DBNO, however. The shotgun close in supply. I might be able to find one. No, it can't. Now it's all down. The Qatar in a 1v3. But the time! <gasps> the time closes it out. Eminem caught napping. The nerf in Dibino drops the case on their body. Not recovered in time. A massive misplay and riddle have forced us all the way. Round 15. Regulation couldn't set rid these teams. Now overtime has to be closed by one more round. Riddle, what a journey this has been. Surely, surely you can't find the strength to get one more round. Oh, that's a siege moment right there for Eminem Academy. Um, and they, you've got to press F to pick up the diffuser, and you also press F to recover your teammates. And that's what happened. The diffuser wasn't picked up, and the sledge went into the recovery animation onto Nerf. Unfortunately, so couldn't get the plant off. But that one, that one down but not out, has just cost Eminem a round there that looked completely in the bag. But let's just dissect that round very quickly because it went better. You saw that Aircrew died in Freezer, but what happened when he died in Freezer? His teammates had managed to get themselves pushing in Laundry. They went at the same time and they managed to overwhelm the site. Skiddy went for the backstab, took some t attention away from the main push. It all worked out beautifully, but they lost on time and they lost to, you know, a very, you know, slight mechanic of, of two key bands being on the same button, essentially. Um, it was a round that they should have won, but didn't. And just like the first round of overtime that they should have lost, but didn't. <laughs> We've got ourselves all the way to overtime in this crazy, crazy, crazy game of Siege. As Riddle, they've got to attack the basement, which was another site that they really struggled to attack during regulation. You want a reason to tune in to MPL, any National League. This is why we love, I love National Leagues personally. This type of result, Eminem on firm, on form alone, should have had this round. On paper, it looked like them. Riddle hadn't been playing anywhere near their capabilities, and now all of a sudden, round 15 required to separate these two teams after Eminem were leading 6 1. Riddle finding the resolve, the strength to get to this stage. And I gotta say, I'm starting to believe. Momentum and storyline. What a day for Riddle it could be if they can get two points out of this one, but at the least, they do have that one. Eminem Academy, they're going for a bit of a roam strategy once again, as you'll see, which means Riddle have got to clear the whole map, all of the drones, and make sure, Pogo specifically, that you don't die as one of the only two breachers. Slight variation in lineup, we're seeing an Osa, we're seeing a, a Maverick as well, so there's breaching capability, there's a lot of nades on site, there's Ban, I'm liking this composition, we're not messing around with Capital anymore. And also those shields could come in very useful um, late on. Save Kevin's life there specifically. There's still roamers though, and that's 90 seconds that the defenders have managed to waste um, with without losing any life as well. So they'll be more than happy with that. Relaxing will drop deep in freezer now. 
that nade wasn't timed perfectly enough to stop him a nerf. Well, he's toying with the idea of getting aggressive. Loads a few more shells to his Mossberg and looks to cause some chaos, but they're pushing up, or planning perhaps, to push up behind the saucer shield, and... Well, that's gonna be oh. a very unfortunate turn of events. Sir Pega has disconnected, meaning it's gonna be a four versus five. That C4 will be tossed out, but he's gonna get blinded, and as the shield drops, Nerf will find one more riddle. It all falls apart at the final hurdle. All down the guitar, all alone. AOX in hand, less than a minute to recover. And, uh, well, an unfortunate end to this storyline, but Riddle, they will get themselves one point. And, well, maybe, there might be an ace clutch on the cards for us, but surely Eminem won't surprised. give us that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this game has thrown us so many curveballs. If there is an ace clutch here, I wouldn't be at all shocked. No. Oh, no. <laughs> And that will be GG's in chat all round. And I think, you know, realistically, neither team is going to... Both teams are going to go away, away with that. With so many mistakes that they know that they can go away and work on. I think Eminem, they won the game, but they're going to be very, very annoyed by that particular performance of having been so far in the advantage and then taking it all the way to overtime. Lots to go away and, and, and learn, I think, for these teams. And Eminem, in the end... That two points that they will get from the overtime, it's not free, but it's better than one. It's nice that Riddle were able to get themselves their first point in this matchup, but it was a very hard fought one as well. That's kind of the nice story on this one, but this could be a nice momentum turn for them. They found that, okay, we can have some success. They saw what worked against Eminem Academy here, and maybe, again, a long round, 15 rounds, lots of tape to review and go back on, as well as their time and scrims before the next play day. This could be a beginning of an upturn for Riddle. I mean, I mean, let's hold our horses. It's a point. <laughs> it's a point. Um, they put themselves in a terrible position, but they showed some great guts to get back into it, I think. Um, but the, the fact of the matter is this could have just as easily been a 7-1 as it was an 8-7. So, lots, I, as I say, lots for both teams to go away and work on. Um, but, you know, good. And this was the one that I said. I said right at the very start with it. This was, if there was going to be an upset, I thought it was going to be this one. We came so close to getting it, uh, we didn't in the end. But what about those rounds where, you know, it was just big clutches and rounds that, this one particularly, the team's lost, where they really shouldn't be losing. This round as well, the 1v3 from Mercury, the shotgun, the frost mat, the running through the Goyo fire, and then finishing it off with the SMG 11 as well. Those are two rounds that realistically the team on the receiving end of the clutch shouldn't have lost. Uh, the one upstairs you gotta look is how was he able to cross into attic and get the freebie on the cover and the plant someone you said had to be lacking on the cover watch and on this on a certain angle there to allow that happen and of course just the heroics that charge through the charge through the fire go up white stairs and deny and win that round i mean there was magic there well that's all from us after the very first game we need to go and have a nap and regenerate our energy because it's absolutely drained us that game 15 rounds all the clutches so the desk they're gonna have fun breaking that one down over to you ian yes thank you very much fresh thank you very much whip it there it is it feels like yesterday when i was putting together some notes on that one to say hey convincing stomp there from the M&M <laughs> Academy to hand Riddle their seventh successive defeat. The back end of that sent sentence is still true. Uh, Riddle still failed to get a dub on the board, but wow, that was quite a, a, a kickback from those guys, X. Yeah, and we were sort of sat there and I, th I think Grace said perfectly, she said, oh, it's match point. I wonder if I've got time to fill up my water. And the score was 6-1. <laughs> And I said, it's you could have run a bath. Round. You could have run a bath. <laughs> you could have had a bath. I said, it's the start of the round. You probably got enough time. Don't worry about it. I'll watch the game and I'll fill you in with it if, if anything big happens. Um, and then it went on and on and mistake mm. after mistake. Fresh put it great. You know, a, a game, a game of many mistakes, a game of many clutches and big individual performances. And I think that Eminem sort of succumbed to that mindset of, it's all right. We only need one round. We only need mm. one round here. We only need one round. And then you lose two and you're like, it's all right, we only need one. And then you lose another. And that's when Eminem take the time out. And then they're thinking, guys, we're two rounds away from this going to OT here. We need these three points. Like, well, what's going wrong? Why can't we finish this? And all the while, Riddle are just getting more and more and more hyped. As soon as it went to 6-6, six, six, Kevin's typing in all chat. Finally, <laughs> we're getting points. Like, this yeah. is our first <laughs> points. We're guaranteed one here. And that just goes to show how much it meant to them. 
Um, mm-hmm. I think that Riddle will be happy with the way that they bounce back. They showed really great heart there tonight. Yeah, absolutely. And Grace, sit tight. I do want your thoughts and feelings on that result as well in, in a, a few moments' time. But for now, we can cross over to a bit of an interview with Nerf of Eminem Academy fame. Nerf, welcome. Oh, I like how you... It's just the bottom of you at the, the bottom of the screen there, Nerf. How, how are you? You all right? Yeah. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm all good. right. That was, that was a stressful one, but... Well, let's talk through it because it, that could have ended a, a long time ago. Um, is that the sort of a win that... It leaves you frustrated despite getting a couple of points on the board. Do you come away from that, you know, feeling a little bit deflated? Yeah, that, it was a really draining one. Like, I think it was 6-1 and we, we were just making such stupid mistakes. Like, we kind of just got overconfident and just did random stuff we don't usually do. So it's honestly quite embarrassing that we lost that. But respect to Riddle, I guess, they, they turned up and played well. So, but yeah, it's a going one to, to go OT from Yeah, that. I mean, yeah, you guys started out really aggressively and, you were looking like you were, like you say, having having a bit of fun, really, and almost like flexing your skill set a little bit. And then do you think it sort of started to drift away from you? At what point did you start to panic? Um, well, I think I called the timeout at like 6-4 because we just wanted a reset because we were just making silly mistakes. Like we just, yeah, it was just, it was just kind of slipping away from us there, but we couldn't bring it back, unfortunately, until OT. So it cost us a point. Well, that being said... You did get the job done eventually. And how important mm. is Akari for you? He's been insane. And, and he was once again pretty impressive in that match there. Yeah, he's really important. Like that, that 1v3 he got on, on OT that she won us the game. So players like that are just amazing that he can make those. Honestly, it goes for everyone on my team, though. Everyone's so talented. So, like, really impressed with all of them today. Absolutely. Including yourself, Nerf. Um, are you happy with your position at the minute? 11 points on the board now. Could have, could have been 12 if it didn't go to overtime, yeah. but overall, are you feeling pretty good about it? Um, it, was, it was kind of unfortunate, really, because we had a lot of close games that we just couldn't close out. So we've had two 7-5s and now we're 8-7. So like, there's a lot more points we could have got, really, if we just fixed some small issues. So we're, we're not like disappointed, but we could be a lot higher, I think, to be honest. Yeah, and there's still time to climb that table as well, Nerf. So mm. congratulations on the on the long-winded win here this evening and uh, hope you have a good evening. And I'll speak to you tomorrow, I imagine, if you, if you make it through again and, and get the dub. Yeah, hopefully. You too. All right. Take it easy, Nerf. See you in a bit. All right. Yes. Good stuff. Let's, um, let's bring the squad back in. <clears throat> I want to know what the rest of Nerf looks like. That was, that, and, and, or maybe that, is, <laughs> maybe that is the way that we should all position our cameras. Maybe that's the new thing. But... Great guy. And, and, you know, it came out on top after what was a a really tough performance there, Grace. And, you know, X reflected on it there. If you, if you are Riddle coming off the back of that, do you think you can be feeling positive going into tomorrow? I think you can from Riddle's point of view. Yes. I think that certainly it gets to a point where if you've had like a bit of a rough time and then you get a scoreline like that, you're going to start being a bit more confident. And I think that is something that Riddle need a little bit more of is confidence. Even in the first round, we saw, um, you know, we saw this aggression from the attic window from Eminem where they were trying to get that early pick onto the arm. I believe it was Katal and they actually managed to shoot them out, but then they couldn't, some of it, then Eminem went for that refrag. And it's just little things like that. Where it's like, you have that confidence to, you know, swing quickly and get that pick, but then you're not expecting the refrag to come through. Based on how Eminem have played throughout the entire season so far, I would be expecting that refrag almost instantly. Yes, they can be high progressive, but they are playing constantly together in those like duos and trios, regardless of whether they're on attack or defense. So if I did get a pick, I'd expect another head to suddenly pop up behind them. Yeah, and, and we, we touched on it just there in, in the interview with Nerf um, X, and we really highlighted Akari coming into that one and absolute clutch play from him. Yeah, I, I, was, I was screaming the, uh, the <laughs> yeah, frostbite round. <laughs> it was... Um, it, the thing is, it, it was a round that Riddle had attacked really well. They'd done everything really well up until that point. It was a four versus one. Um, so... What what oh, three versus one, four versus one in and around that? What can you say that you know one one wrong frost mat uh, and and one wrong challenge and all of a sudden it's it's game over and it's a one v one and you've really got to start thinking about how you're going to win that as riddle. Um, but up until that point, they'd attacked really well, which was nice because it came at the turn of the half. 
Um, it was it was that first round of overtime. It was as we'd seen Eminem essentially bottle a lot of their attacks onto that top floor, and it was looking like, yeah, you know, this 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 could be a little bit of an option here for Riddle if they come in and take a really convincing attacking round here. They're going to be looking quite good. Um, but you know, Akari had something else to say about it and pulled off. I mean, it's up there. It's up there with Clutch of the Week already. We're in, yeah. we're in play day one. We're in game one, so there's not really been much else to go on. Um, but it, it's definitely in contention. Well, it was an entertaining, unpredictable start to play day seven, and we are just getting started. Match two, Ambush versus Arctic is coming up after the break. Don't go anywhere. My name's Will. I'm a C4 tetraplegic uh, following a cycling accident in July 2012. I got back into gaming in 2013 when I found out about Special Effect. And the first time I came I really didn't know what to expect. I'd been playing a lot of games prior to my accident and of that FIFA was one of the main games I had played and literally within half an hour I had the shoulder switches and had FIFA set up. I've got movement of the uh, shoulders to limited hand movement. So I've got two shoulder switches. They can be set up for whichever trigger button you need them for. For example, you've got X on one shoulder, circle on the other. So for FIFA, that's two button modes and chin control, like the one I use for my chair on the analog stick to control the ball. I was quite fortunate that after I'd been to visit Special Effect the first time, I took all the equipment home with me and it gave me a couple of months to actually get to the grips with you know, whether it's something that I was going to enjoy and something that was going to be suitable for my needs and it certainly was and then we got the links to purchasing the right equipment. Games are another aspect of the life that I had prior to my accident and a real social occasion. Great to be competitive with friends or just to pass time myself. When I was in hospital I was seeking advice as to what would still be possible and I have been told that I wouldn't be able to play games like FIFA again. I'm just really grateful I managed to find out about Special Effect that I've had this opportunity to get back into gaming and I wouldn't have been able to do it without Special Effect and I would recommend it to anyone else in a similar position. In three quick kills, four quick kills coming! And Slothar just picks them apart! Let's try and put some shots on in, and managing to find the last two! Oh, the blur just decimates! Prince steps up huge for Ambush! Three kills, all E1 DCs, and what?! Welcome back to the R6 NPL. Uh, my name's Ian Chambers. This time, rejoined on the desk by a couple of different faces. We've got Fresh and we've got Whippet. Guys, how we're doing? Whippet, why is that cow still there? I can still see the cow every so often. Not on screen right now, but there is a cow somewhere in the background. I feel very zoomed in. 
<laughs> the cow has yeah. become uh, my prediction cow. It, it's helped me pick predictions in other in other leagues. It's not doing done too so well in, in my MPR prediction so far. As you called out in the post show, I've not been not mm. been doing too well on that one. I mean, I may have missed a few weeks, unfortunately, but you know, the cow might help my luck now. I don't know. Maybe you should move it, eh? Let's uh. move on. Uh, move on, eh? I'll stop. Fresh. Let's first off it's reflect. <laughs> like, I'm stopping. It's over. Let's first up reflect on Eminem versus Riddle. Uh, you must be, guys, like, vocally exhausted because it felt <laughs> like it was uh, said and done, done and dusted a long time ago, but that was not the case, Fresh. The most entertaining matches, Ian, the most entertaining matches that you ever get as a viewer are the matches that make me pull my hair out because there's so many blindingly obvious mistakes that are committed by both teams where you just quite simply don't know who's going to win the round. The amount of rounds that were won in that previous game where teams shouldn't have won it was incredible. Um, but it made for a great spectacle. So, you know, who's complaining? Yes, yeah, it's, it's one of those, isn't it, where it's a frustrating win, which is a never, never an a, a yeah. easy pill to swallow whip it when you get the dub, but it means less. Yeah, it's not going to be, I think, the most pleasant of victories for Eminem. They'll have a lot to learn. They'll have a lot to see from that vaudeville. You're right, we have to iron out a lot of mistakes. And they've got another play day tomorrow. They don't have a lot of time to do that. But that might act as a bit of a wake-up call because throughout their, even their run uh, under a different organization, you can too, they felt kind of victim to that as well where they made mistakes and it cost them quite a lot of the time or cost them mm -hmm. significant points. Let's hope they can start ironing that out, that, that out now as that's a very much of a wake-up call against Riddle. All right, moving on. Our next match of the evening is Ambush versus Arctic. Let's start off fresh by taking a look at this Ambush roster. Three wins to their name so far this season. 11 points in fourth place. They're looking decent. Yeah, I think so. And I think they're realistically the only teams that they'd lost to are actually Heroic and Na'Vi. So if you consider this as, you know, their tier three results, they're unbeaten um, against the teams that they're in and around competing for that Challenger League spot with, which you know, they're holding the flag for the Nordic region as the one team that's going to come in and upset the Yukin teams that want those Challenger League spots. Um, they're performing really well. They've got a lot about them. You know, Nick's a great player, but the whole roster, you know, I think the you know, it goes without saying they're the best Nordic team in this competition, but mm -hmm. they're really up there having a crack at the teams and I think define a lot of expectations of a lot of people. Yeah, it's pretty obvious, Whippy, Whippy that this roster isn't scared to get out there and go for it. No, they, they, the way they play Siege is a fantastic style. It's, I mean, I have a, you know, I, I speak to some of the players occasionally, and they play with a style of jobs instead of roles. They assign people to do one thing, and you pick your operator, you pick where you're spawning, all that based on what you're assigned to do, and it leads to some really interesting moments. And the way they rotate around the map and adjust to what they're kind of faced with mid-round is why they're the best Nordic team right now in MPL. You mentioned there, Fresh, how impressed you've been with Nick in particular. Obviously, you're, you're a big fan of his entire roster, but what is it about Nick that makes you have you know, an eye on him whenever he plays? I think it's just individual skill. So a lot, a lot of the things that we see from these Nordic teams, um, generally, because obviously I've had the privilege of cost casting Nordic you know, back in the day as well, um, is that they have the right idea usually what happens is their individual skill sometimes lets them down you know when they come up to just a straight up gunfight they often get outclassed specifically in this league you know that's why we're seeing team other teams like that so for nick he's able to be up there and compete with the best of them so you know they've got that that great team as you say with the kind of individual jobs but then also they've got those players that can step up and can you know outfrag other teams in this league all right let's move on now to the arctic roster um their form isn't as strong as Ambush, of course, Whip It. They've only got one win to their name so far this season, but that's something they'll be looking to change here tonight. Certainly. It's, it's a very interesting matchup. This is the two full Finnish teams against each other as well, so it's a little bit of a grudge match. Of course, Arctic Water kind of... I think this is the match that means the most to them right now is getting victory over their fellow countrymen. And Husik, Farid, South Park, Monks, and Nicky Wood is... They're a fantastic roster. I've seen a lot of these players play from some of the gra grassroots scenes yeah. that I've been involved with. And to watch them and see them at this level is fantastic. And there's so much potential here. It's just getting it all stitched together on the night and doing it consistently. But a lot of pressure tonight, I think, because two Finnish teams against each other. Arctic have a bit of a point to prove. They don't want to always live, be living in Ambush's shadow. Yeah, and that, that national rivalry only ever adds a little bit of extra spice fresh. Oh yeah, they, they know each other well, they'll want to beat each other and, you know, 
Ambush, realistically, have been the team to beat. So Arctic have, you know, they've got a big task to do so. But I cast this team through the qualifiers for this particular tournament. And Sal Bark, when he's on his day, he can mix it with the best of them. He was playing that Alibi Maestro automatic shotgun. And he was just popping heads like there was no tomorrow. He's got a lot of confidence. So if there's one player to watch out for, in my view, it's probably him. One player to definitely look out for as well is the Philae. I think I'm saying that. I think I'm pronouncing his name right. Um, forgive me if I'm wrong there, but you know he's definitely a player to be. <clears throat> I'm losing my voice, um, and, and I didn't even just cast it's it all the screaming like after you guys that last game, isn't it? Yeah, that was it. Behind the scenes, just losing my losing my voice. Um, <laughs> big player, and it, and it is going to be looking to have a big match here. I'm going to come to you for this one. Um, whip it. Yeah, definitely. It's always popping up for Ambush. It's one of those players you always see making an impact. And, I mean, you look at that cost. It's a 69 cost. Nice cost on that one. Above 60 is always kind of that area you want to have. You know, above it, or an impact in more than half the rounds you play in. It's... The KDR, not the best so far, nor the entry, but that's not the role they're playing. They're on that more flex support role, it's backed up by the factor on Sledge. The impact they make is far more in the utility clear, and as I say with Ambush, watch how they define the way they take sites. It's all about one player doing one defined role, and the way they rotate is absolutely fantastic, and we get a chance to see that today. One thing worth mentioning here, Fresh, is mm -hmm. that, you know, Attic have currently got three points. Yes. Um, Below them in ninth, you've got uh, Riddle on, on zero points. And Coalesce are going to get the gimme points here tonight um, due to Navi forfeit in the next uh, couple of matches. Mm. So there's, there's quite a lot of pressure here on Arctic to get the win. Yeah, because you're talking about potentially dropping into that relegation zone. Um, in, in fairness, you probably are because it all comes down to round difference. And obviously, Coalesce aren't just going to get three points. They're going to get a 7-0 as well. So plus seven in the round difference. And I think it's important that, you know, you keep fighting because obviously if you're a Nordic team, you don't want to be relegated from this league because you want to be playing against, you know, for a Nordic team, this is their only opportunity to play against Heroic, to play against the Navi, to play against some of these really good established Yukin teams. Because we see the Yukin teams, you know, and this is no disrespect to your Nordic, but Yukin has just constantly turned out pro league teams, keeps churning them out, you know, the Navi roster, the Heroic roster. Um, the M and M roster that's in in Yukin as well. Uh, sorry, in EUL. So mm. these points that any you know you're in a finished derby, you can pick up points if you're Arctic, and they're massive come the end of the season when you start thinking about relegations. That is how you sell a match. I'm super hyped for this. Um, it's time to find out where we're going to be going. Let's bring up the map vetoes here with it. I'm going to let you take this one away as we magically find out below us where we are about to go, and we are going to Oregon again. Oh, a repeat, another Oregon, but again, for the matchup of these two teams, they know each other well. They don't want any other variants. They want to play on something they both probably know, and Oregon, everyone should know that. As you look through the bands that we see, I mean, Theme Park Villa, the first two to go up, not surprised at Theme Park, and I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit sad I didn't see Chalet. I saw it in, in the You Can Rumble how good Ambush were here, and I mean, I love watching Chalet. What do you think, Fresh? I think teams love, I, I, I think Ollie said it in the preview of the last game, is we've not seen it a great deal inside of MPL, but I think teams love Oregon and they love it as a best of one map because it's a map that every single team can play. And like you say, like we saw in the last game, it's where good teams can go to die. You know, it's that age old thing of the map might have changed, but teams still go there and that's where upsets can happen. So, you know, who wins this on this particular map? Anyone's guess. Well, let's find out. No guessing needed. It is time to get right into the action. Ambush versus Arctic on Oregon. And this time, calling all the action for you is X and Gris. Ian Fresh Whippet, thank you very much. We are going to be covering the action here as we head into our second game of the night. And we're going back to Oregon. I think I might have cursed us, Grace. I said at the start, we've not yeah. seen a lot of Oregon. And we get Oregon again. Um, I mean, are. it wasn't really too much of a shock, given the bands. You know, Chalet or Oregon last. Uh, Ambush starting off on the defense. They're going to take that advantage of Oregon. Yeah, definitely. And again, um, I think this is going to be an interesting one when we go to more of the kind of equalizer, even Stevens maps. And then you would assume that they're probably going to have a pretty bog standard, standard picks around that too. It's going to come down to how the teams are playing around each other. 
um, things like gaining that control, focusing the objective, how they prepare for those executes, things like that. So it's more about seeing who is the one prepared to cross their T's and dot their I's, so to speak. Well, let's see how these two teams face off against one another as we head into the ban phase. Going to be ambushed to ban first. They're going to be starting off on the defense here. I would imagine that we see something along the lines of a hard breach of ban, potentially a Thatcher as well. It is going to be the Maverick. So the Maverick removed. Maverick, of course, a lot of use here on Oregon. Now, the Arctic ban's interesting. They could go a couple of different ways here. Ambush mm -hmm. are the team that very often like to ban either a Jaeger or a Whamai, and they also love to bring a Ying. Arctic could read into that, and they do. <laughs> It's just too easy. So the Ying is going to get <laughs> removed. Now, that's obviously to, to sort of counter some of these nice pocket plays that Ambush like to do. Ambush really like to bring a Ying, especially on Oregon. A lot of tight spaces. You can really cause a lot of disruption with that. Valkyrie going to get removed there as the second defender. Now, the big question here is, do Ambush actually still remove the Jaeger? Um, I would guess not, given the fact that the Ying's removed. Maverick's off the board you're going to be a little bit less pressured on those nades and stuff like that. Cade comes through as the obvious choice. Thatcher's still up. There's a bit of a question mark over that one, but still, mm. that is the phase over. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see if Arctic decide to actually bring the Thatcher. It can really go either way with a lot of teams. Sometimes, you know, you're so used to scrimming without a Thatcher that you don't bother. Looks like we're kind of getting that here as well. Of course, we've got the classic Ayana Finker combo and along with the sledge as well for that soft destructibility and more nades to add to the made netter. Made, made netter? Nade meta yet again. So again, from both sides realistically, it's pretty bog standard lineups. Yes, the mirrors come through and they are choosing to utilize that, of course, in that basement area. But um, it's as I say, it's going to be a case of how people are getting this map control or retaining that map control and then who is getting those kills when it comes to that final collapse so may the best team win really again one thing that'll be quite interesting is given that these are two nordic teams i do feel like that gives more information for both teams to work with you're familiar with the team you're going up against you should be able to do quite a nice bit of counter analysis so it would be interesting to see you know how both sides fare with that looks as though a rehost has been requested it did come in quite late though, um, so I'm not sure if that will go ahead or not. The round was already underway. We'll continue to play out until we figure out exactly what it is that's going on, and we are going to get that rehost confirmed. So, not really seeing anything too much to go off there. I think there must have been a problem with one of the Arctic players uh, getting into game, or maybe something just not mm. quite right. But we'll get that sorted, and we'll get back into the action very shortly. One of the things that you mentioned there, Grace, about the mirror being open in particular, that's something that is going to take a lot of coordination, really, to deal mm. with. Um, especially when you're looking toward that bottom floor. Now, the Twitch was brought as the, as the sort of response, the direct counter. You've got to get those Twitch drones in, though. You've got to try and navigate that shock drone through and see if you can pop the, pop the glass. Obviously, failing that, you can still go up and just bang it. You know, you can just melee it, um, and, and that will sort of disable the glass as well. Um, mm. But I do worry a little bit about the sort of coordination from, from the Arctic side of things, because that's going to take a lot of a lot of everyone pulling in the same direction when they're on the attacks. I think that's it, isn't it? Coordination. You've got to make sure that if you are going to push that freezer area, you first need to get that pillar's control in order to ha have the line of sight down towards where that you know a player could be playing around that mirror, as an example, if you're not going to get it out of the Twitch or any kind of utility. Um, and in order to get that pillar's control, you have to get the entirety of Big Tower probably meeting as well, um, a lot of blue. So there's so much control that needs to be gained if you are going to make that freezer push based on that utility alone. And, you know, that call needs to come through very fast and furious in order to deal with that. Or they're going to have to probably just go for an entirely, you know, one dimensional push, really, uh, when it comes to this site, unless they want to get a bit frisky with it down laundry stairs. But again, that can be difficult due to the crossfires held, or well, three different crossfires in that regard. So, um, yeah, their best bet is to try and get that tower control, I think. And... We'll see what they do anyway. Again, it could just be that they do go for that one-dimensional push. You know, they go for the oldie but goldie. They get that tower control. They get that blue control. And they just collapse in from there. Um, but again, depending on how this roam game is going to look from ambush as well, there could be a few 
A few sneaky snakes lying in the grass. Absolutely. And that's something that Ambush are going to be aware of. Ambush are going to know and recognize here that we could probably, you know, play out there on the roam a little bit if we want to. We've got Rody playing Mozzie. Um, that's going to do something to deal with the Twitch drones potentially on site. But I think it's more likely going to get played out and about. He's going to be a little bit more active. Might even choose to get out there and roam. Rody is one of those players that is known for much more solo play um, and mm. someone that's quite capable of just being sort of sat upstairs in attic or even inside of dining or something like that and, and can just cause a little bit of a nuisance from up there and then that's when Arctic could potentially run into the further problem of if they don't do that thorough roam clear the flanks mm. when they come in or when they try and flank to get a bit of pressure into meeting all laundry late on into the round. That's it. And again, on both sides of that equation, it will come down to timing. How much time you want to waste on that roam. You know, if Rody, we do see him actually in, in Small Tower right now. So maybe he's going to kind of look around this area for a bit longer. It looks like he's just going to kind of... It looks like he's more hunting out drones, to be honest. Again, having um, all of his pests out. I think it's just a case of him going to shoot any drones that may come through. This could be a massive time waste if they don't decide to go from Small Tower, but they have indeed. Nick also joining him in dining to try and... Give a little bit of backup and I mean this could be an interesting one. It's gonna be a kind of five versus well, four versus two engagement around this tiny part of the map. It's crazy to see how highly Ambush are prioritizing these drones. They really do not want any of these drones to be let through because they know that if Arctic don't have the information, they're really gonna slow down and they're gonna have a hard time pushing in when they don't know everything that's going on inside of the site or for example where these roamers are so a couple of drones already gone as we can see further drones moving on through nick is in a position to try and assist roadie a little bit here the hatch has been opened so a drop into freezer is going to be possible arctic not moving too quickly just yet they don't want to over commit to this Absolutely not. And you've got monks even upstairs trying to go for some of the verti around that kitchen ceiling area and that's going to waste a lot of time too because it's again all about this room clear and delaying as much time as possible if you are the defense. And that is a outrageous run out coming through from Defele. W falling down. And it's that all important Twitch that we were talking about taking off the board as well, X. I'm not sure how Defele has gotten away with that one, but Ambush can sort of rest easy now knowing that half of the round's been burnt, the Twitch has been removed, Utility can now be rejiggled around if required and they can just start to play around these mirror windows a little bit because it's going to be quite difficult to get into a position to do anything about those mirror windows wamai has been up this entire time so rastin's going to have been throwing his magnets around he's just regenerated another one there as well so nades shouldn't be too much of an issue there should be a, at least a little bit of protection arctic still looking to take this top floor control they don't even look sure that they've got the mid floor at this point yeah i think this is it i think they're fully prepared to just have someone turn around and flank them at this point south park's been standing there for what feels like half an eon at this point again no one actually playing around that mirror window which is quite interesting um looks like roadie's gonna try and take the gunfight to south park though but again where is this push really gonna come from because there's less than 30 seconds to go x and there's no you know the concrete setup here well the hatch drop is looking like a good option but with the burn coming through it could just be a little bit too little too late especially for where nick is sat rastin picks himself up too and nade does land onto roadie but it quickly leaves south park in the one versus Oof. four coming in from freezer really not a lot he can do about that gets finished off by the pistol as we see a nice little swing there to close out that round ambush great patience there yeah, 100%. Um, Patience of Saints just waiting it out for as long as possible. They didn't really try and get too overly aggressive either. We did see when they started playing around each other in the kind of kitchen and CC area, they weren't really trying to go for these swings and over peaks. They were just waiting for Arctic to come to them, which is really, really good, really patient. Um, and again, as, as a result, Arctic weren't as confident to make those pushes. So we saw the timer just burn out more and more and more. It got to the point where it was like, where is this execute coming from? Because they haven't really set up. I'm not sure if they were trying to go for maybe, you know, a, a freezer stairs kind of CC hatch pressure and then get that meeting pressure or go down the front as well. But um, it got very chaotic towards the end there on the side of Arctic. They did have to drop electrical hatch and... 
I'm assuming they didn't have the information about blue at that point either, which is a little bit uncomfortable because you really need these flank drones about. And it goes down to Ambush's biggest focus in the start of round number one was denying that drone information. Yeah, exactly. And we saw exactly. both Nick and Rody out there on the roam and they were, for all intents and purposes, staring at drone holes, waiting for drones to come through because they knew that if they removed that information, then Arctic are going to have a really hard time pushing on into the site, especially when something like a mirror is going to be available. 100%. It's like an Arctic kind of... I'm not entirely sure what their main game plan is going to be here. It looks like they're probably going to try and go for the big tower control, but the time again is off the essence with that. As soon as you get that big tower control, you start opening up the stage and uh, attic wall. That's going to alleviate a lot of the pressure if you finally go for that plant as well. So they should know what they need to do. Rody lurking in attic, just checking cams, getting a little bit of information for the side of ambush and... No immediate approach into the building. Now we see monks coming in, finally going for that entry, and it's where they really need to start clearing this top floor. But I am surprised why they didn't just try and contest tower a little bit more. Again, maybe it's a confidence thing, X, to be honest. Yeah, I don't think that Arctic are making it entirely easy for themselves. We've got the oh. Thatcher available, and we, we did sort of comment on that at the start. Sure, Maverick mm. got removed, but with Thatcher up, you should still be able to get a lot of work done. So the fact that they haven't contested Attic all too much is going to leave them with a little bit of a blind spot here. But they are just looking to try and push on through. Southbox actually already quite well invested into upstairs. He's currently sat inside of games. Kilius is going to open things up though as Nick takes a swing onto Monks and this top floor push is just falling apart. Rastin takes Southbox down and Faro is left. Fuser in hand but realistically what can he do from here? Wasn't sufficient information found out. We didn't really know exactly where Ambush was hiding. And Arctic have just walked into it. Yeah, and this is it. It's, um, again, another issue of them not really having the, the right kind of intel that perhaps they need, but also the approaches that they want to take um, on, you know, both these rounds so far. Um, I don't think they're as clean cut as they could be. Maybe they're, Maybe it's a case of, you know, that maybe they're expecting those more standard takes and those more standard pushes, so we're going to try and give the old razzle-dazzle by going for something a little bit out of pocket. You know, Farah getting the pick there onto Nick, that's going to set things off a little bit nicer for them, but it's still a 4 versus 2 x and again, timer is ticking. You still have to get this top floor control, and you still have to try and go for some kind of execute, get that diffuser downstairs and go for the plant. It's really looking more and more unlikely now as the seconds tick by. Barrow going to pick up a couple of kills here to pad his stats, but that's likely all it's really going to be. Ooh. Finds the third, actually. This could be an ace clutch if he does manage to pull it off. He's got 20 seconds. Needs to find two more kills. Hits the drop. Bulletproof camera immediately calling him out. That is now going to be broadcast to the team. Removes the information. Looks to push on Ooh. through, and Killius hits the swing. A little bit of a risky challenge there. There's a world mm. where he loses that, and it ends at one versus one, but... Fortunately for Ambush, they do end up locking it up. That top floor hold, too strong. But again, I don't know if it's a case of their hold being strong or just Arctic approaching this in a very unusual way where they're not really going for something that would maybe seem a bit more obvious to do or maybe, you know, go for something a bit more standard. Um, again, it's Kid's Dorm now, so it's this idea of, well, what do they try and do? Do they try and get that top floor? you know, that big tower control and then push from the bedroom and get the, you know, attic and games walls open? Or do they try and apply extra pressure through kind of, um, you know, white stairs and double window? Only time can tell. This is a part as well where I'm half expecting them to just all decide to just walk up armory stairs for some reason. That's how unusual they've genuinely played these last two rounds. So, um, and again, there is a, there's an element of maybe understanding things like that in some regard because maybe it is that they're trying to go for something obtuse in order to keep ambush on their toes but at the moment it's not quite working so i do think they need to go back to basics a little bit here and go for something a little bit more by the book yeah i think that ambush are just looking to play a very proper air quotes game of siege yeah they're bringing they're, they're, they're very much bringing the right thing at the right time mm. and maybe with the exception of roadie as medics highlights the mozzie <laughs> sat inside a t3 when i'm talking about air quotes proper siege um but they're bringing things like the goyo they're bringing things like the wamai they you know they're really playing around these these operators that can do a lot to to burn out time and to make things difficult for the attackers and knowing that arctic isn't the strongest side on attack 
Ambush are really looking to try and exploit that weakness. And they've done so quite well in the rounds up until this point. Let's see how Arctic want to try and approach it. Now, you said Armory Stairs, Grace, but yeah. it may be White Stairs because we've be. just seen a lot of people <laughs> running on through. There's a couple of drones searching out for the player that is going to be inside of dining. Monks is starting to rip open a lot of that wall, but they didn't account for the vertical. Helios able to take South Park down. Nade comes on through. Does deal some damage onto Defele. Conscious of Green Hall. No one really there in any capacity to cut that off either. So Rody can choose to either make a rotation back up the tower. Oh, and Oh, dear. No. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Oh, no. Well, this has just gone from bad to worse. You've lost the, the opening pick again. And then you get finished off. Rody obviously heard that or has seen it somehow and has been able to take advantage of the downed player. Ah, oh, this isn't looking great for Arctic. It's not. But again, they seem to be having a little bit of an issue but opening the wall into kitchen do you suppose they're not actually aware of what site it is and that could explain maybe the push that they've decided to go for again why would you really waste a salma i guess you you know you do have a minute or so still to go and you can obviously get some of those walls open with the salma uh, that would probably be a bit more beneficial so i'm guessing maybe they had the wrong site that is a bit of a unusual utility investment just to make sure you know you're trying to go for potentially just one kill there um looks like they have finally clocked where this is going to go so we can see this pressure from the double window coming through from monks but again they need as much information as possible to try and hunt out the remaining players of ambush well, monks is on that big window but i'm not sure what he's going to be able to do ambush aren't being given a reason to move right now we have Music underneath, he's going to go up the armory stairs, but he'll be met quite quickly by Rastin as the Goyos popped. That's going to burn at least 20 seconds and probably force a rotation. At this point, we can see Iana there opting to go over toward the white stairs. No nades in hand, so nothing really to be done from below. C4 pops and it's going to find one. Kilius picks up a great shot over onto Monks and, well, Kusik, 10 seconds to go. I think we all know how this one ends up. Not sure if it was a lack of intel there, as you mentioned, Grace. It's it's not entirely unusual to use a hard breach to open up that wall. Typically, you'd do it earlier, and you would bring another hard breach. I think that we're almost seeing Arctic hamstring themselves here by not bringing a very good lineup. They're bringing a lot of nades, not really using them. Bringing a Finker and an Iana, they're not really going for entries. Yeah. They need to really lean into a Thatcher, double hard breach, and, you know, try and play a little bit more in that fashion this is it maybe they have to go a little bit super old school with it you bring that thatcher out you bring the habana you know you bring maybe a you know a fermite and or a um you know ace um and you just go a little bit old school with it go for the roam clear try and get those reinforced main walls open and go a bit more by the book with it they are swapping to the habana now they're also bringing that flores which is probably going to be quite useful because you know that's a really nice way to clear some of this utility or even get people out of precarious positions uh, when you're trying to go for these clears and these eventual hopeful collapses that might go a bit better in future. But it's as you say, the Ayana and Finca, you'd expect a bit more of a confident entry from you know, players like Kusik and South Park right now, and it's not quite coming through. Um, but again, I do think that's down to the approach that they're taking in order to get into the actual buildings themselves at the moment. Um, it could have been quite interesting as well to have seen, you know, if Rhodey's lurking in the tower, if they had a push tower, how that actually would have gone. Because um, if they're applying, you know, pressure as a team on that kind of part of the map, um, it shouldn't have been too difficult to hunt down, you know, Rhodey on the mozzie there. And that could have been quite a nice little opening for them to actually just get someone off the, t off the table early. Um... And just try and apply just a little bit of extra pressure onto ambush i don't think ambush are feeling pressurized at all and i think that's a bit of an issue right now because um yes ambush are playing a little bit more relaxed to be honest they're not being hyper aggressive or anything so it's not like they're bringing anything spectacularly you know thunderous i guess um but there's just an element of ambush just letting arctic make the mistakes that they're making and just kind of sitting back and watching it happen yeah, I think Ambush know that they can play fairly passively here and mm. just watch Arctic get themselves in a little bit of a knot. Um, and that, that's kind of what's happening, realistically. Let's see how they choose to approach this round. They've 
Certainly got time to redeem themselves here. Three rounds going to ambush while it looks great on paper. If the next three go to Arctic, we've got a serious game on our hands here. But see if the information is going to be sufficient here. There's a big focus on these tower stairs. Nade going to come down to burn the Banshee. Bulletproof camera going to get placed by Nick just to keep an eye on that laundry. It's a little bit of double redundancy there, but there's not... There's, I mean, there's other places you can put it, but with the mirror window watching onto it as well, you would hope that that's going to be covered. Rastin, though, all the way upstairs now. He's got the ability to rotate, of course, playing on the Aruni. He can even choose to drop a hatch if he so wishes. I'm sure if Ambush know entirely that Arctica really stacked on this north side. And this is it, even though, you know, it's you've got two dimensions here because you do have Kusik at the front, you know, albeit they are by themselves, so if they get caught off guard, that could be a little bit of a wasted position. But at the same time, I think they're playing this a little bit better by actually get, taking that tower control first, spreading themselves into meeting, and they're probably going to get the hatch open, and then it's just a case of making their way down towards Pillar and things like that. I'm assuming Kusik will probably make their way, um, you know, down that laundry stairs as well. So it's a case of them starting to apply pressure onto site. As I say, Ambush just kind of having a having a bit of a relaxed one because they are just firmly plonked on side. We do have Roasted like, upstairs still, um, who could actually cause quite an upset X, to be honest, um, if they do decide to push down that laundry stairs behind Kusik, as I say. But you now it looks like Farah is actually ready and waiting to try and get this wall open. It has been electrocuted, though, by those bandit charges, so... It's where they need the EMPs to come through. And it's as we were saying, why aren't they bringing the EMPs? They finally are. And things are probably going to go a lot better in the sense that they're actually finally going to get one of those walls open. It's only taken until round four. And um, we've finally seen a little bit of utility <laughs> exchange there. That part doesn't look too sure that meeting's clear. There's a couple of shots do come Ooh. through there from Kitchen. They are going to be further exchanged as Rastin eventually finds himself down. Kusik finishes that one off. And the opener, for the first time in a long time, goes to Arctic here. It is going to be instantly traded, however, and Defele is playing in a horrible position here. Finds Ooh. himself too. Look at him go. It's the diffuser called on the ground as Monks pushes on through off the back of a couple of nades. But no one's accounted for Nick playing on the pillar. And he's going to find the last oh. with the pistol. Kusik attempted a knife there. A pretty scrappy way to round out the round. I think Kusik even knew that. Yeah, I think this is it. They, that final attempted at a collapse was very very chaotic and you know ambush were allowed to clean up just from the tight angles that they were playing but i do think that was so so much better from arctic they they've started ironing out the crease in the sense that they're going a bit more old school and by the book with it um i really hope they bring that factor again because i really do think that was helping them a lot obviously they, they did get that wall open um they got the hatches open, they cleared me um, tower as well really quickly and were playing really well around that. They managed to get rid of the Roma and um, that could have caused an upset. It's just a shame when it came to that final you know, collapse that there were just people ready and waiting for it to happen. Onwards and upwards, though, Arctic. Onwards and upwards. Yep, still a chance to pull a couple of rounds here. And we've already seen what's happened on Oregon earlier tonight. We saw a 5-1 turn into a maximum overtime, so you can never truly count your chickens here on this map. <laughs> However, we have got to call it as we see it, and at the moment, Ambush are firmly in the lead. See if they can extend that any. I mean, this is Naughty X. We're seeing the Feli on the cap cam, which I think... I'm wondering if that's more Ambush realising that the drone game isn't quite as on point as it could be coming through from Arctic, and whether or not they're testing them here to see if they, you know, can punish them for that. Um, obviously, those cap cam traps being attached to the doors, you really have to rely on the drones to kind of spot them out. And I think something like that coined with the mozzie and the way that we've seen Ambush play to pick up those drones and take them away from... Uh, Arctic, both through shooting them out and those mozzie pests. I think this is going to be quite an interesting round. <laughs> oh, well, that's certainly interesting to start things off. Kusik getting a lovely little pick there onto Kalis. Nick, however, ready and waiting in this top tower position. Patient like a cobra in the grass. This is where Ambush could come unstuck because they've shown great patience up to now. And then Kilius gets himself taken out super early there on a peak, and you think to yourself, kind of, why? C4 is going to come down. It's going to deal a good chunk of damage onto NW, but not all that much. Just a little bit less than half. But also, it's 
given the game away that there's going to be somebody playing inside a big tower. Now, is Nick going to be able to get out of here alive or not? Usyk is currently boosted up by the Finker. Goes to throw the drone in, so he knows that somebody's there. And <gasps> he just gives himself away on the window? What? Nick's been gifted a kill here. Mm. That's done wonders. It's traded back from Killius Ooh. earlier. He is going to get taken out there. But it's not as bad as it could have been. No, it's a little bit of a of a stinky one there. But I really, that was an incredible shot from Monk, so can I just point that out? Like, that was a really nice refrag. And again, punishing the extra aggression that Nick was trying to bring then. But again, you are at this uh, awkward moment where you've got half the round gone. You need to start making your moves. Where do you want to go? They are trying to get this city stage wall open, but it's really going to rely on them getting rid of that util and... Here we go, we can start to get this wall open. South Park has to get rid of this player on stage, otherwise they're not able to go for the collapse. And, well, there's aggression coming down green. There we go, Rody getting one there onto South Park, Defelli getting one onto Faro as well. Arctic were in such a good position there, and it's all just been unraveled by the aggression of Ambush. And again, the lack of information as well. You've got to wonder where these five drones are at the moment. We've got three in the pockets of players that are playing, or, sorry, out there on the map, should I say, in, in Monks and NW, but... What, where are the where are the drones that are set up watching the flanks? Because that's really what's being exposed there. Going to see an EMP thrown through the breach. Need to follow it up. We know that there's nobody sat in that corner instead. Belly has rotated. He's a little bit more nearer to the bomb chassis now. Another nade going to come in off the back of what looks like no information at all. And there you have it. Both nades gone. Nothing really gained for it. Ambush can again just sit back. There's still drones available here, and there has been for a good time. There's only 10 seconds now, but there was a lot more. Monks picks one up onto Defele. NW gets himself into a bit of an engagement here as well. Two seconds left on the clock, and it's all down to pistols. The diffuser cold on the ground, and Ambush run away in an attempt to secure yet another round here. I guess the thing I'm finding really curious is the fact that as time goes on, they are starting to look a lot more concrete on the side of Arctic. It seems like these... Um, you know, the strategy they're actually taking to each round is a lot more clear. Um, it's just the fact that then Ambush will just give the old razzle-dazzle. And as we say, and you know, you mentioned it perfectly, where are these drones then? Where are they facing? Um, because you need that information in order to prevent things like aggression, prevent things like flanks. Um, mostly there, it was just the aggression. Again, I think the, the play down green ultimately won Ambush that round, in my opinion, because Arctic had the player, you know, advantage. They were setting up to go for that collapse, and then all of a sudden, blink and you miss it moment, you know, the players start getting cleaned up. Round number six is going to see us head to that top floor again. This is somewhere that Arctic have had a lot of trouble attacking, and we didn't really even see them contest onto this top floor at all in the previous round that they, uh, that they attacked onto the top floor site. Instead, they got really heavily wrapped up in dealing with the roamers below and didn't leave themselves enough time or manpower for that execute. Something that we sort of questioned a little bit was the lack of a hard breacher and the lack of a Thatcher. And uh, again, you know, both would have been welcome in this lineup. You think about attacking that top floor, you want to try and get yourself through Attic, you want to try and get yourself through games, and you want to try and have somebody on double window. If you only have two of those three, then it gives your opponent, the defenders, somewhere really strong to hide. So you've got to have presence in sort of all three corners. And that isn't something that you're going to achieve when you only bring one hard breacher unless somebody is super, super speedy and rotating around from one and the other. And we've not really seen that yet. And this is a, this is a massive utility setup just to kind of protect one shield here in the trophy area. So right now, Ambush are really relying on Rasting staying alive. We have a Vulcan at the top of Armoury. We've got the Magnets to protect the shield if they start to throw in utility from that bedroom area. Rasting themselves. I think they started to realise that this aggression is coming through from Arctic. And there we go, South Park getting a nice opening pick there onto them. That's going to clear things up, of course. It's Attic. Why are you reinforcing that? That's so late. South Park trying to get that shot. Could have been a freebie. But at least now they know exactly where Rody is. Rody sending a bit of a fire themselves towards a bedroom area. I love that aggress aggressive angle. It's not often that you see it, but when you do, it really can go two ways. And it really shows which player is just feeling themselves on the day. 
are all going to come under no obstacle there, opening up the wall into games. Leaving that wall soft into Attic as well is... It begs even more of a question. Look at Nick with the swing there. Too preoccupied with pre-firing onto Rody and Southport gets taken down. Attic can now breathe a sigh of relief as the cross has been cut off. Farrell going to push himself right into box. What is he doing? That wall's about to open. Picks up the kill onto Nick. What a reactionary shot there. Still has the diffuser. Ambush trailing by a man here with one minute left to go. Rody in a good spot, though. He can cut off quite a lot from Attic. Farrow is going to try and get that plant down, though, and there's really no one in position to stop it from happening. We could be about to see our first round here for Arctic. Kilius has to move and transition, but Big Window is being watched. Defele going to make his approach up White Stairs as well. The smoke is going to cut... Sorry, fire is going to cut off Rody inside of the Attic. We do see a kill come in from Kilius. But there's still that presence of the big window. When Kilius goes for the swing, well, that is all he is going to be able to do. Kusik finishes things off from the bottom of those white stairs. Much better plan. Well, a much better round, sorry, that included a plant from Arctic. Definitely. I think it's really good that Arctic got a round on the board, but I think the pressure's really on Ambush now to try and, you know, close this off. I'm not sure how I felt really about their setup on that last defensive round, though. Again, I think there was so much utility investment around that trophy area when perhaps they could have taken something slightly different. I know that Goyo is still quite important at preventing that final collapse, but I think sometimes the placements could have been in, in better areas. Good to see Arctic get around on the board, and that's certainly going to perk them up a little bit going into this defence, where perhaps they will feel a lot more comfortable. Two shields coming through. They have got the alibi. I believe that we did actually hear uh, Fresh before mention the fact that we would most likely see Southwark on the alibi as well, so that's probably a nice comfort pick, and again, probably quite telling of the way that they want to strategize around this defense they want to have that shield but they want to have that comfortable thing and i also feel like alibi is a highly underrated uh, operator when it comes to this game in comp sometimes i think it's brilliant i think especially if you're against a team where perhaps there are you know moments where they are outgunning you slightly if they get too cocky or confident it can really keep them on their toes of course you see the head of what you assume is a player you go to shoot it it's actually an alibi clone and then the other team get that life ping to work off of we're only seeing one c4 though so again the workaround to that is that they have to get a little bit aggressive themselves on the side of arctic um i guess let's see how it goes x only one c4 on the side of arctic and only one hard breacher again but this time the difference we have got that secondary hard breach gadget being brought on Kilius. Playing on the Capital and bringing the can opener. Zero as well. Going to be bringing that to the party. So that kind of makes up for the lack of a hard breach. You, kind of, you can kind of account that as you've got one hard breacher there. It's just sort of split over two operators. Um, you're going to be able to get a good amount of stuff open. And, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a bold move from Ambush to run with that because it relies on a couple of people being in the right position at the right time but seems to be working defele is going to find the opening pick onto faro dealing with that potential vertical pressure so we see a bit of a different way of approaching it ambush sort of really held back when they were on the defense and arctic are doing very similar but the main difference is coming in the way that the attacking lineups are approaching it and ambush are a lot more slow and steady here happy to wait until they get into position to eventually funnel these players Monks and Kusik, they are not going to get out of there. Monks has got a couple of impacts, so they could drop into Freezer, but it looks as though Ambush are fully aware of that as the Freezer hatch is going to be open from below. Nades now start to fly <laughs> up in through the hatch, and that is not anywhere that you want to be. Kusik picks up one onto Nick for free. How does he get away with that? Did they not know that there was two of them in there? I'm going to assume not. Again, that was maybe part of the strange strategy that we're seeing there by Arctic, but now we're going to see Kusik get flashed, and there we go, Rody ready and waiting. A few shots to the body, and that's going to take them down. It's all left down to the NW and South Park here, and, you know, Ambush, we do have a fair bit of time to work with still, 50 seconds or so, but need to get a bit of a jolly on to try and get up some of these stairs. And it does appear to be a, a player in Big Tower still as well, but I don't think... Yeah, there we go. They're going to try and rotate to the attic area as well. So we're going to see a bit more of a direct approach here. 
over, you know, lines of sight being opened up. You look at information as well and just how much ambush have got for themselves here. They've got zero cameras getting fired out. Defele's still got two in pocket. I think he's already fired one into kid's bedroom. We've got a couple of nades going in from below to remove any utility. We've got a little bit of a skirmish happening here at the bottom of these white stairs. A skirmish that Rody's more than happy to try and swing onto. And NW left in the clutches. Plant now going down. He's just surrendered the site entirely. Put himself all the way into trophy. And games room wall isn't open, by the way. So there is only one way in back to the site, failing a full site rotation and coming up white stairs. But he's starved at this point. He's not got a clue where anybody is. Going to move through the barbed wire. Give the vision, Ooh. give the audio cue. Excuse me, Defele loses his head there. A great reaction shot from NW. But you can see ambush are setting up. Upside down repel on the big window. NW going to push his way through now, removing the drones as he goes. Conscious of the vertical as well. I'm sure he knows where this plant has gone down. He's certainly going to find out just there. But with the upside down repel on the big window, it's going to be very, very difficult. And there's not even enough time left remaining either. Oh. Big swing from Rody to finish things off. Ensure that he gets that kill and further pads those stats. It was an admirable attempt. Again, very difficult to know what to do in that situation, especially when both players potentially have that line of sight to use if you do try and go for the defuse. Um, really nice shot, though, to, to start that attempt at a retake off, though. That was pretty spicy. But again, match point. It's not looking too good for Arctic. I do think that this will definitely give them a lot of information to go off going forward in terms of their own you know, strategies that they want to take to the table. I think that they can certainly look over this VOD and be like, okay, we kind of went wrong here. We kind of maybe should have gone a bit more direct here. Um, and there have been moments of, of brilliance on their part. It's just, yeah, Ambush are just on a little bit of a stompy one right now. Well, let's see if it finishes a stompy one. We had a stompy one in the last game. This is true. Up, and it ended up being a blooming close I've jinxed one. it now. I've jinxed it now. <laughs> I mean, you know, lightning surely doesn't strike twice. Arctic on, reverse on, sweep. On the same map. <laughs> in the same night. True, um, true, true. We, we will see, though. We will see. New, new Oregon curse incoming for NPL. Potentially. Yeah, we'll see what happens. <laughs> I think the difference is that we know that Ambush are not on tilt yet and they're not likely to go on tilt, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, they, they do tend to play a fairly prescribed game of Siege. You know, they've all got yeah. a very specific role and a job. And they, they've, I've said it before about this team is they have some of the best teamwork that we see. Um, because when they when something gets called and when something's happening, everyone's on board with it, and that's uh, you know one of their major strengths. That and uh, Fele on an LMG picking up the first kill there as he takes Kusik down. Again, it looks like a pretty swifty clean up so far by Ambush. South Park actually taking on Nick Bill is down to an almost trade coming through, and I think we're going to about to see Kalise come forward and finish off that little frag to the side of Ambush as well. There we go. Three versus four with a load of time to work with. This is a pretty nice position for Ambush to be in to really try and close things off. I guess the the question on everyone's lips is how do Arctic try and prevent this from coming through now? Again, they only have you know, one C4 if they do want to get a bit aggressive over the staircases and try and you know chuck, chuck a C4 up staircases or things like that. Or even if you know hatches get opened, um, maybe we will see something like that happen, but I doubt it. I think what would be quite nice to see is maybe a little bit of aggression maybe from Arctic. Because I think at this point Ambush are just expecting Arctic to kind of take it lying down. Yeah, I just need to still make sure that they finish this quite strong. And I think the fact that they're getting the hatches open, Rody's waiting in position, all this leads me to believe that they're setting up now for a, for a good execute. Yeah, 100%. I think that's it. We've still got the three Toxic Babes in pocket on NW, though. So again, loads of opportunity for them to try and 
delay any push, but Rody taking out Faro, that's well. And Monks as well, <laughs> double nade kill. And W manages to take down the Feli, but the plant is being stuck in. Look at these angels being held X. It's going to be a very, very difficult retake yeah, now for NW. The toxic babes aren't really going to do much. They're still in pocket. No opportunity to use them. Has to try and hunt for these heads of these players. There we go. There's one. Lovely little shot there. Can they take down Rodi and Kalise as well? No, they cannot. And there we go. Ambush. A really, really nice clean up there. Ambush there, tidying things away very nicely on Oregon. Seven rounds to one against Arctic. They're going to be happy with that performance. I think that there's mm. very few things that Ambush can go over there and look to uh, look to really heavily improve on. There's a couple of micro improvements here and there, but they controlled that game start through finish. <laughs> Uh, and what a start it was, people flying out of windows there. Mm -hmm. um, it, it was one of those games where Arctic, I really just didn't feel like they were bringing the right tools for the job on the attack. I felt like they were making things very difficult for themselves and looking to try and take these, you know, real sort of direct routes into sight. We very seldom saw an important key wall open um, and a lot of the fights came down to single doorways and windows. And when you do that, you, you're always going to come under that, you know, 50-50 gunfire. And if a defender's already looking at the doorway or the window, it's very likely that the defender is going to get the kill. And that's what we saw happen. Ambush mm. really just played very patiently on their defences, and it paid off for them. No, 100%. It's, again, this issue of if you're going to go a bit more direct and kind of, um, I guess, a, a hostile approach into the map, you need to take the utility behind you to deal with that. You know, and, uh, and interesting, they could have taken that really old school, like, glass yin combo if they wanted to go a bit more direct with it. I think that could have been quite nice for them to do. But um, I, again, I, I think the main issue here is that they need to go a little bit back to basics and go a little bit more standard. Yeah, I um, there was a tweet that I did see uh, a while ago, and I think it was Citizen that tweeted it. And I think it was onto one of Ace's posts about him being a support player or something. And the okay. tweet basically said, from Citizen, we need more support players, not more Ayana players. And I think that that <laughs> game is a really good example of it. Like, and, and I'm going to drag mm. Finker into the mixture here as well and say that we need more people that are willing to play support and, and just take things back to basics. You've got so many gadgets. There are so many different things that you can look to use and bring. And if one team's doing it, the defenders and the attackers aren't trying to counter that, they're always, mm. always going to come up short. And I feel like that's what we really saw tonight. And then other nights we look at Siege and we go, well, Siege is a shooter, just get five kills and you win the round. It, that, um, mm. it really is either way, isn't it? Yeah, I think I think that's the thing. Like, uh, you know, sometimes you have this element of, you know, when you've got a, a good roster with a good, strong support, um, you know, stack with them, that's when you see teams focusing the objective more. They didn't really mm. have that. So, of course, we are going to see these more direct pushes. It did feel more like, OK, we're going to try and win via kills instead of focusing that objective, especially in the first few rounds. Um, so, you know, I think realistically, us breaking it down isn't going to be quite as exciting as Whippet and Fresh breaking it down. So I do think we are going to flip over to them. I think you'll find there's an Ian here as well, but you know, whatever. That's fine. <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, thank you, guys. Thank you, X. Thank you, Grace. Um, I'm now rejoined by Fresh and Whippet. Guys, I I'll come to you first, Whippet. Obviously, Arctic, get absolutely ambushed there. No pun intended. That was pretty easy work, really, wasn't it? I mean, you actually put it perfectly. They did get ambushed. I and mean, they had very little information. I mean, those first two rounds I want to highlight the fact that Ambush were able to destroy 17 out of the 20 drones available on the opening two rounds. Leaving essentially Arctic completely blind, they had no information and pushing into a team that's mechanically sound as Ambush without knowing what you're facing. That is a very scary premise and we just saw how dominant and how punishing that was. And with the two drones that survived, it was a mute mozzie combination up. So Ambush really attacked information So uh, this game. Yeah, fresh, dominant and punishing are two really good words there from Whippet to describe what we just saw. That was it. It, it felt like in, in professional sports, one of the times and one of the things that teams do in physical sports is they do a practice match and it's called unopposed. And that's mm -hmm. what it felt like for Ambush today. It didn't feel like there was an opponent on the server. And I don't know if that's maybe a little bit disrespectful, but, you know, they were just better. Like they can shoot better. They can shoot a bit harder. And unfortunately, it's kind of same old, same old, right? It's like where teams are just being able to do that to them. 
Well, you did fresh going into this. You did really hype these guys up as, <laughs> you know, the, one of the top teams yeah. that we need to be looking at. And you were absolutely bang on because when you put on a clean performance such as that, yes, Arctic haven't had, you know, the best run of form so far this season, but they have picked up a win. And they're not, you know, a, a, a threat that you can just brush under the carpet. But Ambush once again proved here that we need to be taking these guys very seriously. Yeah, they, you know, like I said, the only teams that they've lost to have been the tier one teams in this competition. They've beaten literally everybody else. You know, they'll have some, they'll have some harder challenges to come. I'm absolutely sure of it. But they're going really well. And, you know, as the only Nordic representation, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of Nordic people that are really hoping that they go on and push these teams for that Challenger League spot. Absolutely. Whip it out. How do you think, just briefly, how do you think um, Arctic are going to be feeling? Because this was a real opportunity for them to, to get out of a bit of danger. Yeah, they're not going to be feeling great, especially it was such a dominant result from Ambush. I think they faced stuff they weren't really prepared to deal with. Like, again, just that lack of information. The fact that Ambush seemingly hunted down drones and used, you know, that perfect counter information set up to that mute mozzie. There's a lot to look back on in this VOD and really start ironing out mistakes. It's going to hurt. It's a local rivalry. They're both full finish squads. They would have wanted to win that one out. I mean, this will, it's back to the drawing board for Arctic yet again. All right, guys, you two stay where you are. Stay tuned. We're just going to cross over to a bit of an interview right now with Kilius um, from, of course, Ambush. Um, Kilius, welcome to the show. Uh, that was a, a national... Hey, I like the salute. I'm into that. <laughs> um, <laughs> that was a, you know, a national rivalry as well that, that you guys dominated there um did that give you a little bit of an extra edge do you do you feel like that the win means even more being a, a national rivalry like that of course arctic is always a hard team to play against i mean we have been playing against each other for how many years now i think two two years so it's it's always a fun fun game but i think this time we we took the bigger you know i don't know what yeah you know we we no, I know, I know. <laughs> exactly yeah and, and you know we we were just talking there with with fresh about how it felt like it was almost a little bit too easy for you there it's like your opposition didn't really show up do you think that is down to um the players you're up against or was your performance just too good uh i think it was just that we played exactly as we wanted like every single round we had planned some like something that we did we did that and it worked basically and they didn't like surprise us with anything so it was just playing our own game and focusing on getting those rounds ending cleanly so you've now got 14 points to your name and you are looking really strong on this table um how much momentum are you guys feeling as a unit right now and how high up this table do you plan to climb uh we'll see of course Tomorrow we'll have a last game of the split, and we'd like to win that as one, one as well. And with that, we'd have 17 points. I don't know where we end up, but uh, there's still up like half a split to go. So this their like table can go anywhere in my mind still. So Absolutely. no, no need well, to stop. Practice, practice, practice. Yeah, and and it's um it's it must be quite overwhelming to I guess carry a lot of the hopes of Nordic fans. Um, on your shoulders because you are the top performing Nordic team at the minute and do you feel that extra pressure at all? No, it's it's fantastic to, you know, get people from Nordic to hype us up because it, it helps in the long run because you know you know there's it, it's it is pressure on, on the other hand because you want to perform for, for, for Nordic so of course we'll carry the flag heavily on our shoulders. Kilius, one last question from me. Do you, just out of curiosity, do you like Pringles? No. You don't? No. Yeah. Um, I don't think, think you did. Because, and just for the record, other Chris brands available, of course. Uh, we, we, we do say that. But yeah, good. I'm glad that, I'm glad that you don't. Yeah, just keep shuffling shuffle across a bit further. Is that, <laughs> is that possible? <laughs> Kilius, congratulations on your win. <laughs> there they go. There they go, the crisps. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thanks. Uh, have awesome. a good one. Thank you, buddy. All right, good stuff. And uh, what a guy. I love that. He was just shuffling along there. Um, and, and the salute was nice as well. You know, what I like about this, this roster, um, Fresh, is, mm -hmm. you know, they are on a good run of form, but they're very modest and they're taking things in, you know, in their stride and, and being, 
like I said, very modest and humble. Yeah, they know what they want to do. They they do it with a kind of class, a kind of elegance, if you will. Um, you know, Hillis is a great interviewer as well. Uh, you know, as as you've seen yeah. as well, they've they've been a really good welcome addition to this league. I think, um, and like I say, they surprise maybe not the teams. You know, if you speak to the Yukin teams, maybe not too surprised. But I think as general viewers, are certainly the viewers that came from Yukin to watch NPL. Um, will have been surprised by them, but going into that split too, as you know, as you mentioned, they will be feared by a lot of the teams in this league. Yeah, that's the, that's one thing that's really important about building momentum in the first split. Whip it is that you know you make teams fear you a little bit more, right? And that is something that they're starting to build up here. They really are. I mean, if you're a team trying to prep for ambush going into the second split, you've got to look at this massive run of form they're on right now, and the way they're playing is exceptional. It's Honestly, it's close to a masterclass as I've seen, and they're right to be able to carry that Nordic flag with pride because they're doing a fantastic job representing that region, and everything they do seems so well refined and so well planned out. It's an absolute joy to watch them play. Well, speaking of a joy to watch, get ready because Heroic versus Vaperia 86. You couldn't ask for a more tasty match. In fact, we have got another tasty match coming up later on as well. So we've got two absolute bangers coming your way. So Heroic 86 is after the break. You'd be mad to miss it. With the merge of the UK and Ireland Nationals and the Nordic Championships in the new Northern Premier League, we get to see the best teams from both regions clash together. Now let's take a look down on Nordic teams and get to know them a bit more. First on the block we've got a Coles, who have spent the last year in the Benelux region playing under KVM. But a couple of roster changes later, the team had a Swedish trio, and so they ended up in the Nordic Promotion Tournament, but a flawless run earned them a spot in the Northern Premier League. Jarp on their entry, and lethal in the clutch. Coales like to get a bit funky and break away from the default operator picks. It's Uses, Kapitaus and Yings galore, and they are on the attack. Now ambush, these titans of the north need no introduction. Runners up in the Nordic Championships and two-time Finnish champions. Ambush are the team to look out for in the race for the Challenger League spots. Ruthless in their executes and fearsomely efficient even when down a man, you can never count them out. Recent additions of Rastin and Nick have added young firepower to the experienced core, and the explosive mix has lifted Ambush to new heights. They are sure to turn some heads and take off a couple others during the season. The perennial little brothers Arctic are chomping at the heels of Ambush and have been trading blows constantly for the past year. Now finally arriving at the Nationals level after fighting their way through the Nordic Promotion Tournament, Arctic are looking to get one over their local rivals. Years of hard work has brought the team up through the ranks to fight among the best the region has to offer. Picking up South Park at the start of the year to round out their roster, Arctic are not going to play nice. Like a wolf, they wait for their chance to dethrone the king. Hailing from Norway, Riddle picked up a team who blitzed through the Norwegian Championships without dropping a map. Play under their license in the new Northern Premier League. Snatching the talent that kept from their local rivals to prepare for the competition, Riddle presents their opponents with a conundrum. Underestimate them at your peril, but you can't give them too much respect either or you'll run down the clock. What they lack in experience, they make up for in raw potential, and their volatile playstyle can catch teams off guard. And that wraps it up for our Nordic competitors, who you can catch in action battling it out against their UK hopefuls during the Northern Premier League season.
Three quick kills, four quick kills coming. And Slothar just picks them apart. Let's try and put some shots on in and managing to find the last two. Oh, but Blur just decimates. Chris steps up huge for Ambush. Three kills, all E1 DCs. What? Welcome back to the R6 MPL. Uh, my name's Ian Chambers, and look who's back! I missed you guys from the pre-show. Hey, I mean, that's not a diff to, to whip it and grace. Uh, fresh, by the way, but welcome back, X. Welcome back, Grace. Um, before we start talking about what's next, let's just briefly reflect for a second. Um, impressive stuff from Ambush there, X. Another statement win. Yeah, um, we were expecting it from Ambush, to be honest. But it's always nice when a team goes out there, gets a good advantage, and still plays really disciplined. And there was a little bit of, you know, crazy play here and there from from Ambush, but they, they got it over the line, and they never pushed themselves too far. It wasn't too aggressive. It wasn't too out there. Um, just great basics. A team that's going through the motions at the minute, and it's picking them up points. Yeah, Grace, I think that's something that Eminem Academy could watch and think, oh, that's how you, that's how you finish a, a match. That's how you get it done and, and follow through. But... Yeah, it was impressive, and I think that a lot of people are becoming ambush believers. Yeah, 100%. Um, and again, I think that that definitely showed that they are the reason why everyone's kind of calling them like Nordic's last hope when it comes to NPL, because mm -hmm. they are probably, you know, the Nordic's team that's going to have the best bet at getting into that kind of top five, top four position for this table if they really iron out the rest of the creases and what they bring. At the same time, Arctic, you know, yes, they, they are losing um, some maps and stuff, but it's this idea of, do you ever truly lose if you're gaining experience at the same time? Mm. I mean, the issue is, is that they're in a, a, in a, a battle at the bottom now. And X, mm. it, you can actually take momentum from defeat sometimes. And Riddle definitely have more momentum from their defeat than Arctic do coming out of that one, right? Yeah, I would certainly say so. Um, Riddle are, are going to be still trailing, I think. It puts them on one point, so they're going to be trailing by two points still against Arctic. Um, but I, I do feel like Riddle will be feeling good going into tomorrow. You know, they had a close game against Eminem Academy. The players were on form, and if they can try and translate that into tomorrow, maybe the, uh, they come away with some points there as well. But realistically, on the side of Arctic, it's another performance where we look at him and we go, you know, you need to show us something a little bit deeper there because it, a lot of the basics were missing for me. Well, in all sports, we absolutely love it when two of the top three go head to head. And this is no exception. Heroic versus Valperia 86 is coming up next for mm -hmm. you. So I know hey, Grace is already um in. So that's, that's, <laughs> when you know, that's when you know you've got a good one on your hands. Let's start by taking a look at this heroic roster. Um, I mean, what can you say about these guys? They're obviously a, a very much proven commodity in Siege, and they're doing it once again here in this in this league, Grace. Absolutely, like a hundred percent. You know, I think this this roster we've seen how they've played in order to make it to the the major in a, in like a few weeks' time. So, um, this roster on their absolute top tip topidiest form that they've ever been on before. And I think even though, yes, in NPL, they're not playing with their full strap book and things like that, it's the mechanical ability and the way that they're playing as a team that is really cementing a lot of their wins, both across like every tournament. Um, and I, I just, I think it's incredible seeing the, the growth journey for a lot of these players over the years as well. I think that's something that um, really warms the cockle, so to speak. And I think that going into this, they probably are a little bit of a terrifying threat, even to you know eighty six, who are a good team in their own right. That that just goes to show that the levels that these guys are are at at the minute X when you've got a team two points below you that in theory there's a little bit of fear there. Yeah, I mean, I think that eighty six are coming up against uh, heroic at an unfortunate time, given that this is going to be one of the first times. Um, or one of the few times, should I say, that Heroic actually field their main five. Um, typically, they play with a little bit more of a rolling roster. We see quite a lot of Mr. Officer here inside of the NPL. Um, he's subbed in so far for, I think, Gorgona and Uno. Um, I don't think he's subbed in for Grizzly, but I may be wrong on that. But we, we haven't seen Heroic play with the same five every single week. So for them to be playing with their, with their A team, with their first team, as it were, tonight... 
it one goes to show that they are you know obviously in a headspace to prep for charlotte which is only a couple of weeks away and two, it shows that, you know, they know that this game against Viperio means something and they want to pull out the big guns and not just rely on Benja popping off and getting a ton of kills. They want to still have that base five team synergy. Absolutely. The uh, the, the big guns are locked and loaded and that is a formidable um, starting lineup right there. 86, as I mentioned, third place, just two points behind them. They are going to be looking to get some business done and dusted here because it would be a real statement from them and it would launch them right up to where they need to be here. If they get the win, first place is, is on the horizon for them, Grace. Yeah, it is. Um, obviously, tonight they are playing with Actor instead of Astro, so they've had their sub come in due to player availability, I believe it was. Um, so again, you could say that might give them a little bit of a disadvantage here, but at the same time, you do expect that the sub of a team at 86's level to still be present or you know doing analysis and things like that when it comes to scrims and teamwork outside of games so um I, i'm hoping it won't really change things that much um at the same time you know a lot of familiar faces within that roster as well and um, that we've all come to love and adore as well so i think that they if they mind their p's and q's here they could have a chance to try and cause an upset you back this team x i backed him in the prediction but i backed him before i knew that they had a sub <laughs> um, so I feel I Is it feel too a late to bit, change? Can we change? I feel or? a bit robbed. And I also backed him before I knew that Heroic was playing with a full five. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I do feel a little bit robbed here. But, I, I, you know, I've, I've been saying it, I've been saying it. Uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of potential here for Heroic to drop one game. I'm not saying mm. they're going to go on a losing streak. I'm not saying they're going to lose the whole league. But... They are, they, there's potential for them to drop a game. We've seen it happen before. I've been around for too many of these leagues where we've had world-beating teams that have dropped a game at some point in the season. It happens, doesn't it? I mean, we talk about it all the time. Upsets, unpredictability. You expect mm. it all in these leagues. Um, so this could, be, this could be the moment. We will find out. Um, when it comes to head-to-head -to -head and two players that we're going to be looking at in specifics here, two standouts from both teams, Benja and Astra are our choices here, Chris. Yeah, I mean, it's, again, a little bit of fortunate that Astro isn't actually playing tonight. Um, but that's a player of a lot of experience behind them as well. Very, very competent. I think, you know, other higher tiers do historically over the last like six months have their eye on Astro for a good reason. A very capable player, of course, within this season so far, 1.34 KD and a 61% cost. That's, that's very good. But I don't think that's, again, a, a case of them showing their full potential just yet. Yeah, I think it's interesting that we bring up Astro here in, in regards to it, it gives us the uh, the chance to sort of reflect on what it means that he's not here tonight. I mean, it's it's look have a look what you could have won Ian. You know, yeah. you could have been playing tonight versus heroic with Astro, and now you're not. So this is the the standard. Is the, is this the standard that we're expecting Actor to to perform to? Does he need to be hitting a one point three KD? Does he need to be getting you know a positive KD and a sixty one percent cost? Um, we know that Astro plays on Iana. This is one of the the highlights and one of the headsets that we've got where the two players really do play a very similar role, and both have been very influential in the way that you know either team has sort of. Um, come away with results on the, on the day and stuff. So I think for me, the, the main thing to take away from that is, you, you know, we can put on the shelf that Benja's nuts. We don't really need to... I'm almost bored of saying it. He's crazy. Yeah. But we need Actor to step up here for Astro because it's big shoes to mm. fill. Fortunately, you fill in the shoes of a fragger. So it's not like you're going to fill the shoes of a support player. There's a choice, really, for how the team wants to try and uh, accommodate him into the team. Do they play their game and let him roam free, or do they try and give him a role and give him a job? Um, and obviously that will become apparent in the first few rounds as to how 86 want to approach that. But yeah, there's, there's a big gap here tonight in the lineup for 86. Chris, there, let's, I was going to say, um, after the veto is ready, but I was going to say, when, you, when there's pressure on you to, to fill big shoes... <laughs> Um, it can go one of two ways, right? It can be immense pressure to get the job done, or it's like, well, no one's maybe expecting me to play as well as Astro, so I can go out there and have a little bit of fun. It can go one of hmm. one of both ways, right? One hundred percent. And it's like I say, I don't know if this is like a last minute sub. I'm going to assume it's not. Um, and I think that it's this idea of you know, actor going into this should know the strategies that Viperio have prepared. You know, he should know the way that they want to play and he should know the role and the um, tasks that are given to him 
in order to play tonight and i think that um again maybe there is a slight bit of that pressure coming off you where you're like well maybe people aren't expecting us to win Mm -hmm. and i'm just gonna you know do my best then you end up popping off and it's gonna surprise everyone and at the same time again the pressure sometimes to suddenly come in and it's like your npl debut so to speak and you're kind of getting a little bit rocky about that um that could also happen as well well where is it going to be played out let's find out it's time for our matt vetoes um ollie we are going to chalet this time around chalet okay so we've got villaban cafe bank coming off the rip makes a lot of sense you don't really want to take viperio to a villa border getting removed there as well Okay, so we're seeing, you know, a fairly staple map for both these two teams. Obviously, in the back of your mind, you've always got to be thinking, what a heroic banning. You know, it's, I find it very interesting there that they've banned a skyscraper. Um, only really looking toward the major and what they might do there with it, to be honest with you. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I think that that's going to be a map that we're going to see at Charlotte quite a bit. Um, Oregon there getting removed as well. Very default map. Theme park as well gone. You see these new maps, they're going to be coming out in the next couple of weeks and it's going to be exciting. But for tonight, at least, we are headed to a chalet. Um, it's going to be heroic starting and they're off on the attack. Obviously, they get the choice there by Imperial taking Clubhouse out of the picture. I like the map, Ian. I think it's a great map for both teams. Chris, what do you think before I th- quickly throw across? I think it's a really good pick, certainly for the side of Heroic. Obviously, starting on that attack, as we often say, it can be attacker-sided if you are a good team that can play that attack well. Of course, Heroic are going to play it well. So, I mean, let's see how it goes, Ian, to be honest. Yep, it is time to find out. This should be very good. Heroic versus 86 with Whippet and Fresh. Let's have it. Thank you very much, Mr. Ian Chambers. And now... Ollie was going to change his predictions, with it, And I believe you've also predicted Vipero 86. So if you could, would you change your prediction? Ooh, that's a difficult question. So again, same situation. I didn't know Heroic were going to have that full roster. And I didn't know Vipero were going to have a sub. But I'm going to stick it out. I have faith that we're going to have that upset potential. I really do think that there is that loss in Heroic. Mm-hmm. Again, as Ollie. I, this is the same point as Ollie. But I think Vipero, even with that sub, as we said, it's in that more fragging role. Not IGL or support. There's a chance. There's always that chance. So I'm here to perhaps, you know, perhaps see it happen. So... Let's go back six days. Heroic played against Ten Star, and they should have lost, but for Benja turning up and dropping 20 plus kills. Um, they played that day without their full five. And what I'm reading from the fact that uh, I'm reading into the situation that they're now playing with their full five for two reasons. One, they don't want to lose because they were given a scare against a decent team. By period 86, are also a decent team. So I think from here on out, when they're against who they feel are decent teams, 10 star, Viperio, um, Ambush amongst others, they will play a full five. But also, in six days' time, which is, you know, six days, not long, they will be in America, at Charlotte, in the major, having played, you know, in group stages around about this time, in six days' time. So they want to be playing as full strength as possible whilst not giving anything away. So it creates a really... I want, I'm going to say that cliche, cliche word. It creates a really interesting scenario where... They want to win. They don't want to lose inside of NPL, um, but they also don't want to show anything at all to any of the Charlotte major teams that might be watching this. That that's the thing that Heroic find themselves in this very tricky position. They want to do well. It's clear they are a hyper competitive team. It's what driven. It's what has driven them to the level that they're currently playing at. They don't want to show a thing though, so they're gonna to have to rely on basic strats, the default that you'd see in ranked, and likely just. You know, is Benji going to be able to find all five yep. kills every single time? And Benji is very capable of that one. It's There's a reason why people on the desk are getting sick of saying Benji is cracked <laughs> because he is one of the best talents to get picked up in a very, very long time. Yeah. Unfortunate. Yeah. Uh, rehearsed. Um, yeah. Um, I mean, especially with that as well. And I think the map choice for me, when, when I talk about interesting... Um, one of the map, the, the interesting things for me was the map choice. So, quote unquote, in a normal scenario for um, heroic, Chalet is like their eighth or ninth preference map. Generally, inside of UL, they've not liked going to it. They've generally, in best of ones, they've gone to it. If they've had to against teams that they feel that they can beat on it. 
Um, so I think that's why they've tried to get a chalet out of the map bans is player map we've already shown inside of a UL. Player map we're very likely to ban away at the major anyway. That means we can focus on winning. Because obviously winning momentum is good as well. Full five. I kind of I think it's the right decision for them because I know that when they were under their previous organization, Kavana, you know, inside of Yukin Summer last season, they did play with their coaches. You know, Mr. Officer played a lot, Radio played a lot. Um and it really disrupted them. They didn't, you know, for me, winning's a habit, right? If you're winning inside of Yukin or NPL, um, it's only good. If you can get slapped by a teammate, you know, Viperio 86, right before going to the major, as much as you can say, oh, yeah, it's only NPL, it's still never a good sign. Yeah, it's, you always want to be in the most positive mindset and winning for these teams, you said, is a habit. They always want to be on it. The reason why they're competitive players in the, in the first sense is they want to win. They want to be the best. And while, you know, compared to Charlotte, this is you know reasonably small fries. They do not want to drop maps. They do not want to have that playing against them. Mm -hmm. They are fully set on winning this. Hence, the, the full lineup getting brought out, as you said, perhaps a little bit of a scare against 10 stars. That was a very shaky match. That, that should have been 10 stars victory, realistically. Yeah, it really should have been. And it's worth saying, again, obviously we're focusing on Heroic whilst this kind of um, rehost does come in. But they're also playing all together in the same room from a boot camp, which, you know, more often than not is a very good thing. Obviously, they'll be playing all together at LAN next week. Um, so they're all in the same room. They've most likely had complete focus on the major. I, I would be very surprised if they've done anything other than kind of double scrims whilst they're at boot camp. So this is kind of just an extra. In in a way, it's kind of in the way for them. Um, but, you know, they're still treating it with the respect it deserves, like we say, playing the full five. And I'm sure they'll try and put on a performance. Um, coming through to Viperio 86, however. So they, they're playing with a sub. Um, obviously, Astro's not playing. That significantly reduces them. Um, and I've been sold, told that their sub is actually a support player kind of by, by trade, by quote-unquote trade as well. So it feels like the, the roles don't really fit in terms of the sub coming in as well. So they're really up against it today. Yeah, they, they've lost that firepower. And again, actor again might be able to find something magic. It could be that, you know, step up to the plate, here's your big moment opportunity. But on paper, it's not going to be an easy time. But for 86, you got to think about this. Everyone looks at Heroic right now with their current standings in the UL and says, that's a target. I want to beat them or have a really good showing. Mm -hmm. 86, no difference. Whether they're playing with a sub or not, for the organization, for the players, a good showing, not even a win, but just like taking them over time or just being competent in the way they go on about their business here is massive for them. So 86 really will be giving it their all, sub or not. Yeah, and it, it's one of the things. I know the 10-star boys, obviously upset. They were upset to lose to Heroic last week. There's no doubt about it because they should have won. However, they know that there will be very few points that Heroic give away. So to the fact that they picked up one point against Heroic, you know, they were very positive about that despite the fact. Anyway, going into this, and we're getting Shelley as a map. We've got a Nook ban, a Valkyrie ban, a Thatcher Mira. Nothing too out of the ordinary, maybe apart from the Nook ban, to be honest. I don't know if it's a specific target or they just... Maybe Heroic not wanting to show banning strategy, allowing themselves to play with as much open as they possibly can. And it looks like they're actually going to go for a rush through this breach. All yep. five players, who knows, walked in, gone into connector, <laughs> got himself a kill. The plant's going off in the smoke. Where's the players on site? There are no players. Kelly's getting a smoke down, but the plant will go down. Grizzly does take some damage, and just like that, it's a 5v4. Uno's also in blue now, <laughs> like the way Fairmite <laughs> shotguns Actor to the face, and that's a 5v2. Groovy and Curly, all to do. Curly's going to go down the main stairs. Groovy's going to take a kill inside of games, but at this point, it's a complete moot point. That is Benja going down as Uno. He, he's in a smoke canister, he's got a shield, and he's got the shotgun all on Groovy as Sloth picks up the, the fourth kill. And Groovy's got to try and find engagements. Finds one onto Uno, who's always winning that against a shotgun. Won't find the second onto Sloth. 11 seconds are gone. This will be Heroic's round, and Grubby has managed to find three on the exit so far. Won't get the fourth. It's got a go and finishes it off. And what was that? I'm seeing a Fermite rushing through a breach. I'm seeing a Monty plant, and that will be the round. Um, that's, I think, a pretty good statement piece to how Heroic might be playing this one.
When you look at the setup, though, of Indy 6, and this is going to be my one justification for a, such an aggressive rush, Indy 6 set themselves up for a very multi-layered room up on the middle floor. We saw rotates in ball, we saw an extension in the kitchen dining, leaving very few bodies on site. Very heroic picked up on that, or it was their intention all along. Uh, I'm going to say they picked up on it in the drone phrase, and they decided, yeah, let's just rush. Interesting yeah. choice for Uno on the shotgun, but always I see a bit of variety, I suppose. Now, I've not seen a great deal of heroic um, inside of this competition. Obviously, I've seen a lot of them inside of EU well. Um, and the one thing that they are probably best in class at, in terms of the EU well teams, in terms of the European teams, they are best in class at their drone network. I, I don't know how they do it, but they get their drones in kind of, it's almost like zones for them. Is they, they get these drones in sync with each other, and I'm not saying this is necessarily in this specific round, as Medics is going to kind of counter my point by highlighting them. But a lot of the time, they get very fast entry into the building that they know is clear because their drone network is excellent. And I think it's exactly what you said. They saw that there was an elaborate roam going on above, saw there was one guy in sight, and they've therefore just rushed the breach and got the round. And they play off the back of it so well. Somewhat of a stark contrast to what we saw in the previous game with Arctic, who lacked information the entire time. Heroic's just, as you said, so spot on with that drone network, really going to cause some problems. And you got to think they have the mute, the mute on the board at least, that's going to be Noodle. If you're not using that for direct denial, that's going to be nice to choke out some of that information. Of course, it doesn't look like he's going to be playing as intricate of a drone setup. Sloth's going to find the first encounter just outside the kitchen. Very tentative fight so far. Don't want to risk it. Not going to get too over-aggressive after Vitaline, but both are going to fall back and just sit tight for the time being. Grubby now down inside the main lobby. Sends that impact to try and create a long line of sight. That might just invite Sloth to take a peek, however, so you don't think you really want to anger the beast too much. Two minutes left in this round, and Noodle pulling with getting aggressive with the shotgun on top of Solar Stairs, but... Nothing arriving just yet, and Grubby might be able to find that Ash, but I think Sloth's just going to fall back and worry about Solar Stairs. That shotgun might just be waiting. He's going to get aggressive anyway. Well, Noodle's going to take a lot of damage and win it out anyway. Second peak works out. Sloth first to fall, but that fireball's going to burn Noodle. He'll just escape, but he's very pinned by this LMG upside down repelling. Wow, he is quite literally in a, between a rock, a hard place, and a capital ball. There's literally nowhere he can move, otherwise he is dead. If Uno realized that, I don't think he's got another one, but he could have sent it. There's nades. He's going to be essentially the complete focus of Heroic right now. It doesn't look like any of his teammates are coming to help him either, which is a, a little bit unfortunate for Noodle. He's going to probably get naded out as the ADS does zap him. And Heroic, they're actually, you know, this is clockwork for them usually, but they're finding it a very difficult time to clear Solar Stairs. In the end, they're probably going to give up on it. I think as Gorgona, he's going to look for something from bathroom window, try and make something happen. He's going to jump in, will chip some chip damage, will end up vaulting on towards Noodle as Kelly has him covered. Grizzly goes down on the big window, and it's all left up to Uno on the upside down repel, wondering how he didn't fry his man with those Capitawa asphyxiation bolts. I mean, that all comes down to, to Noodle, just being able to find that one pick and staying alive, being persistent and just opting to be too angry to die and just holding his position. He's going to stay alive and ultimately heroic now. It's Uno against five. He's upside down repelled right now. If he does anything, they'll hear it and he can react appropriately. So he's going to repel all up to the roof and take some time. Nope, he's going to go and try and look for something. Can't imagine they're going to use this as a tactical timeout, just given the circumstances of this matchup. He might just try for a bit of a highlight reel and well, there's someone on that hatch. Pop that open or shot food enough, you might be able to find something, but time's gonna burn out. Heroic, gotta get tied up here with 86. Yeah, there was definitely some information there known to Bruno, given how his focus was just on that hatch specifically. Vito's not gonna peek it, he's gonna be nice and disciplined. That was an echo drone outside. <laughs> um, okay then, and that'll be the round. Good round for 86. Um, obviously, they realized what was going on with the Silver Stairs. Noodle eventually getting the help that he needed in the form of Ito going downstairs to deal with the um, the Finker. But I think for Heroic, they'll be not too happy. Like They're not going to be too bothered but, because that's probably not how they would normally clear us over the stairs with Sloth just face-checking it. But they won't be too happy that they didn't kill Noodle. They'll, they'll be a bit disappointed at that specific attack. Yeah, you're, you kind of hit the nail on the head with that one. The fact that that, as you said, goes clockwork for them majority mm. of the time and against 86 something went wrong and whether it was the fact that Noodle was able to find that double peak of the shotgun that gets Sloth which would have been that pressure and Solar which likely would have meant Noodle very uncomfortable as that utility dump arrived that probably was the key there but as we move down to the basement once again we will see Heroic grab the Kali that's gonna be Uno and 
I have a feeling we're not going to see a rush again. Sneaky suspicion, but Grizzly is opting to go on to the Thermite, and then there's a Ying in play, so I think maybe a rush might be back on the main. Five-person repick. <laughs> <laughs> got a banner into Ying, Twitch into Thermite, Jackal into Kali, Finker into Jackal, and Ayana into Maverick. Um, yeah, I mean, it screams that you could play rush. I'm seeing smokes. I'm seeing four, six smokes, four candelas. A Kai, um, Kali to counter the Kaid for the breach. We could be talking rush again. Also, Maverick just for good measure as well. Um, it, oh, it could be a little bit more considered from heroic, given the fact that there's only two people out there. The Kaid clock, I think, will actually be above next to the yep. window, will it? Yeah, yes. That screen's a little bit pixelated, but there it is, yeah. yeah it yeah. will eventually go, and the breach will be opened after the third Kali attack. I mean, all utility for that wall open the Kali, I guess a fair enough trade is Grubby's gonna get caught by the Kali, left a deep you know up by Mez. Slot takes a lot of damage, I think an impact grenade arrived at that one. Well, I will crawl around and likely get picked up sooner rather than later. Hopefully no one's gonna vault in top laundry stairs, but Vital will find one. That's Sloth now, and he's on the roam inside the kitchen, looking to disrupt anyone trying to attempt to play inside a lobby. The Kali is close by, but I think he's gonna drop on down. Once again, a very extended roam presence from 86, and they're trying to hold on, but Benjamin might start breaking that one down. He finds the opening, Grubby's fallen. He was indeed, you know, only 20 HP. Curly will fire back, Grizzly's slain. Advantage though, four versus three in favor of 86. Yeah, not too bad for 86 there, managing to get those kills. Vito particularly important, and who knows, just gonna Kali himself in and try and do some that. I don't know if the, he's, uh, he, he knows there's probably somebody in dining, given the roam setup that 86 have had going. The hatch would be open, somebody would be in proximity to dining. Actor, he's hearing all these Kali shots go off, he does walk up the stairs and get a freebie onto Uno. That's a 4v2. If anybody can... The two best players for Heroic in this EUL season, I'm not talking specifically NPL, but in EUL, have been Gorgona and Benja. These two players are talented as hell, so they absolutely can pull this 2v4 off. But they've not got much map control, they have a breach open, not much else. Yeah, so it's basically going to be who can click heads the hardest, and well, Benja's pretty good at that one. I have seen some heroic performances for Benja during his development in the grassroots scene, and I mean, this would be very fun to see if we can find something magical here. Scandella is tossed on in, the bridge is open, so we can play around with that idea. Likely going to know someone's out by this display cabinet, that's going to be actor to sub, of course. 40 seconds, and they're just all biding their time. Execution's going to arrive without smoke cloud or plume. That might be the cue to try and get aggressive. After tries to swing, takes a lot of damage. Smoke canister meets that. Benja creeps his way in. 30 seconds. He's going to look for the Albi. Close, but no! A wide swing actor finds it, leaving it. He'll go to win a one versus four. 20 seconds, and an LMG at his hip. But I think the 86 have biked themselves a second round against Heroic. Yeah, I think so too. It's going to go He's going to try and bait out the picks the same way Uno did in the second round. Possibly gets himself an, himself an exit frag if somebody peeks from blue, from connector, from the, the open hall, as you see in Wine Cellar. Doesn't look like anybody's gonna do it. No, and that will be the end of the round, as he still has a Yin Candela in hand as well. And I think, at what point do Heroic start pulling out the strap book? At what point do you say, boys, we're playing with our full five. We know we need a win here. Let's just get it. I would say he's might be one the... too, er, too early. I don't know. Maybe we'll see like five rounds in. I think that might be the moment. Right? Like, All right. This is if it doesn't go their way, that when we might see a little bit more of the strap book getting for. But nothing bleeding, bleeding edge. Of course, it's going to be the basics. I think very basic yeah, stuff. Yeah. We should probably I'll always practice heroic. Are going to be saving a lot of strategy for Charlotte. Six days until group stages begin, and they are in great form. They want to have a massive impact at an international land event. But 86 could spoil that momentum for the time being. In terms of uh, that winning form, as they lead, it's only one round here on Chalet, and, and they continue that. Yep, and we're seeing that same solar side set coming out. We're seeing the two Aruni gates on the Sol Solarian windows. The two ADSs, and Noodle is presumably also going to be playing those stairs once again. Site this time, Kitchen Dining. Um, not, you know, not too bad a site to defend. Normally teams try and take it from above and then work vertically. Given the way Eroica are playing, I'm not sure exactly what I'm expecting to come out of them. As you know, a couple have spawned in each of the spawns, so we don't exactly know what the attack is coming out so far. What we do know is they're going to a much more conventional lineup if you look at it. 
Um, we're seeing Ayana, Finca, Ace, Sophie, and Nomad. That's pretty much the most chalet lineup you can get out of a team, to be honest. So I think they're going to perhaps start bringing just a little bit more convention in terms of lineup, at least. Lots of damage done to Akta already. That was from the drone pull down in Trophy. You don't want to reveal your ankles of that for too long, otherwise you might just lose them. Good start in terms of HP. No Thunderbird on the board, so they can't top that HP up. Benji is on the Pinkus, so if anyone does take some early damage in the Brawl, but they haven't spotted out Vido. The drone will go out, but at his feet, he's going to pounce and find one. That's Grizzly slain. That's your Zafia. That's that LMG and that vertical presence that was trying to get set up. C4 lobbed. Will it find one? No. Doesn't even find a single point of damage, but opening pick for 86. Good start so far, but Benji will find that traded back. Yeah, Benji, the, so the very last game of EUL, Heroic played on this map against Rogue. And Benja on that particular balcony absolutely destroyed people. The nade will come in this time. The burn is actually taken. Sloth will get a kill. And that is Solarium Stairs. That is how Heroic will clear it. And that's how you should clear it if you're a team. That Solarium Stairs control and the Solarium attack can start coming out. Benja still playing the balcony. I don't think anybody will peek him. Rogue tried it about 17 times and died in every single one of them when they went up against Benja. Because as we say a lot of the time, he is just that good. Right. Vito might have a try. Ben just sniffs his footsteps. Might get him if he decides to peek. Vito, I think, has no idea. Absolutely no idea Ben is there. Both of them just cross paths, but no one aware of each other. Benja's on the hunt, though. He knows. He can just sense that someone's nearby. A window will get punched. Vito is going to hear that one. But I don't think he even wants to contest, knowing it might be Benja mm. lurking on that balcony. All set up for an execution, but Heroic once again just taking their time. Sloth will find one, though. Actor, and this is going to weaken 86 now to a 4 versus 2. The toxic calendars can burn away some time, but it doesn't matter for Uno. He's going to charge on in. That's going to get Curly, leaving it all down to Vanaline. You know what? One versus four. The plants will go down and the hunt happens upstairs. Gregano will be able to find one as that air jab will alert everyone to his position. And this Jaeger is living on borrowed time and it doesn't last too long. The loan expires. Gregano gets that final kick, kill and heroic tie us up two rounds apiece. And what was a far more conventional round? And when they brought that convention, 86 just really didn't have an answer to it. Yeah, round four, definitely the turning point where heroic have decided, let's just play properly and get this one out of the way. It's as simple as that. Um, as you say, much more conventional attack, much more conventional lineup, and that'll be the round. And that's what I will expect out of Heroic now. I don't think we'll see them having, you know, too much freedom, too much fun, until they, you know, have got this game in the bag, to be honest. Yeah, I think that's a safe... Mentality is a massive thing, so to come out here and just win this with the events that they have later in their calendar this month... This is probably the right call. 86, though. Still that, that puncher's chance to cause some damage, and they're a good side. Yes, they have a sub, but we see that they can you know, disrupt the flow of Heroic, and they can certainly win gunfights if they could just maybe get Benja out early. That would be a nice benefit to them as well. <laughs> I mean, Benja's I mean, only got two kills so far. It, it sounds simple in theory, right? Yeah, just <laughs> kill Benja forehead, and you'll win. <laughs> <laughs> Much harder in practice when he's peeking you. Yeah, I think so, too. I think so. Um, we're going back to the upstairs site, and we've got the usual kind of suspects coming out. We're seeing the 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 Aruni, the Jaeger, the Awamai. We're probably going to see the same kind of Solarium stairs coming out. And then also a hold over to the office side. Uh, not to the office side, to the library side as well. Heroic looks like they're going to set up for a Solarium side attack once again. And I think we will just see really default things from here. The Solarium side attack coming in. Gorgona is going to be draining out Trophy. Bender and Sloth are going to look to try and get in. As a nade is coming out early, do they know somebody's bottom west main stairs? Not too sure on that nade, but we have the the kind of highlight of, you know, seeing silhouettes. So, maybe he heard something, maybe there was some information. Vito was playing down there the, first, uh, the previous round, so, you know, maybe it's kind of half informed. I mean, at least perhaps it could just be something that they've experienced before in scrims or other lives. And just vaulting in, throwing that nade keeps you concealed at least and blocks the sound, gets that free pick if there is someone there. Noodle once again on the solar stairs. And as the burn comes out, he's not going to have a very good time. That nade will land perfectly. We do see one falling. That will be Sloth. And it's a one for one trade at least. But you've cleared solar stairs. You've given Uno direct access to the site to start chewing open that wall. And down below, we'll see Benja priming it up nade. No one's going to be in his proximity. No damage done. But now that threat's there. Yeah, Acta definitely heard it from below as we've unfortunately got a bit of a visual glitch going on. Uh, Vito has up downed one on the <laughs> worst main stairs, but he downed a Finca who has managed to pick herself back up as Gorgona runs in and gets the... Uh, sorry, as, yeah, I think it was Gorgona ran in and got the kill as well. 
And it's a 2v3. Realistically, Kylie and Acta, they've got it all to do here because full sight control is going to be in the hands of Heroic as soon as they have droned this out. I think there's Acta playing behind the bomb chassis and Benjen knows that there's one in Piano. Has potentially heard him rotate and will be looking to take this peek when he can. The finger boost comes in. Does he know? I hear that finger boost. <laughs> You'll hear that finger boost outside oh, the balcony, and Bench is just waiting. He's just holding on, trying to find the perfect moment to peak. Just so patient right now, as the plant's going to go down. When he crosses, Bench still hasn't cracked crack this. Eventually, he will do so. Plant goes down. Cover was unconventional. Gargano will get one of his own, and he will find the second. Close out the round. Heroic. Why did it, what was... It looked in the middle stage that it could get to a scrappy round. Unfortunately, it didn't work out that way. Heroic just too composed, too collected, and that pressure, that threat that could have arrived when Benji went down. Of course, he's a thinker, he could have got himself up, kind of made null and void pretty quickly. So, I had a bit of a heads gone moment in that round. <laughs> um, and the reason being is obviously there was a couple of visual glitches coming in. Um, and I thought we had the visual glitch where, you know, like when you disconnect from a ranked game and you load back in. And then suddenly you see the panels of windows and doors, but they're not actually there in the game. Yeah. I thought for some reason we had that. I thought that window was open for Benja. So it I. turns out he was just stood looking at a, a closed window. I think he was listening for the footsteps to then shoot him in the back, which smart mechanic, obviously, right? Is that yeah. you listen for the footsteps, then you open the window and get the kill because they're just not expecting you there. <laughs> but yeah, no, my absolute head's gone moment for me. As we see Viperio, they have taken a pause, they have taken the time out to have a speak about this. Because it was looking good at 2 1, but you know, they were looking for at least a free free half. Now they'll be lucky if they get a free free half. So it really this you know, this map really has turned on its head for them. It has. I mean, this is I think a, a good lesson to large just there are levels to this right now. Heroic flipped the switch in round three. And they've kind of brought that heat and tempo, not the strategies, but the way they play that mentality, straight back in. And they're playing far better than those opening two rounds. They're not rushing, they're not you know, taking it so lightheartedly. And that's going to cause problems now for 86 because they're going to really feel the wrath of a team who are flying for in the UL right now. Just want a quick word on Acta, because like I, I, I was told that he was more of a support-minded player. So... You know, they might come out after and say, that's complete codswallop, right? They might say, nah, nah, he's fine, he can play frag. Um, but I was told he was quite a supportive type player. Um, but it looks like he is playing exactly in Astro's roles on... He's played a bit of Malusi, playing a bit of Alibi right now. So he's kind of slotting into the system. The system isn't changing because he's in there. Holding up his own, though, to be fair, a free and free, which, you know, isn't absolutely the world given the roles that he's been playing on. So, you know, props to him. Um, it's been pretty hard for 86 because Heroic, after the first couple of rounds, they stopped making mistakes. Um, realistically, there's not been very many mistakes and they've just, it's been so hard to find kills for 86. Yeah, I mean, Heroic aren't going to give anything for free and if 86 get that opening pick, you can be very certain that there's going to be someone very, is this wall? Soft, I love it. Yeah, because <laughs> if you think about it, all Heroic have done is walk up to that wall and Fermite charge it, right? So if they're not bringing breaching charges and they're not bringing a sledge, how are they going to physically open this wall apart from putting shooting holes in it? Gorgona can't do it. He's playing Ying. Grizzly can't do it. He's playing Twitch. Uno can do it, but you can shoot the Fermite charge off. Benja can't do it because he's playing Finca and Sloth's on the Amaru. This is turned out to be the, the, the wall physically cannot be opened. Play. Yeah, it's it's a great idea. I when, love it. Uh, I love it. Yeah, me too. I love I love the outside of the box thinking. And that's get that's a massive insight to just 86's thought process. They know okay, there's been no sledge, there's been no soft breach utility. Let's just leave this wall open because Thermite's not gonna have an easy time. We will see though Uno gets very aggressive and he's deep inside of sight. There goes Noodle and there goes Grubby. It's Sloth who finds a second and it's a five versus two. Actor will try and get one back and they'll do so and, ooh, very narrowly, but doesn't last long as Uno hears the dinner bells ring. And very, very quickly, heroic found an execution. And I think if you force if you force heroic to play conventionally, you'll get beaten. So I love the soft wall idea. It's great. It's um you realise they've not got any soft reach whatsoever, therefore you make them change their approach. But you're making them change their approach into a conventional approach of going open the boiler wall, go and open, you know, and, and obviously the flooded site. 
round one. And that's 4-2 for Heroic. Um, we're just in a very quick technical rehouse. We're going to sort out that visual glitch that we saw going on uh, just to keep everyone informed and then we'll be straight back into the game. But 4-2 for Heroic, they'll be happy with that because it was looking a little bit nervy at the start when they were trying to you know, mess about and play some different operators and have some fun. It was kind of going down that 10-star route of, oh, we could actually lose this. Put the brakes on it. Let's play properly and just get this win done. It's really good to see that they have that ability to generally just flip a switch and they are instantly at that heightened level. There was no round of trying a serious lineup and still not quite being there. It was instantly. They were on form and making far better snap decisions, a far better lineup, and a far better solution to what 86 were presenting. And that round, perfect to heroic. All right, our main plan's not working. Let's just do a conventional back take from a boiler, send mm -hmm. Uno win. Uno goes in, Uno gets kills, Uno wins round. And it, that's exactly how to play it out. Yeah. Yeah, and I think for 86, they've got a... That's where their opportunity is, right? Is when you head up into that non-conventional aspect of... I think even once that... Obviously, they've got a bit of a pause now because there's a rehost ongoing. Obviously, coaches aren't allowed to speak to them, but they will be able to speak to each other. Um, So they've got to start thinking about... Now they're on the attack about dictating the pace and how they do that, how they force Heroic outside of that conventional siege. Because if they just play out the conventional siege now... I have no reason to doubt that Heroic will just beat them quite comfortably. Um, so it's all about, you know, trying something new, trying a little bit different, trying to play on Heroic, trying to bait them in. You know, Heroic, they like to play fun in this competition. We've seen it from them. They, they like to have a bit of fun. They use the subs. It's kind of a, a more chilled out vibe for them because obviously, as we say, they're competing in EUL, they're competing for majors, all that sort of stuff. Um, but... If you can lure them into that, that does present opportunity where they're outside of those kind of rigid structures and strategies and, you know, synergies, I guess. Um, so that's what 86 will be talking about right now and really trying to, you know, hammer home about that's their win condition and how they can win this game. I mean, and the easiest way to try and do that, that more disruptive style of play, is with heightened aggression for 86. But when you're against a team like Krok that has Benja, if you go and have to peek that, that aggression can get slapped down pretty quickly, and it becomes a problem. 86 are looking at a very difficult-to-solve puzzle. This is yeah. a massive learning experience for them. Win, lose, overtime or not, this is a great opportunity for them to, in an official, try to solve problems on the back foot against a team that kind of has them kind of outgunned right now, and I love 86, but again, top of EUL Heroic for a reason, and it's a joy to watch them playing in that heightened state right now, and seeing them just flip that switch, really showing the levels right now. 86 are on 15 points, and yeah. they're on plus 10 round difference, and it's worth noting that the tie break is round difference, not direct head to head. Therefore, the difference even between a 7-2 loss and a 7-4 loss could be the make or break of you know, potentially a place, potentially whatever. Um, so it, it feels weird saying it now because we're not even halfway through the season. But quite literally, every single round counts. You know, Ambush are going to be coming at them strong. We saw how, how deadly Ambush looked. 10 star we see next. 10 star, if they get a direct win, 10 star are going to be snapping on the heels. So for 86, even if you're not going to win this game, because it's not looking very likely because Heroic are just that good. They are just a different gravy. They're a different class above. Make sure you get as many rounds as possible because come the end of the season, you might well need them. Yeah, it's going to very much become that damage limitation as you say. Do, do not bleed too much round differential. Try and keep it as close as possible because you say, when we get to the real business end, that second split of this season, it's going to get very tight between some of these teams, especially in the midfield. We look at how the difference between m and Academy and 10-star before m and game earlier today, there was one point separating those teams, and they're very equally matched when they go head-to-head, -head. so it is going to be nip and tuck in the middle of this table when we get to the real business end of the season. Yeah, it definitely is. Um, I, I don't think we're too long away from going back in, so thank you for obviously bearing with us. Um, first half, it's 4-2 to Heroic, so... You know, it's it's not looking great for 86, is it? Let, let's be honest. We can we can talk about round difference and how important it is, um, but it it's not looking too great for them. They're gonna really have to dig deep if they're gonna find absolutely anything. And as I say that, we are back in. We're seeing heroic. They're gonna come out with a basement strat. We saw it a couple of times from Viperio, and we're seeing it now from heroic. I don't think we're gonna see quite an elaborate first round rush coming in from Viperio 86 as we did see heroic. 
Um, but I think in terms of picking them apart, this is a good round for eight, a good site for 86 to be going to, is that there will be opportunities for them to do a full clear and get 2v1, 3v1 engagements on certain members of Heroic. Yeah, and this is going to likely be an extensive drone presence once again. A good drone set up there by Grubby, just locking down the hallway outside of Trophy. As for all, just to send those players upstairs. And a thorn in play, not very commonly seen in mm. competitive play. And I think for very valid reasons. I think, essentially, a shield is the highest bit of utility she brings. And it can only be just slightly annoying. Those things are so... Drop down. Was the mute. I thought he was going to go for like a little bit more heroic and sloth, but no, he's just going to rotate back to site, tears down that castle barrier, and maybe, Hello? maybe he's rethinking that. <laughs> what is going through sloth's mind right now? Gorgona, why have you locked me out of sight? As that actor actually gets the first kill onto Uno, and sloth's going to see for the garage wall and look for a peek onto act. What? No, tell me, tell me actor heard that. Just tell me actor heard that C4 go off right next to him. So he's probably just going to rip down the castle barricade, to be honest, and then make his way back to site, which is what we'll go on now. Gorgona is going to look for a peek back onto Actor, a very late trade. He knows that he's just been droned, shot the drone, but has that 1.5, of course, on castle. Even if the gun's not great, he does have a range scope on it. He just sees a single pick slot of place. He might be able to find it, but he's somewhat locked in right now. He has rotations up, but he doesn't want to give up West Main for free. And, well, Sloth is going to get aggressive, push on up, but he's not going to get the kill as Vida will find one to Gargano. And now, three versus five. Vyperia Vy 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 6, a far better start to this round. Now on the offensive side of Chalet. And this massive roam from Heroic, well, it's going to start falling apart as no one's in a great position to directly defend the site. Now, Sloth finally gets there. Benj is regrouped eventually, but... That's going to leave their 2 versus 5 on the site if they opt to Flood, and that might be a very valid option right now. And that's the exact point I was making, was specifically that you can identify, you know, 2v1, 3v1 engagements and get kills on people not looking at you. Gorgona was looking towards Actor on the, you know, you know on the far side, um, on the West Main side, and then get shot in the back by the Twitch. So it's kind of like this site particularly is very good for what 86 try to accomplish as a win condition. Now they're going direct to site. They potentially will try and get control of the dining room as well, so that the hatch can't be played. Um, and look to, again, identify those engagements of 2v1, 3v1. Pearly finds one onto Sloth, and it's all on Benja and Grizzly to hold out a 2v5. Grubby walks in and gets both of them, both of the headshots, the teabags after. First kill here, coming out onto the bins, through the bins in fact, and then one onto the main stairs. And that'll be the round for 86. I didn't even know those bins were bulletproof, or, well, or not bulletproof. You could just about, it's like a massive damage reduction when you shoot through them, and it feels like your bullets kind of go wherever they want when you shoot through. But not only a round victory for 86, gets them within one round of Rook, a flawless round, a perfect example of finding the win conditions, and those 2v1 fights where they had the advantage on that full clear, they took full advantage of it, and they got themselves that round very well played, and I think showing a little bit more restraint, they weren't overly aggressive, and they kind of played with them at early man advantage, and they really work with it not getting instantly traded off and massive improvement to what we previously saw from 86. I think heroic are, uh, it's a wise decision from them so for if I'm heroic and again they can probably win this game just on playing gunfights alone they will lose rounds but I think they'll probably win this game on that however I would be trying to play as much of dining kitchen and bar gaming as humanly possible because when you play those sites you present problems that teams have to solve with in terms of utility in terms of taking gunfights where there's refragability of heroic if they're defending this top floor on kitchen dining they can defend it as two free people and preside, present a kind of united front that 86 have to force their way through and that's where heroic will have success because ultimately the team play the coordination and the individual players are better than 86's however when you get these 1v1 engagements it becomes more of a 50 50 as benja tries to run out of spawn beak and does get punished and this is the type of thing, if 86 are going to have success, it's in those kind of kills. Punishing Benja on those um, punishing Benja on those solo plays. Punishing all solo plays, and then also punishing the bad site choices. And also in play from Actor, making sure they're safe on that repel. And will places become a bit of a sentinel, but not in the 
the most ideal position. So exposed to Grizzly as they find that. But with any 6 having that opening pick, this is huge for them. That they can kind of play for trades now. And they have that safety blanket at least. A late reinforcement going down. But pressure on that bathroom window is going to keep Grizzly occupied for a very long time. As you know, we'll get us back to level playing field. As Grizzly will now find the advantage for Heroa. Because any 6 let that early advantage slip just quickly between their fingertips. Yeah, that's really unfortunate for 86 that they've lost two 1v1 engagements there. Three 1v1 engagements, actually, as uh, Grubby then does finally find one back onto Uno. It's a 2v3 with basically no map control. And this is what I'm saying about those strategic kind of sites that you make 86 have that problem of you've got to clear us with utility and a united front and breaching and all that great stuff. That's where 86 are going to fall apart because they're going to look for those 1v1 engagements. And essentially, that's what Heroic will win. Grubby's going to drone up from below, knows that there's verticality, has seen the cam as well. He's got a hard task, but he might be able to find some success if he can walk himself up the west main stairs. Will be a very heavily contested. Look, just getting good solid drone information though for 86 right now. They're spotting out the active threat. They have a, a yellow ping. It's not quite accurate on the position. We're going to very cautious. These bullets just whizzing past his head. A uh, soft wall surrounding him completely vertically. Still held by heroic, however. And we now we enter that critical stage. Less than a minute to work with a perfect opening, but no, not cooked to perfection. And soft is able to just escape as it bounces off those rafter beams. Going now down below. Sees the verticality just above that hatch, and a very nasty, very small angle held there. As they're trying to force their way to West Main, and this is not going to be easy task against the first of those three toxic canisters goes off. And I think Heroic are just going to ride out the clock and allow this to kind of be played on the advantage of two more, or one more player that they have. Yeah, once again, playing very disciplined, and Grubby and, um... Grubby and Kelly really haven't found much success. They're going to have to force a doorway right now. Gorgona's got a shield and the smoke canisters as well. With Sloth having the vertical, it's really not going to happen at all. Grubby gets taken out by Sloth as Kelly's to fight in the vertical. Sloth also takes out Kelly. A great end to the round there for Heroic, and I think they played very well, all things considered, just able to manipulate the power positions that they had that they just weren't moved out of whatsoever. Yeah, I mean, they weren't cleared. They were able to hold it, and they never really looked in danger of losing sight control. 86 were able to get those picks away from sight, but when they came to that final push, collapsing and compressing the defense, they just couldn't get that working because they didn't have the pressure upstairs. They weren't able to clear those positions, as you said, and without that, that site becomes a lot difficult to displace those power positions on the site as we go now to bar and games. Again, and I think that's what I'm saying for Heroic is get them in those power positions, get them on these two sites specifically, the Diner Kitchen and the Bar Games. It's no surprise. They're going to set up a very pretty conventional, almost ranked defense of the same kind of thing. The Frost is a very common pick here, as is the Alibi, the, the shields that you get on side from those two to play at the top of each oh, of the Blue Stairs and in Mezzanine. Obviously, the Frost maps for jumping into sight. It's all very conventional from Heroic. And that's all they need to do at this point is present those conventional problems for 86 and let them try and figure it out, especially playing with a sub. Yeah, you, you perfectly placed that one right there. I'm just kind of looking at Bench now a little bit far away, once again on that roaming smoke position. Since the re-host yet to really strike on the scoreboard, has been mm -hmm. a first pick twice now, I believe, in this matchup, which is not what you want from someone who can pull out the numbers as Benja has done in the past. It doesn't always need to find 20+, plus, but you'd like to see them being active on that more aggressive <laughs> winning those fights. I think with a player such as Benja, I think, especially in this kind of context, is you give him the freedom to do what he wants, and you accept that at times he's going to do this, where he will be the opening death two or three times. But then when you need somebody to walk down main stairs and get four kills because you've got no other option, He's the guy that probably will go and do it as well. So I don't think they'll be too bothered as a yellow ping's coming out. Really nice drone here from Grubby. Vito knows that there's a player right next to him, but also knows he can't act because there's a player playing mezzanine. We might see Kelly walk himself in the in the main door here and just take a very quick peek onto the frost onto Gorgona, who definitely would have to hit a flick if that happened. Cody will find the opening there. Sloth just peeks about Mezzanine. Just patience by that main door. No trade's going to arrive. We're going to just can't find it. As no one's going to present that sub or repel up to that balcony now. And oh, here's the glass break. But no one's going to be there. I think it was just glass breaking on its own it's volition. It's actually going to pass on it, yeah. Yeah. I think they just bashed it on their way past. Just to make that sound cue. 
Right, we're going to be trying to think about that nade, but trying to get the information before it happens. Curry's going to send one through that drone hole. Perfect throw, perfect bounce. Doesn't quite hit the mark. So we're going to get reactivated. It's going to cause a little bit more of a hassle, more utility to clear. But they're in a good position so far. Player advantage. Oh, sorry. 86 are in a good position. Player advantage. And they just hold on and find more as Benji takes a lot of damage. And he has to retreat further back in the meza. It's all about those power positions, though. And 86 is trying to almost cheese it again. Library's not cleared. Top blue's not cleared. Mezzanine's not cleared. Stock's not clear. And you would expect Heroic would eventually use those positions to just get those kills. Benja finds the first one. There is an Ayana clone going through bar. And Vito's going to try and find a free kill from it. He does, in the end, find Benja. As Grubby, on the other side of the map, finds Grizzly. And it's all that's Gorgona and Uno with it all to do. Two versus four, 40 seconds left to go. You know, bunkered up nicely, and Gargano will find one. That draws us very close to a winnable position. The case is very far away right now, outside of a Surya gate, so this might be a case of they have to get aggressive and fight for these kills. A, a grenade primed and ready. It's going to get sent on down, but Uno with an EMR will get that one. 86 now lose their advantage. Two versus two, and these Surya gates, this utility, is going to choke out this play. Uno's relocated, relocated around. Gargano's just going to sit tight and hold on, but the time's going to push every member of 86 to get aggressive and when you get aggressive you start losing and checking these positions lots of damage done early after we'll find one however gargano will get that trade the noodle leaving it in a one versus one but time will be the ultimate winner in this one as gargano goes running away to west main and finds the round for heroic and 86 got very close but ultimately that case being stuck outside that balcony as Surya gate blocking them off spelled disaster and it's the same old, same old, same old from 86 in that <sighs> you get the other kill. Cool. That's great. But then you've not cleared the map control. You've not cleared the man advantage and you're trying to cheese round wins. If you think about Uno, he got that kill in stock peeking up the hatch towards Grubby. Why isn't the sledge in library? Sledge in above. You can get complete verticals above the reinforcement in stock and then nade through there. Much safer. Um, and you go through your business to get the verticals, you clear the people out of bar, and you do that step-by-step -step approach to then try and plant the diffuser and win the round, especially when you're in whatever it was, a 4v2. However, Gorgona and Uno just able to get free engagements just from site, 1v1s, and they're going to win them out because ultimately, and I hate to say it, but they're the tier one players, right? And they are having, both of them, you know, great, great stages inside of a UL. Um, so I'm not liking this approach from Viperio 86 of, you know, just running around a little bit. Um, yeah. You know, when when they've when they've got such good advantages, especially as they had in that last round. That opening pick that he got on the mezzanine, though, well, that's good, good. You've got the player off the board. You haven't cleared a shield. You don't have control of that yourself. And, well, it's a freebie that you got. Didn't really gain a lot, bar for one less gun. And, again, against a team like Heroic, where their setups can be so advanced and difficult to break down, is that as big as a boon as it perhaps looks on paper? As That's a sneaky Frostmat. I wonder if that will catch anyone. We've already seen Frostmats be pivotal to clutch positions and situations so far. A gone six detonates. That normally sounds off a rush if it's already in the round, but ultimately not this time. The Solar Take looks to be on the mind for 86, as Uno will fall to the DMR from that line of Noodle. An unconventional pick of weapon and operator, but Sloth got to hold fast inside a kitchen, make those footholes, and might just post up and just wait for someone so daring to make an entry. Yep. Yeah. Um, and the this guy outside the trophy window, and once again, Benji's going to try and maybe get the refrag. As Noodle does actually pull a line scan, I wonder if it's because he knows there's a player there. <laughs> he certainly knows now as he sees a C4 flying through the window and luckily gets himself away. Benji's got himself back onto trophy stairs, onto the solar stairs, which is, as we know and as we have seen for the defenders, is a bit of a power position. And once again, it's 86 kind of just... I don't know what I call this strat. It's kind of just lurking to try and find... Kills as Benja finds one back on to Noodle and will get himself back up the solar stairs back towards site. That's the player advantage that E6 had now gone, and they've got no map control for the efforts they went through the A find that opening pick of what they've got. They're able to walk around these uncontested areas of site, but look at this sloth is just able to exist and sit. Well, yeah, they're down below, they can nade him, and finally they'll clear him. Not only does Actor find the shot, but the nade would have finished him off guaranteed. E6 now have that control and a far better position with the extra player. But they had to go through a lot of effort to do it and a lot of time wasted. I wonder what they're going for again with it. Because there's there's one player on Salem stairs, one kind of outside of West Main, one's on Blue stairs. Like, where's the breaching? Where's the identity? Where's the plant? What, what are they focusing on here? Because if they just go at different times, 
this once again is where Heroic will just take those 1v1 engagements and win those 1v1 engagements. You see him potentially Grizzly taking one onto Vito, Gorgona taking one onto Grubby. Um, I, I really do wonder what they're going for here and what their end goal is. Surely now it's going to be a rotation to the main breach. It looked like it was going to be a solar play, but no one's watching the door. And Gorgana will take that freebie <gasps> all day, every day. That's your hub on The vault in is there. And Vineline gets very aggressive. Grubby will fire one more. It's going to be an absolute flurry. And Mechanics might win this out after all. It's down to the bench in a one versus two. He'll hear that gone six, and he'll see the Yana finds damage. Not enough for DBNO or the elimination, but now Piano Shield is held and locked down by an LMG. Heroics will be needed, but a long rotation all the way around. He'll get spotted. He's going to deny the plant, and now it's all going to go awry, as he's just going to go running. No! He's going to go hunting! It will be a trade, but they will win on time, as the map acts as if no one was on it. And the defense get that victory, and GG's all around. Heroic takes Chalet. And the question marks came out from Sloth, and the question marks in my mind is what exactly is going on there, and why is the late round so poorly managed when you've got such an advantage on the side of Viperio 86? Ultimately, when you give Heroic so much map control, they're going to do what they want with it, um, as we see in the highlight package coming in here. Um, and I think, good game from Heroic. Obviously, they are a different gravy. They are a better class than 86 are. That's why we're seeing them go to the Charlotte Major as he used number one seed, of course. Um, but I can't help but feel that in a lot of those rounds, 86 really didn't help themselves whatsoever. Yeah, th this could have been a far closer affair, but 86 made it difficult for themselves. And a lot of the time was wasted effort on clears that could have been far more efficient or that weird lurking side, just waiting for kills to turn into controls and executions. While Heroic the entire time felt like well-oiled, well-rehearsed, as you'd expect from a tier one side, just when they were on it, just seemed too much for 86 to handle. Yeah, and I think Heroic, Job done. Obviously, they've got tomorrow, and as we say, only six days until we will see them at the major as well. So, to be fair, absolutely impressive stuff for them for even to still be, you know, playing and and showing respect to this competition. 86, they've got to brush themselves off because, you know, as much as everybody is expecting to lose to Heroic, that's a pretty poor loss on their part. Um, going up tomorrow, they're going to go up against Eminem Academy, who have had a pretty poor day today as well. So they'll be hoping that they at least find some points from that game. There's points to be had in that game for 86, but really I hope that they're going to be able to say, all right, it was against Heroic, no one expected us to win this. We didn't expect to win it. They can brush it off and move on. Hopefully nothing lingers from that short turnaround from this matchup, of course, to that Eminem Academy game. But I think that just points in that for 86. And hello, we're back. Me and Whippet, that's, you know, that's us done for the night. And, you know, you'll hear us not babbling on, but we'll send it over to the analyst desk who's going to break that, that one down for you. I was muted, but now I'm back. Thank you, guys. I just realized that um, you got just whipped it, whip it, whip it, it across to us. Sorry, that sounded so much better in my head. Um, <laughs> X, Grace, let's get into a little bit of analysis here. Heroic, maintain pole position at top of the table with a big win over 86. Do you think X, it felt maybe a little bit too easy? Um, I kind of like the point that was made at the end of the, the casting desk there and the, I don't think that 86 made it as easy as they could have done for themselves. Um, the big caveat to tonight, of course, is that 86 played with a sub. And I think that's something that sort of showed a little bit tonight, really, if we're being honest. Um, they didn't look like the same team that we've seen. It was a bit of a trickier game because there was a couple of re-hosts thrown in there as well. So it wasn't entirely clean in terms of flow. But I just never really felt like 86 got themselves started. It wasn't clean in terms of flow, Grace, but um, Heroic managed to ride the wave. They did. And again, I think, um, you know, given that that was the full roster, it was always going to be difficult for 86. And it's the fact that for Heroic, it's like a nice, you know, time for them to really play together as a team and, you know, continue practicing together as a team. Of course, they will be saving strats for next weekend. But um, Why, what's that? Is, something, that... is something happening next weekend? I think something may be happening next weekend. Sounds like something major, major could be happening. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there we go. There we go. <laughs> yeah, but that prep is, um, you know, it's vital for, for any any team. And, and this is a really good platform for them to do it on an X. You know, mm. a big win over 86 is, it's not, it's not easy work really, is it? 
It's not. It's not like work. You know, it's an official game, so you're getting you know good official experience prior to a major competition. Um, you know, that's probably one of the reasons why we saw Heroic play with a full five here tonight. I'm not sure if they're in some sort of boot camp situation at the moment. I would imagine that they either are or are about to be. Um, so yeah, you, you know, you factor all these things in and you start thinking, yeah, you know, for Heroic to come out and put in a good show. And then, let's be honest, we saw Uno running around with Thermite Shotgun, for goodness sake. Yeah. You know, this isn't stuff that's going to translate through to the Major, but winning mm -hmm. is a habit. And if you, you know, can, can, can go into the Major off the back of a couple of wins, it's not going to do you any harm. Well said. 86, Grace. What do we think? Are they mm -hmm. underperforming this season? I know you alluded to that potentially being the case uh, in the prep phase of our show earlier today, but do you think that they could be doing more? I do. I think when you, you know, you look at the roster and a lot of the names within that roster, there's another level they could be at right now. I don't think they're quite hitting it. And I don't think that's just, you know, today. I think that's been across a few of the play days. Um, and again, it's this idea where I still don't think they're really subbing in change things too much. I think it's still the idea of the way that that teamwork is going and again some questionable um plays with some of the utility at times too um that could really just be more beneficial used properly i will say um especially when it comes to that late round so that's something i want to see from them going forward it's again just ironing out those kinks that they seem to have in their duvet of a team that's a weird thing to say isn't it ian Duvet of a team. Do you know what? Duvet of a team. Now you just want to, I just wanted ready to get tucked up in my duvet after you said that. <laughs> um, X, how much do you think Heroic have sort of solidified themselves as the real true front runners here if they hadn't already done so? I'd say if they were a duvet and it was a cold night, they would be at least 25 tog. Um, I think that they are firmly. <laughs> Only anyone who's bought a duvet is going to get that one, I'm afraid. Um, I think that they've, they've, they've firmly cemented themselves now at the top um you know there's there's still room for a little bit of maneuver obviously we've got victors playing later on tonight they could leapfrog there and you know we could see a little bit of shifting around and stuff um but heroic are going to be very happy with that we've touted them this season as the team that should be winning it all things considered look at navi you know they've they had one forfeit earlier on in the competition due to internet problems the forfeit in both games this week that isn't putting them in any great standing to be going through and, and winning another title. You look at Eminem Academy side, you might think the name's familiar, the team. It's the Academy team, not the main team. Like, this yeah. is the time for Heroic to get a win under the belts. You just made me have a flashback to the first time I bought my own bedding and my mum went, make sure you get 25 tog. And I was like, what are you on about? <laughs> I have no idea what that means. Anyway, um, X Grace, you just sit back and relax for a moment because we're bringing on the one and only Mr. Officer himself. Mr. Heroic, the man, the myth, the legend, the man with the thickest beard in all of Siege. Officer, how are you? Hello, mates. I'm doing good. How about yourself? Yeah, it's, it's good to see you. Um, I mean, that was a nice little performance from you guys there. How much have, have you got half an eye on a, a trip stateside at the moment? Uh, can you repeat that? That was way too UK for me. <laughs> How much have you got half an eye on a trip to America at the moment while you're playing in this uh, in this tournament? Oh, that's what you said. Yeah. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, you're right. You know, like obviously, um, we're not we're not playing to troll or anything. We're actually trying to win. Uh, but uh, there's no doubt about it that we cannot show any strats or anything of play styles and whatnot, because uh, there are some. Uh, foxes out there that is watching so but uh but we 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 play with good comms and we have a bit of fun and i think that mental brings brings us uh, far when it comes to winning these games so uh, we, we definitely didn't go to the game today thinking that you know 86 is gonna be a bad team or anything they're they're actually doing pretty well so at the end of the day i, th I think it was gorg uh, that said, on the, after the last round, he was like, I swear I expected more from these guys. And I, I don't think he means it in a bad way either. It's just that we were actually expecting more. Um, so I don't know if the, I don't know if we just, you know, crushed their uh, mental bit somewhere in the game. But mm -hmm. yeah, it's a, it's a good team we, we played today. So we're happy. Yeah, I mean, I think that comes down to the fact that your roster obviously respects your opposition, which I think is a, is a wonderful thing. Um, what made you play with the full five, um, your full strength roster today, Mr. Officer? Exactly off that same point, because uh, we, we know that 86 is a is a really good team, and we didn't want to, you know, take the chance of like stepping in with a coach and whatnot. 
and for the fact, as you can probably have seen on Twitter and whatnot, Gorgona has been through hell and back. So he finally had some peace in mind to actually focus on other things as well. And then it was natural for him to also step in and play us as subs, me or Shate. It, obviously, you know, it's cool for us to step in and play and whatnot. But as every team know, when you play with a full roster, it's a completely different story. So I, I envy that to the boys today. Absolutely. Um, how much are you guys looking forward to Charlotte and how's preparation going at the moment? Man, that's going to be a blast. We're really looking forward to it. It's our first LAN together and obviously nerves are starting to kick in a bit. You know, we're noticing things with each other that we haven't noticed before. I think that's a healthy and, you know, that's how it should be. I would be more worried if nothing changed and, you know, we were... Um, we're, you know, just doing as good as we did uh, when we we're playing online. There's something wrong with you if that happens. So I'm happy to see that we're human. Um, when it comes to the practice, our practice has actually not been so uh, fly, to be completely honest. It's not like we're smashing teams in scrims and whatnot. If people think that, they're in dreamland. We have a lot of red, we have a lot of yellow, and we have a lot of green, which is the coloring in between a draw, a loss, and a win. But uh, we don't care about that. We we know that practice is practice, and official game is official game. And one thing that we have shown, to uh, well, proved to show is that in official games we step up, and that's when it matters. So um, yeah, we're we're happy. It's it's cool experience as well to meet all of the boys at the same place. So yeah, yeah. All thanks, Gucci. I mean, it's it's going to be great, and having a the first you know live audience in Siege for over two years will be. Pretty spectacular. So I know that a lot of the fans watching this right now will be delighted to see you guys over there. For now, though, congratulations, Mr. Officer, on another successful win here. You are solidified, pretty much looking decent at the top of the table as it stands. So go and relax, go celebrate, and I'll, um, hopefully I'll speak to you soon. Thank you so much, mate. And keep up the good job to all of the teams in this league and also to you guys behind the scene. Mucho love. Thank you. Cheers, man. Take care. Cheers. Right, let's bring the team back in. What a, what a lovely man. And I wasn't bluffing when I said he he's just... got, got the best beard in Siege. Second to Ollie. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, it, what, what I like there is, of course, it, it, you have to take any tournament seriously. Sometimes we do see, you know, in the past with Yukin or, or whatever else, it's difficult to, for teams to already, you know, always fully commit to these tournaments. But these guys have definitely done just that, X. Yeah, and it's it's nice to see that they're, Finally finding that position that they can play as a five, not give too much away, have fun, and just play with good comms and win. And that's not really a balance that we saw this team able to find under Kawana, for example. You think you think back to last season of Yukin, and there was a lot of sort of struggles there in the roster. Obviously, the roster was a lot more unstable. They had a lot more changes. Um, but it's nice to see it develop a little bit more now into a situation where they can say, yeah, we need to bring in the full five today because we've got a really important game. We respect this opponent and we know that if we slip up, we could lose. And But we can still like shelf our, the, the way that we're really going to play when we get into you know the, the officials at the major. Um, but we can come out and put, in, put on a good show today. All right. We might have one last good show to come, Grace. And I'm going to ask you for a sound to describe how excited you are for Victor's versus oh, Tenstar. Can't. I can't sound without being, I don't know, I'm obviously super excited. I could just scream I mean, right now, but I think it might disturb the entire apartment building, so. Yeah, that's probably not um, a good idea. And we want yeah. people to stick around on the stream, so let's we not. Do. We do, we do. do <laughs> All right, Chris X, you guys are going to be casting our last uh, match of the evening, Victors versus 10 Star. Ah! There you go. It's going to be a banger, and it's coming up next. Don't go anywhere. MPL is fully underway now and it's time to consider what tasty treats these matchups will bring us. For this week's play day, 10 Star vs Victus is our match to watch. Let's get into it. Oscar and YZN previously played together in PG Nats and then they entered back into their own national scenes with a new roster last December named LFO. After Yukin 2 and Rainbow Rumble, they made further roster changes and were picked up by Victus. Oscar and Flexi are the ones to keep your eyes on for eye-watering plays. Both currently have the highest costs in the entire league, which shows significant plays are being shown by these two. And now over to 10 Star. The hype around this roster really went 0 to 100 at the start of the year. People were keen to see how the young gunner of Rolo would perform, and the start of the year saw this team really make their mark within the UK and Ireland scene, with incredible performances 
Jex is currently battling the Victus lads for the highest cost at 71%, while Savage has been fragging out of his mind, something we are expecting to continue over the coming months. The start of 2022 saw prominent performances from both of these teams within Yukin 2 and Yukin Rainbow Rumble. Within Yukin 2, Victus, under the name of LFO, finished first, only dropping a map to 10 star ironically on Playday 3, whilst 10 star finished second. Within Rainbow Rumble, both of these teams made it to the Grand Finals. People were curious how it would end after witnessing 10 star win off of forfeits, and LFO Victus beating popular teams like Delta Project and Hyperio 86. But 10 star proved themselves to everyone in the finals by beating LFO Victus 3 0 in the weighted best of five. Bringing us to NPL. This matchup will not only showcase the talents of two teams we all adore for being the next ones up, it will also provide the opportunity for Victus to get a slice of revenge. Alternatively, Tensar could once again take the win. Given that we have seen multiple moments of genius flowing through the mechanics of the Tensar boys, and Victus's pickup of Jake Southster as a coach, combined with the current high progression of the Victus players, it's set to be a scorcher. So grab your snacks, bring a cooling spray, and see you on play day seven. Nobody likes being left out. That's why Special Effect are helping people with physical disabilities to play video games. But this isn't just about having fun. The gaming setups we create are personalized, so people can play to the very best of their abilities. And that opens the door to inclusion and independence, confidence and creativity. Help us level the playing field and create more magical gaming moments because it's everyone's turn to play. And Slotar just picks them apart. He's trying to put some shots on in and managing to find the last two. Oh, but Blur just decimates. Chris steps up huge for Ambush. Three kills. All E1 DCs. Oh, what? Oh, what? Welcome back to the Rainbow Six NPL. My name's Ian Chambers, joined once again by these two lovely fellas. We've got Fresh and we've got Whippet. Ready to get set to throw you guys into our final match of Playday 7. I'm excited for it before I talk more about that. Let's just reflect a little bit on Heroics. Um, impressive win over 86 fresh. You heard my interview there with the one and only Mr. Officer. You know, those guys are, are, are taking this extremely seriously, but at the same time, they're taking, of course, their preparation for um, Charlotte very seriously too. Yeah, and I think... They've kind of matured as a roster since their move from Kavana to Heroic. They've they've added a new note and they've matured as a roster because, as Ollie said as well, is that during Yukin, they found it hard to distinguish the two between the kind of EUL team to the tier three team. Yeah. Um, and they their distinction was to not play any strats, was to play coaches, was to almost treat it with a level of disrespect in terms of the tier three stuff. Whereas now they are this fully functioning unit that treats this competition with respect. Let's bear in mind, they're in America in six days competing at the major, yep. and they're still trying to win the game. They're still, you know, putting out a great show for everybody. Um, and it's good to see from this roster. Yeah, there, there definitely has been a, a really impressive uh, level of growth that we've witnessed over the past couple of years from this team, Whippet. Yeah, there has been. I mean, Fresh touched on it, when the addition of Uno to this roster has really skyrocketed them, it's been fantastic to see this. And in a pretty short period of time, the massive development they've made to now being top of EUL and looking like one of the teams that, you know, is making shortlists to be able to make a deep run at Charlotte. It's a massive kind of boost. And I would say Uno is a player that a lot of people perhaps sleep on a little bit because it's not the flashiest kills Uno is able to pull off, but it's a massive backbone of any team is a part of and has helped Heroic absolutely massively. All right, we've massively hyped up our final match of the evening and I hope that it lives up to everyone's expectations. 
and hype levels. It is Victus versus Ten Star next. So what we're going to do is we're going to kick things off first by taking a look at each of the rosters, starting with Victus Fresh. Yeah, you've you know this is, if you followed, I mean, we'll talk about both of these two teams in their history, but this roster, you know, was a you can two team and they really were going up head to head with 10 star for the spots into Yukin. obviously that's now kind of gone into the npl and there was actually a situation where these two rosters kind of played each other for a spot here um they were known as lfl they got mm -hmm. picked up by the victors organization which is one that we know and love inside of you know the uk siege scene um, and inside of N npl as well they've got wiser den oscar skeptic flexi and skytey all a tremendous amount and i'm, I'm gonna say talent but I'm also going to say, um, I was going to say a word and I've completely forgotten it, potential. How did I forget the word potential? But a, pr <laughs> a, a tremendous amount of potential within this roster. Um, a great propensity to kind of, they don't have a ceiling, is how I feel. This roster's got so much space to grow and grow and grow. And in my eyes, they are one of the contenders for the Challenger League spots. There you go. He said it right there. Fresh, uh, Fresh has made a statement, Whip it, and I know you agree with him. I do. Victors have been on this massive train of improvement a fantastic run of course they were grand finalists in our very first UK rumble and with two new additions to the roster as well skeptic and flexi coming in that could make a huge improvement to the team and they've been maturing they've been getting stronger and stronger i think as fresh said they have a massive chance of being in the running for one of those cl spots right let's move on then their opponents tonight and no one uh, nothing to be played with, I'm going to say. You've got to take these guys extraordinarily seriously. Another up-and-coming team that many Siege fans have had their eye on for quite some time. Ten Star Whip It. I mean, there's no secret. This is one of the hottest properties in Siege right now. They've not really had the start to MPL they would have wanted, but, you know, Leader, Azza, Jags, Rolo and Savage... This team is full of potential, just like Victus, and they really are starting to you know, really tap into that. They're finding consistency, which has still not been their biggest problem in matches all throughout Rumble and all through Yukin 2. They'd have great starts, but then they'd fade in the middle of a matchup, and you'd always get scared that they wouldn't be able to get back. They've always had the mentality to recover, but now they're not fading away in matches. They're getting more consistent. They just need to string positive results together. Do you think they've got what it takes to really continue to build and grow like some consistency that, that really needs to be a huge part of a successful team's formula i do um i think you know i'll be honest ian i'm somewhat biased towards this team uh i've got a lot of good friends in this team but i hold these two teams in a very similar light i think 10 star will believe that they're one of the teams that will take one of the challenger league spots as well and that's why you know everybody's rubbing their hands together because of this game because this team you know, has what it takes. They've got a lot of great individual players. Um, and, you know, I've I've had the privilege of actually scrimming against this team. Mm -hmm. um, and I say it was a privilege. It was also a pretty bad time because they were just that good. All right. Speaking of two players individually who can really step up to the plate, let's get a bit of a head-to-head -head up here. Flexi and Savage, two stellar choices for us to keep our eyes on going into this one, Whip It. Oh, absolutely. Again, massive impact across the board. Savage, one of those players that you can just trust when those pressure situations build up, that they can always be consistent and perform. And Flexi, one of the newer additions to this roster, of course, has had a fantastic impact. And look at that cost, 63%. Massive impact across majority of the rounds played, and even getting a few plants to their name, and a fantastic KDR, considering that their most pick operator role has been on that Nomad. Mm-hmm. I am. Um, I actually said a long time ago when Flexi was part of High Coast that Flexi was the best player in the Nordic region because he was playing in Nordics at the time. He's got a lot of great potential. I know he spent some time with Delta Project. It didn't play out too well there. Um, obviously, ended up getting released and is now a part of Victus. Um, but I hold him in a high regard. And you know, comparing it to Savage subjectively, um, there's quite a few people who believe he's the next up, the next up and comer. Um, if he doesn't make it with his team individually, will be picked up inside the pro circuit. There's a lot of people that rate him as a player and you can talk about stats all day that you want. But when you're talking about, you know, professional teams, tier one, tier two teams rating a player as such, you know that he's got some, some, some substance about him. How much heat do you think Heroic just put on Victor's fresh to, to deliver here? Because Heroic are now sitting on 20 points uh, in first place. Victor's on 16. If they want to get up to 19 and, and keep snapping at the, 
the feet there, I guess, of Heroic. They need mm. to get it done here. Honestly, they're probably not thinking too much about Heroic because if you think about these two teams, they're thinking about each other as main, re- main rivals for a Challenger League spot. Yep. Um, so you talk about relegation six-pointers all the time. This is effectively a promotion six-pointer, I think, in the eyes of the two teams. Okay, well, let's get into our map vetoes to see where we are going for this one. I, do you know what? I can barely... Because it, it feels like these evenings just go by so quickly. Mm. But I'm, I'm actually quite relieved tonight because I've been really looking forward to finding out where we're going and how this plays out. And we're going to Chalet again with it. I am very excited for this one. This is not a map we see 10 stars show a lot of. And during the group stage of the UK Rumble, they had a very impressive performance here where they looked nearly untouchable. And it's interesting they don't show it a lot, but this is, again, as a map stylistically, lines up very well for both these teams to have an incredible matchup tonight. Does it lead yeah. towards either team in particular, Fresh? What do you reckon? Oh, I don't know. It feels like Chalet's fast becoming one of them maps that's them one of their middle of the road best of one maps that feel very 50-50 in terms of attacker defender, you know, win rates and teams are comfortable playing either side and therefore happy to go to it in a best of one. Um I think we've got the perfect stage there. I think we've got the perfect stage of a good map that both teams have got good experience on, you know, like it a little bit as well. Um and we'll be comfortable going head to head on it and you know I think we're in for a really good match here. You know what I love about this? It's like a, a main event boxing card, right? And we've got to the <laughs> main event, the final bout, and we've been hyping it up. We've been excited about it all day. I know for Grace it's been all week, probably all month. Let's <laughs> finally get to it. It is Victus versus Ten Star on Chalet with X and Grace. Let's go. Ian, thank you very much indeed. We will be calling the action for this one. Look at that smile on Grace. You're trying to hide it. You're trying to hide it and you can't. I you can't. You are as excited as anybody for this one. I'm honestly not sure how it's going to be casting this one with you because if you just start to lose your mind mid-cast, we might need to pull in a replacement. Um, maybe, but maybe. hopefully you keep it together. What is it, what is it in particular that, that's really getting you about this one? It's just everything. It's the Romulus and Remus of UK Siege right now, but who will be the Romulus is the question on everyone's lips. And again, both these teams, it's so difficult to pick a favourite because they're both at such a high standard and they're both so good at specific things that it's the hardest thing to call in history. Could this be the Victus revenge time? That is the question that I have. Could Victus finally get that little a little dub over 10 star given on how january went as an example um, at the same at the same time 10 star being 10 star they're not gonna let let victus get away with that really so this is probably i'm hoping gonna be first of all overtime definitely on the cards in my opinion um the, the map pick of chalet has me a little bit like hmm um because again this will slightly maybe favor 10 star going into it victor's already banning the flores so that's some utility clear taken away from 10 star when they're making their approach into this map i think one of the reasons why i'm really curious about this one is that we've seen 10 star struggle so far in npl and we've seen them come up against a bit of trial a bit of tribulation and it hasn't necessarily been the easiest ride and they've gone away and they, they've put some work in um, but they've still not looked fantastic. They've still not had that sort of, that flair last week. It was, you know, they smashed mm. Coalesce, but they should have won the game against Heroic. They lost against uh, Ambush, a game that they probably should have won. They lost against um, against Viperio, another game they probably should have won. So, uh, you know, they could be coming up against Victus at a very dangerous time for Victus because mm. Ten Star have been there. They've made the mistakes. They've put the work in. And they just need to show us that consistency. Because if they start to bring that consistency to the table, it could be very, da- you know, they're going to be a very dangerous side. But it's about finding that and whether they can, you know, find it now in, in what is going to be one of the toughest games to date. Yeah, 100%. And, you know, again, I do think that Victors themselves have had, you know, one or two play days where perhaps they didn't play at the standard that we did expect from them. Um, ultimately, still getting getting the win, yes. But I think the players themselves are probably frustrated at how some of those rounds went. And again, how many rounds they may have lost, especially when it comes into late season. You know, we always talk about when you do see the points starting to be a bit more even Stevens. Those rounds are so, so important. Um, so certainly here, you know, Victors really want to 
most likely try and get six in a row here, but that's going to be difficult because, as I say, it's Romulus versus Re Re Remus. It's two brothers going head to head almost, uh, and they're two massive champions of the Yukin uh, circuit. So, this is why everyone's so excited. This is why both of these teams should be going in all guns blazing. Um, double frost mat on the library window upstairs. Again, I respect it. I respect it, to be honest, uh, X. There's a lot of utility burn upstairs, which is good because it does look like that's where this approach is coming from. They're not really going for that solar take to begin with, the solar bedroom push. Um, I think Leader has his eyes on it a little bit. Now, I really know Azir and Leader are actually going to take that side as well. I think they just want to apply the extra pressure to the library nice and early as well. But there's a lot of utility, as I say, for them to get through. We've already seen a frost map win a game already tonight. So... Might be about to see it again. Potentially. Potentially, potentially. Again, a little bit of a standstill here. It's kind of like the quiet before the storm because I am expecting... Oh, there we go! There's a little bit of a storm. Savage getting the pick there onto YZN. And you know, that's two players of Victus falling already within the first minute of the round. Yeah, Victus succumbing to the, uh, the danger of Chalet is that you can really get picked off on those rotations. If you're not mm. static, if you're not dug in behind some utility, there are a lot of windows on Chalet and there's a lot of nice crossfires that can be found. And off the back of a little bit of good drone information, it isn't going to take too much to start picking people off. And Victus, they've lost two with barely responding with a shot. That's now a lot of control given away. Oscar? Gonna find one back over onto Savage. Playing in a very dangerous spot, all things considered, as well. You'd hope that he's got a couple of those magnets up there to try and support him. You would expect a nade in from that big window. He's obviously got the laser gate on the window as well that's gonna give him a little bit of something to work around. Now the magnets are start catching up some of those nades coming through. Oscar has been allowed to move here, and I don't think anyone really knows where he is right now, as a Certainly doesn't have a clue. This is it. I think he's just being allowed... Again, that's a very position, uh, aggressive position Oscar is holding, and he's not really going to get punched for it. This Twitch drone... Or maybe, you know, it has indeed spotted him now. We might see a wall band come through very quickly, and well, no, Oscar actually turns around, gets a pick onto Azir. Escape with his life almost. There we go, Rollo with the refrag. Three versus 2x. Getting very exciting indeed. Still chance here for 10 star to try and execute something. They've got a good amount of time remaining. Like, see, just going to make a rotation potentially back into sight. Currently playing the bottom of library stairs. Now, the site is very clear, but I don't think that 10 star know this right now. They haven't got the drone information in the site. A couple of pre fires there in onto Flexi's position. He can now dig in to that closet. There's another nade flies Ooh. in, but Flexi's there with the peak. Takes one onto Jegs. Picks up the dropping player in Rollo. Leader now left. He knows exactly where Flexi is. He's just got to try and push in and challenge. He's got the F2, but he can't win the fight. Flexi, what a rotation there into the closet. Being allowed to retake into the site and picking up a couple of very important kills. 100%. I mean, we're already seeing the site game come through and chat there, Skeptic with the wake up. But again, it's... um. You know, we did mention before about Flexi and how much they are capable in their own right, again, to win out the round like that and make it look so easy in the process too. Just a case of repositioning and getting that kill very quickly. But again, this I, I think that it's interesting because of how neither team seemed particularly like they were going miles of a, ahead of the other. Like throughout the entire the entire round there. It was very, very even Stevens, and I think that is something we're gonna see throughout the first six rounds, definitely. I think that last round is a really good example of how Ten Star have played all season long up until this point. It's a round that on paper they should win, and they just can't execute it. And we regularly see this from them. Now you know, man count advantage, time advantage, they had drones available, but just none of those things ended up be working out for them. They didn't use the time particularly well. The hatch drop from Rollo was a little bit mistimed. It was in an attempt to trade on to Flexi, but Flexi was, there was nothing pressuring him. He was already pretty safe and sound there. Mm. And it's a shame that they didn't realize how much of the site they actually had free for the taking before they allowed Flexi to make that rotation back in. 
That said, it was only round number one. There's still a lot of this game left to play out, and especially on Chalet, you would expect the defenders to pick up a round here and there. Absolutely. And again, 10 star trying to get this pressure from all angles and taking library very, very quickly, and they're going to start pushing their way towards piano now. And already seeing the positioning on that fluke balcony as well. They're starting to mostly gain control of this entire side of the map pretty early on. But that's more down to the fact that we're not really seeing a extended room from Victor, so kind of really hunkering down on that kind of northeastern side of the map. See if Savage can make an impact this time. He got picked off fairly early on in the previous round. Looks like he's trying to contest into bathroom right now. Playing into that aggressive playstyle they're expecting from Victus. We're seeing a couple of claymores out there as well, just in case. Sky T. Gonna be looking to maybe make a challenge onto that. He'd be very ill advised to jump out, mm. but Savage can at least drone for free in the meantime and gather himself a little bit more intel. Feed that through onto Jegs. This top floor clear isn't going too badly here. It's taking a little bit of time, but Ten Star are really making sure that every box has been ticked. There's still the small problem of Oscar, though, inside a master. I think this is it, isn't it? You've got to play as safe as possible when you know how high progressive victors have certainly been playing this season. Um, you know, you really have to make sure that you're not getting caught off guard by any kind of ratty positions or any sudden rushes towards you. And I think it's been quite nice because my worry was that both these teams would decide to... Oh, beautiful shot there by Jegs taking out Oscar. There we are. But again, my main concern was that they would both go very high progressive towards each other and it would be, uh, you know, less about the, the ticking of the boxes. But they, we are indeed seeing the boxes getting ticked and that really once again shows the quality of these players. They're not willing for this matchup to get to their heads a little bit. And there we are, beautiful shot there. Why is it then taking down Azir? So both teams getting a casualty each so far, but 30 seconds on the clock, X. And that's one of the problems when you take a long time to make that clear. A pick, a kill picked up there onto YZN as he attempts to rotate, but it is responded to immediately. Still, we're waiting for 10 Star to actually get themselves inside here and fully commit. And with only around 15 seconds, that's not really what you want to be seeing. They're still able to pick up a couple of kills here and there, though, as Skyty rotates himself into Trophy before being put down. The plant now going down under the cover from Rollo as the final kill will fly on through. Tight on time from 10 star, but they made it count. They had all that information pre planned and they knew exactly where they needed to be pushing. Focusing on the plan to extend the clock there as well. Good take mm. from them on that top floor. Absolutely. One round to one round. I, I, I feel like that's probably what we're going to see going forward. I, I really do think that a lot of these rounds and the way that they're going, it's kind of. Um, a bit of trades to begin with and then there's like a quiet before the storm and then it does all kick off and it's very reminiscent of a kind of again just more of an old school way of playing but it's really pleasant to see traditional siege traditional siege exactly traditional siege and this is, I mean, sometimes it's what we've been asking for, right? Over the course of the no, evening, 100%, you know. 100%. We've, we've been like, asking for this, like. <laughs> I I would, I if every single team would play like this, I would be the happiest person on the planet, genuinely. I, I think it's so, so strategical. And it's so pleasant to watch. And it really doesn't make you feel as stressed. It really does come down to the nitty gritty of making sure that, again, all these boxes are ticked, so to speak. And it's um, it's nostalgic, but it's, it is how I think Seed should be played. Um, maybe that, that's just me being old school, but- Just in the final 20 seconds. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's everything that leads up to that though. And exactly, exactly. Yeah, it, it, it does, uh... It, it makes for certainly exciting watching as well when there isn't a lot of time left on the clock and you're watching teams mm. and players do things that they have rehearsed multiple times and, you know, mm. making sure that they are going through those motions and one wrong move can be the difference between winning or losing the round. So that sort of stuff certainly is uh, is exciting. And, you know, 10-star got away with it in that previous round. Let's see if it works again for them here. They've made a little bit of a change. They brought Savage on the nook, so obviously trying to gain a little bit of ground there somehow. Mm. Nook not bringing the most utility to the table and you're really looking toward that and saying, right, where are you going to use it? How many kills are you going to get, Savage? 
Yeah, exactly. It's like a solo push kind of sneaky, sneaky style of operator. But one thing I'm finding really interesting is, again, we compare these two teams to all of the other teams in the league. And there's even just really small nuances like, you know, Ten Star droning out every single nook and cranny. As here covering as their teammate, you know, even vaults in, even though they have just droned to see it's clear. They're being so, so safe about this. Um, and that's really good to see. And I think certainly they need to do that against Victus, who, as we keep, keep saying, Victors are playing so hyper-aggressive nowadays and it's working really well for them um, because I think, you know, mechanically they are so, so gifted. Um, but at the same time, there can sometimes be issues if teams do start getting aggressive that if people go very direct and by the book towards them, they can throw a spanner in the works and they can start to make mistakes. So again, with Victors, they're not making these mistakes. It's just beautiful. I'm so excited, honestly. We've seen the EMPs coming through to start to open up the line of sight into why next Kairos coming through. Roll a little bit of a risky run across the door there, but they are going to start to get this extra wall open hopefully soon. Oscar, however, getting the pick onto Jake, so that is the Finker taken off. No boost for this collapse, X. Going to be a little bit of a blow there. You look toward Jegs for a good couple of kills, and he's not really activated yet this game. Next Kairos are successful opening up that wine wall, but we see the Yokai drone rotate around. Droned out now as well, but double ADS on the stack up and the deployable shield. C4 gonna fly on out and hit its mark. That's Oscar's second. The nade comes through, but it isn't gonna be enough. Savage, you're not gonna be able to challenge that with a nade, my friend. You need a gun in your hand. Unfortunate not to get the headshot there as Oscar is really holding firm here on this breach. Picks himself up the third. Can he snag the fourth on the door? He puts the damage in onto Azza. It isn't going to be an ace, but it's going to be a flawless round for Victus. Very strong hold there. Do you know what? That was actually disgusting. They had Oscar behind a shield. With, it wasn't two. It was three ADSs. So no matter what they threw at him, it was just constantly getting burnt out. Um, and then it was just a case of Oscar just wiggling around that shield to his heart's content. That was really lovely. And again, it really shows the skill level of Oscar as a player. The fact that... You know, he is the one holding off that collapse mostly and just making it look so easy and fluid to him. Yeah, you'd hope that there's some adaptation on its way for the next time that we see that site. Yeah. Um, especially with the lineup that 10 Star brought, if they'd have given themselves a little bit more time, they've got the EMPs, they might be able to disable some of those ADSs if they throw the EMP in a clever way, behind, like in the stack, for example. Um, just in the little alcove so it doesn't get caught, it's instead going to disable and then all of a sudden you can start destroying the shield and or even leaving the shield, as long as you've got it, you can use it and, you know, make some steps from there. So, um, a, a good defense from 10 Star, I think, sorry, a good defense from Victus, I don't think that 10 Star gave themselves quite enough time there to really do everything that they needed. Um, it was almost one of those situations where you looked at it and you were like, I'm not crazy, this is a, a basement attack, right? Because there's still people like on the top floor and really looking to try and clear out quite heavily up there. But it's just the threat of that roam game. You can't exactly. give these players on Victus that mm. room to move because they are going to take it. So the sacrifice for that is you're probably going to be pushed for time in most of your attacking rounds. No, 100%. Um... That's exactly it. It's even like you know, it the, the, the Villa game, for example, where, you know, we just saw, I believe it was YZN, just run out and just clean up like three of them in one go. Um, this team are a team that if you give them the opportunity to pop up and take a shot, they will land every single one of their shots. YZN actually ironically getting tagged up a little bit there by Jegs upside down on this uh, library rappel. A little bit of a sneaky angle there. Rightly so, why is it then going to rotate away? Again, though, it's the mental game, the amount of time that you're going to waste here as they drone out the rest of library to make sure that they have indeed fallen off. It looks as though 10 Star are making good progress, though. We've got a little bit of pressure mm. in from Solar Stairs. We've got some info as to what's going on in main lobby. Leader can choose to move his drone there later. Rollo now can come on in carrying the diffuser. Azza. Now, last, last round we saw it was Oscar playing the Frost very aggressively. Um, there's been a bit of a, a change around here in the lineup that's been brought. The Frost's gone, mm. and instead we've got an Ella, and Oscar's actually switched over onto the Smoke. So, while the Frost mats didn't really see too much value, it was more the position that Oscar was playing. Now, still no Jaeger being brought in this round, but still the... 
whammy discs. I would love to see some more nades going in onto that fireplace position that Oscar's in because that was such a problem last time. And it looks as though that's going to be a bit more of a focus here as the library stairs shield is destroyed. It further weakens Oscar's position. That's indeed, but once again, Oscar just willing to just stay there and get a little bit bolshy with it, a little bit aggressive with it if needed. Um, again, one of Tensile's going to have to make this engagement happen soon because timer is ticking. Toxic Babe's coming through, though. It's going to delay them just a little bit as well. Why is it end? Shooting out the Twitch drone only to drop off as well. Going to rotate up to blue. We go. Oh, beautiful shot there by Azza taking out Oscar finally. But again, 40 seconds and a four versus five. It's still not the best place for 10 star to be when they have to start selling up for this collapse. Important player last time was Flexi. Showed that uh, sometimes you don't need the full team, you just need one well placed defender. At least this time, Victors have got a couple more bodies to be rocking with. Also got a C4 place just on the hatch there in case a drop does come through, but it looks like it could be a hop in through sight window. Skyty going to start things off with a kill onto leader, but 10 star battle back. Savage now going to come on through mudroom. Why is it then? Waiting here on the flank as Skyty looks to push through, but the cover's there. Jegs and Azza find the last two. Again, the plant going down there to extend the time. So making it a clean two versus two and both players on 10 star winning that important one versus one. Mm, exactly that. Winning those gunfights and ultimately winning them the round uh, by proxy. So this is it's it, it's already like I, I just don't know x to be honest it, it's gonna be like this f until we get to that kind of round seven and that's when things may change again it depends what kind of attack victor's bring but at, at the moment i'm certainly very happy we are seeing how even the match these teams can be at, at this time i think victor's as well um certainly showcasing the the, the level at which they're willing to uh, consistently improve and play and the same with 10 star to be honest as well i think again there was maybe a few question marks about how they would be coming into this based on the start of the season but i do just believe it was just a rocky start to the season for them and i think certainly given how important you know i guess even like we could say socially this matchup is um i, I knew 10 star would come in kind of all guns blazing and we're seeing that in the clearness at which they're playing at the safety the, the teamwork is absolutely on point again mm. it's just even really simple things where it's like you wouldn't normally think oh i need to cover here because it should be safe it's like they're making sure that if there's some horrendous reality where victors could just suddenly pop up out of the blue even if you've triple checked it you're still covering for the rest of your teammates and making sure that it's a hundred percent safe and i think that's really aiding them to keep it even stevens right now it's a strength that 10 star have, have got is that you know mm. the, the teamwork isn't it's, it's only in question occasionally you know and it's in important tense moments in the round where it just gets a little bit messy but on the whole they, they're usually a very well balanced side um and they're certainly showing that here going toe to toe with victus there's not a great deal separating these two teams uh it was really nice to see 10 star actually go back and win onto that bar site um, and just mm. sort of book the trend and show that they've got that ability to adapt between rounds. Um, because you, the last thing you want is to have the defenders got, having a side that they can just consistently pull off a round at. That's when you really start to come up against a little bit of a deficit. So, the question really, what 10 stars adaptation is going to be in this round? Because they're attacking once again up onto that top floor. Ooh. But as a below, he's going to find himself <laughs> a freebie there. The nade comes through to remove... Any electrification on the wall. As I can now make that rotation up as well. The wall being open, this is a good position for 10 star to be in. Oh, 100%. Again, it cuts off so many lines of sights that could potentially be used by Victus right now when they're trying to set up around for this collapse. And obviously, offers a lot of uh, choices on how you're trying to get into the site as well. We'll say it's good. You've got to be pretty mad if you're wise at end right now that. You know, Azir was clearing basement in such a way, but it's exactly what I mean. Ten Star being so safety first about everything, and it's giving them a massive benefit here. Flexi, though, with the Alda, this could be a little bit of a spicy one, to be honest, X. The gun can be incredibly powerful. It is like a hot knife through butter, and certainly with a gun like Flexi being the one to hold onto it is a. Mamma mia, that's a spicy meatball. 
It really is. This is where we need a little bit of alternate pressure from 10 Star. And we can see that's coming right now. We've got somebody <laughs> hopping onto that big window. That somebody is going to be Savage. Jegs has dealt with Flexi. Unfortunately for Savage, the smokes have covered Ooh. any potential he's got at covering this plant. There is going to be a C4 below, but it's not going to be required just yet. Jegs takes down Oscar. The C4 below still could be a factor here, but Rollo <gasps> baits it out beautifully. Oh a little bit of a rotation now, but Jegs is actually... Blind firing through that smoke. It seems his teammates are hell-bent on hampering him there on that flank watch position. But the plant goes down regardless. Skyty. Ace clutch to try and pull off this round. It's going to be a tall, tall order. Oh. Jegs finishes things off. Fantastic round from him. And a flawless round in response here from 10 Star. Well, and again, it's this idea that they're, you know, baiting out those toxic babes. And then even with the C4, they got the sound cue, they could hear it. And they were like, oh, we need to bait that out. And the timing on that was just, oh my God, my head nearly fell off. But again, it's this idea of just safety first, safety first. Yes, we have to wait still. We have to wait still. We have to wait still. And as a result of all of their patience, all of their safety, 10 Star did in indeed get a flawless of their own. And that's both teams, you know, coming into this. Getting evenly matched, both getting flawless rounds, and <sighs> it's gonna be it's gonna be one of those maps. It's gonna be one of those maps. We are on round six, so we are on the final round of this half. Victus will then switch on to the attack, ten star going on to the defense. And as we say, nine times out of ten, if you are a very, very good team, you know, you will do very, very well on this attack. It does have a good basis for attackers to go into it. It can be very attacker sided. Um Things could start shifting up a little bit. And again, I'm, I'm curious to see how Tensor will actually play this defense, given the fact that, um, you know, if they are being very safety first, I don't expect them to really be hanging out of the windows, going for runouts, things like that. They might just hunker down on site, but only time will tell, X. And again, we've got a whole other round to go through before we get to that point, so let's see how it goes. I think something I want to look out for in this round is how Tensor adapt and and how they change their approach here because they know exactly what they're going into and the site setup is very similar to the previous time we saw this site so you would expect 10 star to be able to to sort of change that a little bit now victors have been if they've been willing to switch operators and stuff but they haven't really been willing to do anything too drastically different in their setups and so far 10 star have managed to combat that both times they've returned to a site they previously lost so Realistically, you're expecting 10 star to come here and be a little bit clearer on this roam, be a little bit quicker, excuse me, on this roam clear and actually, you know, be able to deal with the site once they get the walls open, not just three of them fall to one person behind a shield. So mm. we'll see if that plays out. So far, it is still taking them a lot of time to clear this top floor. It is, and again, they're, they're slightly concerned by the potential of, you know, someone playing around dining. Again, dining hatch is indeed open as well, so it's interesting because Vizier could have got a, a different verticality hole that they could have actually had a really nice long line of sight down onto Skeptic, or, or vice versa, actually. Uh, and that could have been an interesting gunfight to see, but let's get Oscar waiting with a C4 again on that hatch, which pretty much uncontested at the moment. I think Skeptic's in a bit of a tricky position there because I think that drone did indeed spot him out and if... Well, no, they're going to use their gunfire to go for the cover as they try and run back to site, taking Jegs down in the process. Goodness gracious me. Another time that we're not going to have the Finker for that all-important Finker boost just before this final collapse comes through. It looks as though 10 Star are Ooh. floundering a little bit. They have managed to destroy the shield this time, which is pretty huge. That shield was a massive problem previously. Look mm. at where Skyty is. Skyty is still out and about. You can't really commit to sight knowing that you're a man down and you've still got to keep a good eye on the flank because that is just a recipe for disaster. A little bit of drone work now goes in as the site should be called as not clear. Oscar going to be playing behind the pillar. Still got a couple of ADSs to assist him here as well. With those lines of sight being opened up, it aids him even further. C4 does go flying out of the breach, but it isn't going to connect with anything. Skyty now looking to try and make use of the vertical angles that have already been opened here by 10 Star. Hatch open as well, allows him a nice free and easy drop. A couple of kills coming in from Oscar yet again, and with the hatch open above sight, it's going to be nearly impossible to recover that diffuser. 
Savage left trying to find something at the breach, but it's an Oscar round once again as he picks himself up two and leaves Leader with it all to do. Who also finds two before the time eventually ticks on out. Nothing separating these two teams at the half, an even 3-3. Three, three. Of course. And I'm so happy to see that. Again, I think... Uh... Well, certainly, the ladies and gentlemen at home would be disappointed if it didn't turn out that way, I would think, because, again, this is one of the most exciting matchups. Um, probably, I, I would say, in my opinion, it's my my main most exciting one of the entire season so far. Um, I mean, already, I'm wondering if Leader's going uh, you know, to stay relatively close to sight with that um, Warden, or whether we're going to see him go on a little bit of a wonder. I would assume that we're going to see him kind of stick close to site because that utility probably best invested when it comes to that final execute when you're expecting maybe a lot of you know flash utility to start to come through maybe some smokes in case they're trying to cover the plant but i mean looking at victor's lineup again it's that nade meta oh wait if they have things to the thermite so maybe a bit of smoky action will come through jackal being picked by oscar as well i mean that's going to be Probably a little bit nasty. I think the last person you want to have a live ping on your location is the absolutely insanely fra uh, gunner of Oscar, isn't it? Yeah, that's going to be quite oppressive. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, we, we highlighted Oscar. Uh, he's in a couple of our top five statistics oh. as well. <gasps> it's going to be Flexi that sits <gasps> Savage down. Goodness me. You can't be going for that. You like, can't. This isn't a game of spawn peaks. You know, this isn't... This is a game that both teams desperately need to win, and you're just going to lose. I mean, you're bringing the Vigil anyway, so you've not really lost anything, but you've still mm. lost a body, and actually the Breach has been opened already. Now, this is a, a sort of old-school approach to attacking Chalet, as you actually open up the, uh, the Snowmobile Garage Breach, then make the rotation around to Trench, and it just makes the site impossible to stay in. You've just got nowhere good to hide. Ten Star went for a, a full map clear and then a backside push, so a, a push through the Trench. And here we've already seen inside the first minute, Victor's have just gone, yep, yeah, we're going to take that as well. We're going to open up Snowmobile and we're going to make it really difficult for you guys to play in the site. 100%. I mean, as you're taking out Oscar's probably a really nice little pick for 10 star to get here. And again, as you're kind of roaming upstairs now, it's going to keep Victor's on their toes a little bit. I think Sky T very aware of where Azia has tried to disappear to. And now we're probably going to see a little bit of a cheeky pinch come through to deal with him. In a way that there is an oryx lurking around so the possibility for movement is indeed apparent but flexi is going to take him out there whistling down the side of 10 star even more uh, we'll make it yeah there we go flexi actually escaping with his life taking jegs out in the process but again the slightest bit of health tickle him and he will fall over leader on the lurk here and this is not really the best thing to do in my opinion i think leader should try and get back to sight and hold off the collapse at this point again they do have a minute and 10 to deal with but worst case scenario if leader gets taken out you're then in a one versus four on site with loads and loads of time for the attack to deal with and rightly so leader as a result has come back now finally especially given that he's got the glasses so he can see through these smokes provided that mm. he stays still and he's also got the c4 there's actually a c4 on the roof as well and that's going to be rollos Ooh. but Probably no one to detonate that onto now. You may get some splash damage onto Flexi, but realistically, no one's really in the radius for it. I say that, the oh, YZN is going to get taken out by it. My mistake. You have stood right on top of that thing. With Flexi on 1 HP, this becomes very doable here for 10 Star. They are going to try and gain a little bit of information here on the drone. Skeptic is looking to drone out blue. Discovers Rollo. Skyty. May need to try and challenge this. You can hear a nade being cooked as well. There's a couple of nades still left here, but Rollo takes Skyty down, wins that engagement. Don't forget Flexi on 1 HP still. This is going to be very dicey indeed as the plant has to be stuck now by Skeptic. And that's when the glasses are activated. A live ping is given and <gasps> shots land. Oh, the plant timing. though is successful. This would be a monumental round if Flexi pulls it off. Not only would it be an ace, but it'd be an ace from almost no HP. Rollo going to go and try and go for that defuse. Needs to win the gunfight and leader lands the crucial shot. 1 HP or not, a headshot is going to do it in this game, ladies and gentlemen. And that is exactly 
what was landed. Plenty of time to disable that diffuser. It was almost mainly done. Ten star clutching around out there. Two versus four. I mean, again, that that is really good going. The fact that the plant went down just the singular second that you know they managed to try and shoot to try and prevent that. The timing was just oh my god, I have a head in my hands. But then, yeah, an unfortunate situation for Flexi to be in when you do have the tiniest bit of health. I'm wondering what if, would have happened if they had maybe a little bit more. But again, no, not really any utility to work with either in that situation. It's a bit of an awkward predicament to be in, but hats off to 10 star for being able to pull that off. And really love the fact that, you know, normally I don't really get to see Warden utilized that much really within comp play. I think sometimes if you do, it's usually because people need the secondary utility. And again, it's for that final execute if your opponent is most likely going to bring smokes to the table um and they kind of read into that really well and they were ready and prepared for it and they played it so so well they did really did i think 10 star can look back on that round and and be pretty glad at whoever was calling mm. that was calling it because there must have been some very clear and and decisive decisions made there by somebody on the team um it, it was a round that worked out for them again not a round that they necessarily should have won but well, that's that's what that's what wins your siege games. That's what wins these sort of tight competitions like this when you've got two teams that are very well matched. You've got to be winning those rounds that you oughtn't. And that was certainly ten stars. Victus need to try and respond here. There is a danger of ten stars starting to run away with this. Especially given that that was a round that on paper it looked as though Victus should have just walked away with it. Oscar looks like he's lining up for something here as the gone six opens up the window bathroom window getting opened as well not really come with a the burst of aggression that you would usually expect with a gone six being used but i suppose mm. it's an option now for a nade to maybe sail through you can get a bit of information as to who's playing piano 100 percent. and again information is going to be the name of the game we do have wizard and potentially could go for some nade kills if they wanted to do have two nades in pocket and again information game to let them know where players may be stood could be very very beneficial we do see it a lot when it comes to chalet but at the moment they're just a little bit wary to make that kind of play xkyros coming through though to try and give a little bit of a long line of sight and there we go it's going to keep savage nicely tucked into that closet area I think this is a really interesting thing about this this matchup as well. You can see the hesitance of people wanting to go for things like runouts, but it's again the the ideas of you know claymores and the potential of that. And well, SkyT taking out leader. Dix can't quite get the refrag. SkyT, however, very very tagged up indeed. And there we go, the thinker boost coming through, giving a little bit of a safety blanket, but potentially not enough. Again, Jeg's trying to recontest this. You've got to put. Your hat's off again. It's just the willing, willingness of these players to just stay in certain positions and hold and try and uh, go for the gunfights that they want to get on both sides. You've really got to feel that there was a bit of uh, misfortune there on the side of Jegs just not being able to control the gun at that range. But Rollo does a fantastic job there. The SMG 11 shutting Oscar down. Rollo will be full flashed, but to what end nobody there to push the vertical angle onto him and instead is just going to pop a toxic babe canister to keep him safe for the time being sky t eventually finished off there as jegs finished what he started savage grabs himself a kill as Ooh. well before a direct trade flexi rollo and then Azza all getting involved in the action on the site and why is then left to try and recover the diffuser victus already calling for the attack timeout couple of rounds not going their way and they want to try and stop this bleeding savage there to put the final nail in what is another successful round here for 10 star still having information there in the dying seconds of the round yeah exactly and that is again what you know when you have a team like 10 star where they play so well together the communication game is absolutely on point that intel just boosts from from you know a, a hard eight to like a 10. it just makes them unstoppable especially when it comes to cleaning up during that collapse or again can i call it a collapse victor's got pulled apart pretty quickly there um as they were trying to go for that execute so again not surprisingly we are seeing this time time out being called and it's just that idea of okay victor's need to just take a moment have a breather 
get back to the drawing board, work out what approach they want to make, and again, how they're going to deal with the way that Ten Star are bringing things to the table. Again, a few a few moments of aggression, but it's not the hyper aggression that we would expect on both sides, and rightly so because they know that they are so head to head here. They can't afford to make any mistakes. And Victors obviously feel like it's slipping at this point. You know, the timeout there being used, it gives them a chance mm. to, you know, just say, slow down. Let's, you know, figure out what basics we want to be focusing on, what things aren't, you know, going well for us. How can we improve the early part of the round? Um, because in, in some of these cases, Victors have had the advantage. Think back to the, the Savage Spawn Peak round. Lexi sat him down and it was still a round that 10 star won two versus four. Now, if there was time to call a timeout, I would have expected it then. I think calling the timeout there ahead of round number nine, it's as good a time as any. Um, but you really don't want to be leaving it much later than that. On the flip side, it gives 10 star that opportunity as well of the minute or so to just say, look, guys, we're, we're doing all right here. Let's just, mm. you know, keep going. Keep the mistakes to a minimum. Keep doing what we're doing because what we're doing is working. And if they can, you know, secure this next round and guarantee themselves some points, then it's going to be a, a bit of an uphill battle there from Victus. They're still yet to see success here on the attacking side of Chalet. This is it. And again, I did say that when it got to that kind of halfway point, would we start to see things flip in, you know, a different direction? Would one team start to see the lead? And that's exactly what we're seeing. But it's, um, again, this idea of, I figured Tensor wouldn't try and be as aggressive. And I thought they might just kind of hunker down on site but you know we did see an attempt at a spawn peak in the first round and even you know before we saw Jex kind of re-peaking windows and things like that to try and get the pressure off of the bathroom and it just feels like they're they're willing to take these fights regardless and i i think that's a really nice sign to be honest i, I love the confidence from 10 star and there's definitely a hesitance developing here from victus as well where they feel as though they're a little bit too slow or a little bit you know don't want to put that foot wrong don't want to be that first one in and you can sort of see that demonstrated here with the way that they're, they're approaching things there's not really anybody in drone uh sorry flexi and skeptic are both in drone at the minute but you know you, you do just worry about flexi droning himself in on the nook like you would expect the nook to be making a, a big mm. hero play going in through the garage or doing something along those lines not a lot of this top floor has been taken as control as they're just removing the drone there and piano lexi may be looking to make his way up these trophy stairs should be relatively clear for him to do so looks as though there's a bit of a pinch happening here onto azza whether he knows it or not sky mm -hmm. with the hop in there the dmr got the best weapon at that sort of a close range and sky gonna sit him down still that's only the first line of defense here really with only a minute left, there isn't a lot of time for Victus to be faffing around. They need to be getting themselves onto that next stage. Exactly, and again, having these kind of toxic canisters being chucked out from the top of fireplace, cutting off that piano doorway, that's going to be a little bit of a spanner in the works as well, because again, it's burning out that time. We're now nearly on 40 seconds, and well, this XQ needs to suck up the food. That's going to help a little bit. Leader being taken out by the nade by Flexi. Now it's down to Jex, Roto and Savage to try and hold off the Victors players for the last 30 seconds. But again, the crossfire is now being held and the pinches that could potentially come through. Jex on the tiniest bit of health actually takes out Wyzadon as Oscar takes down Savage. Picks himself up the down as well onto Skeptic, Ooh. but Victors still come away with it. What? Flexi. How have you pulled that one off? That was incredible <laughs> stuff. I'm not sure how Flexi's just been able to walk in there in. through main door, activate Nook's gadget, and then just shoot somebody in the site. Jegs has done everything he needed to and more exactly. on Fireplace. He'd got two kills for all intents and purposes. One of them was a down, but it doesn't matter. And the round was said and done. Diffuser cold. Just stay alive. That's all you got to do. Just stay alive. And... Lexi happens again. Big, big standout player. 10 and 5 right now. Double positive here on the night. And he may have just kept Victus in this. And this is exactly it. This is exactly it. It's the fact that, you know, Tensar burnt out that timer so, so well. And then Victus just suddenly turned around and did something a little bit out of pocket. The Nook through the fireplace just suddenly Tensar weren't prepared but how do you prepare for something like that at that point you are expecting that they're still trying to clear you know that top floor library area so why would you expect just a nook to walk in 
you know, main lobby, you wouldn't, would you? Just waltzing past the fireplace and taking you out like that. Victus on the on the heels of Ten Star now. Just one more round to get in their pockets if they want to bring this to even Stevens again. And oh, I I, I feel like I can't watch almost. It's getting way too intense for me. This is what I was worried about, Grace. This is I know, I know. <laughs> it's so good though. Like I'm so excited, but. EMP is coming through, Fratch being left on the board, and once again we're gonna see this garage wall getting open so 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 quickly. And Skeptic actually of the aggressive take the aggressive plan, it's an immediate rush, that pan is going down. Rolo and Leader not really aware. The nade comes through, it doesn't quite do anything, but there we go. The plant has been denied. Leader there with a nice shot onto Skeptic. Ready and waiting in that cubby area, and goodness gracious me, that diffuser is now in no man's land, and that's the issue with a rush as well, X. If it fails, you've just left your diffuser on site, and now you have to do a big, massive amount of clearance with no diffuser. What a weird round this is. We've got Oscar Ooh. fighting his way out of West Main stairs there. As a desperately trying to land anything he can, eventually picks up one onto Flexi. Still. Got a player at the top of West Main to be dealing with, but can instead just choose to drop the hatch. Retreat to site, guys. You've got the diffuser. You just need to stay alive here again. Oscar, very low health, but so is Jegs and Rolo. Not going to be the easiest round from here on out for either of these two teams. Ten Star have seemed to have found a little bit of balance. They've at least all managed to get themselves back down onto the site. And they can start to pick up angles and figure out which angle each of them is going to hold. Victus, really not made this one easy for themselves, Grace. They haven't, and again, this really relies on just getting a few more of these picks in your pocket. Of course, Jegs and Rollo are on a small amount of health, but so is Oscar, and Oscar's the one taking the entry now down this library staircase area, so being a little bit risky biscuits on both sides. Rollo on the flank, unsure if they would have been spotted out. Yes, indeed, they have. Wiser then. Beautiful shot to her face, potentially tagging up leader a lot there, potentially nearly got the kill there, but once again, three versus three. The side of Ten Star a little bit wounded, feeling a little bit shaken perhaps about the aggression that Victus have had to pull out of their pockets right now, X, and goodness gracious me, it looks like they're trying to set up for some form of collapse, but again, it's just a case of ring around the rosy on the bomb site. Why is it N taking out Jegs? All left down to leader and Azia, and 30 seconds on the clock. I can't watch. Close your eyes and I'll cover it. <laughs> it's, been a, it's been a messy round up until this point. The diffuse is still cold and that's the most important thing here. Azza probably got the most important part to play. He needs to win this engagement. He needs to win it now. But no, he's going to lose out on the fight. Skyty <gasps> is going to find the kill. Ooh. And the second. Victus. How do they get away with that? A round that they really should not have won. I guess it pays 10 star back for the round that they Autons have won earlier as well. 5-5, five, five, all square here. What a fight back from Victors. That timeout has worked wonders. 100% and it's not just the fact that they managed to obviously secure that, it's the fact that again, when you open a round with a failed rush, it is very very difficult to come back from that, you don't have the diffuser, you have to commit to this idea of, oh no, this is the specific bomb that we have to get next to now, so your entire execute is just 100% predicted by that defense they know exactly where you have to be at, they know exactly where you have to end up at um, and again, just by the just by, I guess, the patience really then coming through from Victus to just be like, okay, no, we'll try and clear a little bit and see what we can get. We'll even out that player count a little bit and then we'll go for that aggressive collapse. You know, even we saw on the fireplace stairs, it's we saw a little bit of a ring there on the Rosie situation where neither team, neither team's player wanted to actually fully swing that angle. They were kind of pre-firing each other a little bit, but again, chaotic is the word that I would use to describe that round X. Blimey me. Very chaotic. Very. I mean, that's what that's an analyst's nightmare. That's one that you just skip. Mm. Skip three minutes 100%. and watch the next one because there is nothing in there that is of any use whatsoever. Um, the, the, I mean, there was a couple of things, but but realistically, no, not today. Let's just uh, let's just gloss over that round. Accept that you won it and understand that it was off the back of good individual performance. <laughs> and for Ten Star, they just challenged a couple too many one versus ones, but. They are still in contention here. And I believe 10 stars still have their time out as well. So if things do start going wrong, mm. they can obviously try and pull that out of the bag. But the most important thing is this next round is going to decide who 
gets points guaranteed. Mm. It's likely to go to overtime. Spoiler alert, I know, but let's be real with ourselves here. This one has OT written all over it. Oh, 100%. But there is one team that is going to at least guarantee points, and it will be the winner of this here round. <gasps> this is naughty. Verticality going for that little bit of a pre-nade onto where you would assume a player would be, and does do significant interior damage, but doesn't quite manage to land upon Savage. So Savage for now, staying alive. And Magnet's coming out to give himself a little bit of extra cover. It's what I really like about the nade meta, actually. Obviously, that didn't work out. But the way that you can't really defend against something like that if it does work. Yeah, it's very difficult to... I mean, you've got to play someone down there, right? You've got to play someone down mm -hmm. in the big garage to, to try and actively deal with that. Oscar's got himself a lot of space to work with here. He's actually going to find a freebie. Free fires on down. The LNG can really dish out the damage at that sort of a range. Savage may be looking to challenge on to this, but it would be fairly ill-advised right now. Skyty going to try and put a bit of pressure on as well. Savage, fully blinded, needs to retreat back a little bit. Skyty did get sat down from that position previously, but he's got a lot more support here this time. Jegs goes for the swing, but the nade is enough for him to back off that and the LMG pre-firing down. Oscar just going to tank through that laser gate and push the player deeper down those library stairs. The bulletproof now finally Ooh. removed, but Flexi with a great play from that double door, somewhere that we've seen him do a lot of damage already this game. Some brilliant crossfires being held here by Victus as Oscar's just lining them up and knocking them down. Leader, you got to find yourselves an ace, my friend, and that is not going to happen. Victus, they are going to confirm points here and put themselves onto a match point absolutely and there we go tactical timeout coming through from 10 star rightly so they need this to go to overtime here they can't let this slip away from them and goodness me i mean again it's we we, we talk about you know aggression and taking gunfights but even now we're starting to see things come out of the bag that perhaps may not have been used previously we're seeing you know three stories worth of verticality again but with nades this time not the gunfights and it's um it's kind of go time for victors right now they're willing to take these plays they're willing to try and go for those kind of long vertical angles the best they can again they're starting to utilize their utility the best they can as well and it's working out a little bit better i will say there are kind of moments where 10 star are just losing their gunfights a little bit now which maybe shows that they're maybe a little bit on the ropes here um which rightly so you would be if you had got to this point again it is probably your biggest rival of the entire season and you really want to win this out so the, the nerves maybe on both sides are probably insane right now that cortisol must be sky high it's it it feels like the here we go again meme for 10 star <laughs> Where here we go again. <laughs> it really does. Where they're in that match winning position and it's like, here we go again. Because the momentum has entirely shifted. You get like a, a feeling, or at least I do, um, where Siege is concerned. And it, this is going to sound really weird, but I've watched a lot of Siege. But you, you just get a feeling of who's going to win based on how confidently players are playing. And, and based on a couple of... It's like an aura surrounding the players. And you just feel as though that's entirely dropped off from 10 star. They had it a couple of rounds ago and it switched. And now the advantage is is all on Victus. And it's not just because they're on match point. It's one round away from OT. It's still anybody's game. But it just doesn't seem like 10 it seems like 10 star are doubting themselves a little bit. It doesn't seem like they're playing with that same level of confidence. percent oh, We're seeing all three ADSs used to protect leader right now. So again, I I'm curious to see what they're expecting from Victus and even then we're seeing kind of Oscar and Sky T pull up around this games and library side so again maybe that's a really good read by 10 star here maybe they're fully prepared for whatever Victus are about to throw at them and this is where the drone works does need to come through for oh the EMP the EMPX what knocking good. all those ads is basically useless and there we go flexi of the pick onto leader cleaned up very very quickly rollo having to get aggressive on that window just to give themselves a little bit of breathing room to escape this is not going to be nice great play from victus 
like just recognizing mm. let's take a minute to solve this we've got all the tools to solve 90 percent of problem 99 percent of problems in siege you've got everything you've got hard breach you've got health you've got emps you've got soft destruction you've got nades you can solve any problem just solving problems that's all they're doing here and they're solving them in the most streamlined way possible leader there getting taken out he's been one of the bigger players here for 10 star tonight next target could be jegs playing on that fireplace the emp going to come in now that's going to open up options for yzn to throw nade through further emp to destroy any magnets or anything of that nature and it's just going to do exactly that Jex already getting pressured here as the wall is being oh opened. Goodness. Savage tried to save him, but he's, his fate has been confirmed now. Oscar looking entirely the wrong way. Why wouldn't you be looking at the top of library stairs? Savage picks himself up one for free, levels things out here. You can almost feel the tension, Grace. A hundred percent you can. Again, both these teams just trying to find the heads of each other as desperately quickly as they can and... More magnets being thrown out that aren't affected too much by the MP. So if Rooney Kate's also being reactivated, and that's certainly going to help Savage when they're holding the top of this library stairs area. Zero on a little bit of a flank of Rooney as well. Someone else that's on the move is Flexi. Mm. And that is just a dangerous combination at this point. Flexi, he's the kind of player that can just find space. He really does just find space and finds big gaping holes in what otherwise looks like a, a fairly well-rounded defense. Now, whether that's going to happen in this round or not, time will tell. Skeptic could be looking for a bit of a hop in here. It is being watched by Rollo from that closet. And without presence inside a library earlier on, there's been no destructibility done up there. So it's going to be very difficult to just hop on in. I say that. Skeptic manages to do it. Rollo gets caught looking entirely the wrong way. And now it's all down to Azza. He too will fall oh. as the final two kills fly in for Victus here. They flip there's the script. No, no overtime here tonight. Victus victorious on Chalet. 7-5 against 10 Star. There's no way it ends like that. By the tiniest flick of the wrist. By the tiniest, tiniest flick of the wrist. I mean, l looking at these highlights now, ladies and gentlemen, I think, you know, we expected this to be a scorcher and it certainly was. It was getting so, so close throughout that first half. Uncomfortably close, to be honest. Again, it was expected. The fact that this hasn't gone to overtime is so gutting for me. We did wonder who was going to come on top. And this is the important thing, 2x. We need to point out... Victors have just taken their revenge. They have. Victors have done it. And they did it in fairly convincing fashion there when they got their act together. It looked as though they were struggling quite a bit on those attacking rounds. Not a lot that was really working for them or going. And their adaptation came very similar to the way that 10 Star's adaptation came. You know, 10 Star weren't great in the first couple of rounds. And then as soon as they started revisiting sites, they were solving problems and they were coming up with solutions. And that's exactly what we saw from Victus playing some good smart siege there toward the end. And a couple of big standout performances thrown in there as well. Um, I don't think that Victus would be anywhere tonight without Flexi or Oscar. Both of those two have had massive games. Um, Flexi, of course, the, the famous sort of uh, round ending kill just at the end of this one. Um, and then, you know, multiple other rounds thrown in there as well. There's an argument to say that Victus, you know, nearly were their own worst enemy with the way that they approached a couple of rounds, the rush round, for example. Mm. Um, but, you know, it was just some really entertaining siege, I think. Yeah, 100%. Um, again, I just feel so... I feel like almost shell-shocked about the fact that it, it's over now and it hasn't gone to overtime, you know? Based on how both teams are playing, based on what I, what I kind of expected... It, it felt like it was going to go to OT. I'll be honest with you. It, it was the game of the night exactly. that we thought that this one was going to go to overtime. But we've had a very weird trend of no overtimes here in the Northern Premier League. It isn't something that we've uh, we've seen all too many of. And uh, I guess tonight follows that same pattern. Um, but, Victus, hats off to you for sure. And for 10 Star, I, I feel like I almost, you know, sort of foretold this with the <laughs> here we go again meme, Grace. You did, yeah, you did. I, I just, I feel like there was so much, especially that last round. Like I, mm. I could barely watch a few of those rounds. I could barely watch, to be honest. Um, again, it was coming way too close to the nail. The excitement was just way too much. Um, I, I just really, 
thought this was going to go to overtime. I genuinely thought it was going to go to overtime. Um, just that final clutch at the end, though, you've got to feel like a god after having a moment like mm. that. You know, it's really coming down to the nail like that, and you just turn around and just kill them before they can even get close to you especially given that the timer was ticking yeah it's this idea that it's really unfortunate for 10 star that they kind of had to go for that swing when they could have just played time maybe a little bit more and it's again this idea of had they have played time a little bit and forced that diffuse to go down i think they would have probably been a better position and i think that was the defining factor of why it didn't go to overtime, to be honest, in my opinion. And that's why I, I feel almost like I was ready for it and then it just didn't happen. And I'm there like, okay. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> yeah, I feel like it's been robbed from us, uh, yeah. as as casters and as the viewers as well. But no, hats off to Vixus for pulling that through. Certainly a very pressurizing game there. And we've got a brilliant desk to break it down. So stick around because okay. there's going to be a debrief after an interview as well. We're going to throw this one back over to Ian Fresh and whip it. Thank you, X and Grace. There was a, you know, a lot of hype, a lot of hype coming into this. And this match absolutely delivered. I think that we can all agree that ideally, like Grace said, we'd have loved to have seen a bit of overtime. We could have you know, rinse that match for us every <laughs> single drop that it was worth. But Victus were ultimately the better side there, X. X, fresh. I'm going to you fresh. You also makes me up for Grace earlier as well. I don't quite know that one happened, Ian. <laughs> um, but yeah, like you say, barring an overtime, absolutely fantastic match. And, you know, Victus, they really played the part. And Ollie said it well. It was Flexi, it was Oscar. They really were carrying their teams. We pulled them out, you know, specifically Flexi in the head-to-head. We didn't speak about Oscar much in the pre-match, but he's been known to put this roster on his back for God knows how long now. But also Flexi as well. You know, he he can he's got that potential inside of him, and we saw that today. And Victus, they finally get their you know quote unquote revenge. You know, they lost to this roster in Yukon too. They lost to them in Rumble. They've never quite had it in them to beat this roster, and it was part of the reason you know they signed for the Victus organization was when there was the talk of a, a playoff match. You know, they obviously signed to the organization who had the spot in their heads. We thought they had a bit of a mental block going up against 10 star. They've got over that tonight and they put in a great performance. Yeah. And at times whip it, we were, you know, us three are sat there watching it together and you could cut the tension with a knife. Couldn't you? You really could. You could tell that this was an almost personal matchup for these teams. I mean, Victor's so far before this match, the last three attempts at beating Tensar has all failed for them in pretty significant fashion as well. In UK 2, they lost 7-1 in both their matches in the Rumble Final. It was 7-2 losses. And to have such a close match take all 12 rounds to get the victory, massive for them. But every round was an absolute war. Nothing was given for free. And there was some quiet moments in the call that we just could not believe or we were just sitting on the edge of our seat waiting for either executions to happen or retakes. It was lit lived up to all the hype. I'll tell you what, whip it, give your bum a rest and just shuffle back into your seat. You don't need to be on the edge of it for a minute, right? You can relax for a sec, so can you fresh. We're going to have an interview then I'm coming back to you guys. So feet up for a sec as we bring Flexi from Victus onto the show. That was a big, big, big win for you guys. You know, everybody was talking about it. All of our analysts, all of the fans watching along were ready for that. And did you feel like it was a big occasion for you as well, Flexi? I mean, yeah, it's always a big occasion to play against the best up and coming team in the world, actually, the best up and coming team club in the, in the UK scene. So it's quite good that um, even though they knew all our strat book, we still won. So it's quite good. Yeah, it's, it's better than quite good. It was very impressive. A really impressive win from you guys. And Flexi, we were just talking there on the desk about how it felt a little bit tense to watch it, like a little bit edgy. It, did you feel that with, within the game? Were you feeling that tension? Yeah, obviously there's a quite a big rivalry, a friendly rivalry, and in other cases not very good rivalry because of the past results in between the team that I joined, so Victus and Tensta. Um, obviously coming into this game, um, we were excited to play it. There was something that happened before, which is quite funny, that basically, well, threw us off guard. I'm not going to say what it is, but um, well, let's just say they knew what maps we played. Um, okay, right, okay. All right, so... I mean, personally, I I won't really wanted to beat them because of that, and also because I have people there that I know. And I mean, Kangaroo Candy speaks a lot of Oscar and Jake, and so it's like it's personal, and we won. So. Hey, 
was going to be the best Sometimes a, a personal feud tends to play out well for us viewers and we get to enjoy it. I don't know if it's as enjoyable for you guys on the map, but for us, it's a, it's a treat. Um, it's a real... seven, yeah, <laughs> I can imagine. Um, Flexi, right, a real standout performance from you there. Oscar as well, but speaking to you, uh, multiple like imp important and impressive kills from yourself. Do you feel any pressure on your, on your shoulders to deliver for this roster? No, no, not really. I know that the team, for example, will play like SkyT and, and also Joe. Their stats haven't been the best this season, but it just goes to show that we have really good individuals. All five players can play really well. So it's good that me and Oscar can play well, but I know that when me and Oscar don't play well and we're not having the best day, SkyT and Oscar will play and Joe will play really well. And you see that both of them... Joe had a... Yuan had a... Quite a quiet start to the game, but then he got really important kills on our attacks, which at the end of the day, that's what matters. That round where Skyty dropped the dining hatch on our attack, that's what matters. It doesn't matter me getting kills in the middle of the rounds. If in the late round, those players like Joe, Skyty, and Skeptic, if they don't step up, then that's a problem, but they do, and that's at the end of the day. Like I don't feel any pressure on myself. Absolutely. You've got, a, you've got a very strong roster and that was a very strong performance from you guys, Flexi. So congratulations. And I'm sure <laughs> that I will speak much. to you again very soon. Yeah, hopefully. More interviews to come. <laughs> Absolutely. Nice glasses, by the way. Yeah, they're very nice. Got them last year. Very cool. Yeah, they are dope. All right. Thank you, Flexi. <laughs> Thank Have you, a good night. Have a good night. Cheers, man. All right. Another... What? Fresh, you are you nice listening? glasses to everybody but me, Ian. Fre I was just about to say, Fresh, I love your glasses. That's that's the yeah. next point I was about to make. Taking them off. But I'm taking mine off the van. <laughs> no, actually, I can't, I can't see, see, I can't see anything. anything I'm put I can't <laughs> These are going right back on. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, th I, there was obviously a bit of a personal vendetta going on from both teams there, Whip It, but that makes it arguably better for us, right? Oh, yeah, you touched on it perfectly. When there's... Something personal at stake, you can feel that tension. Everyone watching it, casting it, everything, you can feel that. And every moment of that match resonated that energy. Victus wanted this victory. It meant more than just the three points in the standings. It's the revenge from Rumble. It's all their work put on into grinding and getting better. As I touched on, Tensor, when they beat them the previous outings, done it by a large margin. Now to be able to finally get that victory and in spell so that match looked dominant, massive ups to Victus. Well played from them. Yeah, um, Fresh, how big of an upset for 10 Star is this? Uh, it's not an upset. I mean, like, how big of a blow is it for these guys? It's massive. Like, yeah. it, it quite literally is. Is there's, there's been a lot of hype around this roster. You know, I'm certainly at the forefront of that, but I know other people are that this roster in a lot of people's minds is it has one hand on the CL spot already, right? Mm -hmm. um, so the fact that they keep dropping these results and they're lacking in confidence and we've seen that from them throughout some of these results you know the the fact of the matter they 7-1 7-2 the last three times they've played victors and then have lost to them 5-7 um something's not quite there and it's a blow and they need to they've got one more game tomorrow before having a nice long break until they play again but they really need to figure it out before the second split of this season absolutely all right let's take a look at our end of day results here before we start to move on and look ahead to our debrief. Here's how it all played out on play day seven. It went pretty quickly. Uh, the one thing worth noting if you joined us a little bit later today is the fact that Navi were beaten by Coalesce seven nil might stand out to you. That is because Navi actually did forfeit um, today's play day and there won't be an action tomorrow either. But the rest of the evening, it's been pretty good entertainment for us Siege fans, hasn't it, Whip It? Oh, it's been fantastic so far. That opening game, Riddle and Eminem, on paper, that should not have been an 8-7 result. I don't even think it could. you can write a fair result of that one. Eminem Academy at a halfway stage of that match for 6-1 up against Riddle. Mm. Riddle battled it all the way back to overtime. And I think if you have a chance, if, you've, if you didn't get to watch that live, go back and watch that VOD in particular. It will blow you away, some of the plays that happened there. Ambush, clinical against Arctic, 7-1. Team Heroic, similar story. Just didn't let Viperia 86 into that matchup apart from those first two rounds. And Victor's 10 star lived up to every part of the hype, the building we gave it today. A fantastic personal matchup between teams and Victor's finally getting that revenge. Yeah, let's see what this means for our standing, shall we freshen? After play day seven, here's how things are looking. Team Heroic maintain their 
absolute onslaught here and and they're in first place with 20 points on the board victor's staying strong as well 19 sitting behind them um not much change in regards to positioning but it's still pretty close in that mid table isn't it yeah i mean you've got a couple of breakaways happening right now so you've got heroic and victus who based on split one are probably going to be the top two throughout the season you've then got kind of viperio 86 all the way down to navi in the current position of jostling for that kind of playoff position and then you've got coalesce arctic and riddle unfortunately three of the nordic teams in their own kind of mini league competing for the kind of right to you know not be relegated um not too much has changed in terms of the positioning um as we say and i'll point out specifically that 10 star loss what that's done to them is it's kind of split them off you're talking about if they'd have been on 13 points, they could have really been closing in on Victor's who would have been on 16. Is a battle for top two. Um, that loss has really, it's put nine points between them rather than pulled them in between kind of three points. Um, so it's a big, I said it at the start of the game, it was a big six point of that 10 star versus Victor's game. Yes, it was indeed. All right, we are going to be seeing these standings potentially change again tomorrow. And you might be sitting there thinking, is that the end of Playday 7? When it comes to gameplay, yes, it is. When it comes to conversation, absolutely not. The post-show, our debrief, is on the horizon. We are going to be getting into that in just a matter of minutes' time. And it is AMA. We are doing Ask Me Anything. So myself, the rest of the gang here, and we've got a special guest joining us as well. So get ready. Your questions are going to be answered next. My name's Nikki, I am Chase's mum and we first met Special Effect at EGX some years ago when both me and my husband went up for the day and uh, we found a stand called Special Effect. Never heard of it before, didn't realise there was such a thing as a, a gaming charity for the disabled. So before we visited Special Effect, I mean, we've always been a huge gaming family and um, gaming is something I wanted all my children to, to be able to have the opportunity to do. Chase has got a severe form of cerebral palsy and he has dystonia which means he can't fully control his body very well. Even trying to get Chase to push uh, a button is really difficult to do because he just doesn't have the fine motor skills to do it. But he really loved gaming and you could see that he wanted to do more. So we went up to the uh, gaming room in Oxford and so throughout the day we tried lots of different pieces of equipment, lots of different games until we found out what worked best for Chase. As a parent, it's uh, made so much difference to Chase being able to access video games. You know, I was really sad that I thought that he was never really going to be able to join in and do those things on his own. Oh. <laughs> Particularly to disabled people, I think games are really important because, you know, someone who's uh, able-bodied can go out, they can play golf, they can go and drive a car, they can do almost anything in real life. Chase isn't going to have those same opportunities. So being able to sit down and put on a game means that it creates a level playing field. He can do an activity that he probably wouldn't be able to do in, in normal day-to-day -day life. Um, but even better, with gaming, he can play alongside someone who's able-bodied. And it gives a real boost to his self-confidence, I think. Mm, that was good, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
in. Three quick kills. Four quick kills come in. And Slothar just picks them apart. Let's try and put some shots on in and managing to find the last two. Oh, the blur just decimates. Chris steps up huge for Ambush. Three kills. All E1 DCs. What? There it is. You're into the debrief. You are watching the Rainbow Six Northern Premier League. All of the gameplay, all of the action is done and dusted. And now we can just like relax a little bit, kick back and answer some questions. My name's Ian Chambers. We are here in debrief with the one and only Fresh. And we've got Whip It as well. I need to give, I need to do something with your name as well, Whip It. I, was, I felt like I only delivered. Roll the peas, I guess. Ian. Roll the what? Can the you peas? even roll peas? <laughs> Um, <laughs> whip, nah, this, I mean, this doesn't work. It doesn't have the same ring it to just, it. It just it doesn't, doesn't work. It doesn't. Maybe next time I'll try again. All right, we can bring on a special guest as well from Coalesce. We have analyst and coach Huber on the show. Huber, how are you doing? I'm uh, pretty good. Thank you. Thank you for having me. No, it's a pleasure. We've been looking forward to having you on. Um, first things first, how do you feel about the three points that you picked up tonight? Um, obviously, we needed it. We haven't had the best season yet so far, but yeah, we are looking to get some tomorrow and uh, next bit. Yeah, there's still plenty of time for you to get some points on the board, so we'll be keeping a close eye on you as you go along. Um, if you keep a close eye on the Rainbow Six UK Twitter, you'll have seen that we put out a bit of a tweet earlier on asking for your questions here in the debrief. It is our AMA section. Um, that means that me, Fresh, Whippet, and Huber are going to answer any of the questions that you tweeted us. Absolutely anything you want. And just during the break, a couple of weird ones came through. I don't know if they're going to come up in time. Um, and some of them were aimed at me. Surly, snurly from talking to you, all right? Um, but for now, let's bring up some of the questions and see what we have received um, during the show. So this is from Jake Southster. What's one thing you would like to see more from teams strategically, e.g. more rushes, better use of repick, etc.? I'm going to come to you first, Fresh. Um, can I just say uh, I'd like more questionable interviews like the one Flexi just gave? Um, no, yeah. that's not a real answer, is it? Um, <laughs> look, I think the biggest problem with a lot of teams in this league is it's painfully obvious to see the mistakes they're making. Um, so I would like to see them have multiple layers of different strats, i.e. the, for example, the, the game me and Whippet cast, the very first game, it was Eminem Academy against Riddle. Um, and you do round one, two, and three, right? And then you hit round four, five, or six, where teams are going through a full rotation, but they're doing the same strats and the team, you know, same defensive strat and the team attacking it does the same attacking strat that's failed. Um, so I'd like to see teams kind of try adapting a little bit more and have two or three different strats for every single month side of the camp. Huber, you looked like you were nodding your head there. Do you agree with Fresh? I kind of agree, but I would also like to see kind of like more clean rounds, like predicting the enemy, what they're going to pick, like uh, going for a roam take, then, okay, we can expect this roamer to be at, let's say, minute 24 at this point of the area or like this area, kitchen, dining, somewhere. Cool. What about you, Whippet? I mean, I really enjoyed the way Ambush played. It was like hunting down information and trying to make that aspect of the game difficult for their opponents. And it's like, you see meet mozzies all the time, but you don't see teams actively looking to really disparage and really take away drones. I think it could be an interesting idea if teams perhaps learn pre placed drones. I'm sure they do in, in VODs. They sort of learn where teams are likely to put their drones. The way Ambush done it was very interesting today, at least. All right, good stuff, guys. Let's move on to the next question. Um, I'm, I get nervous. I, every single time I'm waiting for these questions, <laughs> probably, I'm like, oh, what's it going to be? What is it going to be? Uh, here it is. Oh, okay, so Emmy's got in touch. At Captain Fluke awesome. on Twitter. If you don't follow her already, kiss, marry, or kill. Um, our three. We've got X, Des, and Ace. I'm just, I'm going to come to you, Whip It. Right, well, the easy one. You've got to marry Ace. He's been painting the house all weekend. He's done a fantastic job. That's marriage material right there. He knew how many layers to white paint to put on. Mm -hmm. the, the difficult one is going to be between X and Dez. X is 
on the stream with me. So I'm gonna say I'm gonna kiss him and Des, I'm unfortunate for you. You're gonna have to you know, on the chopping block for this one. Mm, I feel like I don't know who I'd this is really tough. All right, so I love all three of these guys. <laughs> um, if I had to spend all of my time with one person, like like the marriage thing, I'm gonna have to marry Ace. Because number one, you know, he's a very caring, loving man. Number two, he's not gonna clog, clog up the sink with hair. <laughs> and um <laughs> What you what end up fresh. Um I'm gonna I'm gonna kiss X. And I'm gonna marry both Des and Ace. That's my answer. All right, that's what I'm. That's where I'm going. Um, I've just been told. What? Can I go to a video? Do you want me to go to a video? Let's go to a video. I've just been told that. Okay, yeah. fresh, fresh. You've got. Give us these first, three. I think. Yeah. So the video is going to be completely relevant to me, and I'm surprised you don't remember it, Ian, because uh, I have actually kissed this. Um, it was all in the name of charity, which I'm gonna guess is the video that we're gonna play at some point. Um, here it is. <laughs> that was you, Ian. Oh, no. That's Des. That's me. I remember this. Yeah, spinning the wheel. Here it is. The moving potential. Oh, here it comes. He sits on you. Oh, there it is. I kept saying go to the brick. Okay, we went. And we did go to the brick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm, so you're gonna kiss you're gonna kiss Des obviously um, again, right? Well, you know he's a good kiss. So the thing is that I've been pondering this. If if my cast seemed a little bit off during the heroic game, it's because I was pondering this. Uh, I would marry Ace. I think that's Ace is just definitely marriage material. Yeah. Um, and I just can't imagine kisses, kissing X's beard. So I would kiss Des and kill X. Unfortunately. Wow, X is X is getting X'd. Yeah. Uber. I'm going to be completely out of the line, so I'm going to marry, actually, Des. Yeah, I think he, he is he's funny, he's funny. I'm going to kiss Ace, <laughs> and unfortunately, I have to kill an uh, x -Roy. Oh, sorry, X. <laughs> X got smoked twice. Who did you kill again with it? Uh, it was Des. Des. <laughs> okay, I'm killing X as well. There we go, let's go with that. <laughs> All right, next question. <laughs> let's move on to the next one. I imagine we're going to get a few of these coming through. All right, Tifflings. Double M, if you could have a rematch of any game this season so far, which one would it be? That's good. Maybe the last one we just saw. Fresh, what do you think? The last one we just saw, Ian. Yeah. Of course. Um, let me have a think. Let me have a think. Come back to me. You, ha you have a think, and I'll come to yeah, you, yeah. Huber. Any, any, any oh. coalesced uh, matches that you would like to replay? Obviously, there are some in my mind. Uh, first of all, the Victus game, where we had quite uh, um, exact analysis of the mm -hmm. exact map, what we wanted, with exact times where the player is going to be. And we just had, I, I think, nervousness just came out to us. So I, I think if we would replay that, would come out Quite different, but yeah. Yeah, you definitely wouldn't be as nervous then, right? Um, Whip it, what do you think? I'm going to have to go with, with 10 Star versus Heroic. It was such a close game and it could have went anyway. I, I think Fresh is going for the, the same option. One, though, yeah. uh, no, it's, <laughs> no, it's there's plenty of other good options, but it was so close. I mean, if you keep everything the same it was, like the same, I mean, don't believe Heroic was with their full roster for that one. You keep it in the exact same situation. That is a 50 50 game. And what we saw, especially with the way Benja pop, popped up and really pulled Heroic to victory that one, mm. I think that could have went anyway. And just for how close and competitive it was, I'd love to see them run that back. Good choice. All right, let's move on to the next question. Um, here it comes. Fresh, unless you wanted to answer that. Did you have a game in mind? Okay, cool. Um, huh? I don't know. I mean, I wouldn't... The, the first game tonight, actually, Eminem against Riddle. Not because the quality of Siege was good, because it wasn't. Um, but it was very entertaining, and a lot of rounds should have gone the other way. So it was a very entertaining match to watch. I won't mind seeing that one again. Yeah, good choice. All right, next question. Here we go. What's it going to be? Um, all right, what do you think of this? What does Whippet use in his hair to get that shine? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guess that the shine is strictly from Hairspray. No, it's not. It's Ooh. unfortunately not. It is, I use whatever is easiest to get and cheapest when I go in to buy stuff for my hair. That's it. That's so whatever's there up for grabs. Yeah. It's not, <laughs> it's not even going to be, I believe like, 
if when you see me after the split, it's not gonna be this long. Like I've gotta get it trimmed before I travel away to Charlotte, so it's gonna be like short from now on. Long hair whip, it's done. Pink delicious, good choice. Uh, good choice of question there. Um, and keep <laughs> shining, whip it. Next question. Here we go. What is the next one gonna be? Because now we know that we can ask absolutely anything. Jakey Boy Pro says. Hubert, it's been a tough season for yourself so far. How do you see your team performing in the second split? Okay, so obviously, yeah, tough season. Uh, tomorrow we are hoping for points. I'm not going to say anything for tomorrow because every time I say something, it just goes directly the other way. So just leave it at that. Um, Obviously, we weren't happy with our performances yet, and we are changing things. I'm not going to say anything else because I don't want to leak anything yet. Maybe maybe later into the break, some, some okay. leakage. But uh, yeah, we are going into it. Uh, we want to get top six to get into finals. That's, that's what I'm going to say. If we don't get top six, then we, are, we will be grinding the open qualifiers for Challenger League. Okay. Well, I believe in you guys. Right, let's move on to the next question. Thank you for that one, Jakey Boy. I've heard you're a lovely man. Here is the next one coming through. Um, drum roll, please, Fresh. My camera's shaking. Hey, from Captain Flute once again, Emmy says, would you rather fight one giant-sized demo casts or 100 mini demos? So. I'm going to answer this first. Either way, I think I could take him down. <laughs> um, the only thing is, is that if you, if you took on a giant demo, like, it'd be, it'd be easier to, to get him to be active, right? Because I've been places with demo, right? Getting 100 mini demos to be in a place at, at, at one time and get him, out from, get him away from his PC would be really, really incredibly difficult. So I'm going to take on giant-sized demo and I think I would spark him out. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Fresh? Um, gosh. I hope he's watching right now. 100 mini demos. <laughs> just the idea of that. Chewing your ear off about some nonsense that you just don't care about. Um, <laughs> oh, we love him really, though. But we right. do love him really. <sighs> I would go one giant size demo as well, I think. I don't know why. I, I have no log. I mean, this question's not logical. <laughs> I have no logic to why I would go 100 at uh, one demo. All right, next question. <laughs> We're moving on to the next one, and let's see who this one is from. I don't know how many more we've got left, but I imagine that Jakey will inform me as we go along. All right, Snurrelief. Ian, <laughs> how are we the same age, and yet you look... Does somebody else want to read this out? This is, uh... I, I, can, I can read it. I can okay, read it. fresh. I'm Snurrelief. Ian, how are we the same age and yet you look like Robert Downey Jr. and Hemsworth's love child and I look like I just finished up a secondary? <laughs> Is the relief saying that he looks like young, like a young kid? I don't know. I, he, I don't know what he's saying most of the time. I'm, I think... I think it might be down a moisturizer and a beard. I think that's all it comes down to, the relief. But I, I'm going to take that as a, as a really nice compliment, so I appreciate that. I've got the answer to this one, Ian. Go on. You are simply the guy. Are you saying that I'm the guy? <laughs> yeah, I'm saying you are the guy. I really appreciate that, Fresh. Uh, let's <laughs> move on to the next question. <laughs> Whip it giggling away. All right, let's get on to the next one. Cairo Cast, if you had your own intro song for being on cast, what would it be? Whip it. What's the theme music? The old theme song for Yukin. That, that lives rent-free in my brain. I can't get it. It's stuck in there. I can't, well, I can't remember. It. It's actually... I have it on Spotify. Let me pull it up. You have it on Spotify. You're gonna play this for us right now. I I don't think I have right. I don't want to like ruin uh, our producer's life because I can try and force audio through my mic, but that would probably break something, and that wouldn't be nice. But it's called to uh, Come Together, and it's what used to play at the start of every Yukin gig or every Yukin stream. And because I watch so much of it, it's just burnt into my brain, and I, I can't get it out. So that would probably be my intro. Okay, good choice. Good choice. What about you, Fresh? Um. Hmm. I feel like it would have to be a Christmas song. What? Well, a Christmas song would piss people off, wouldn't it? And oh, I, do a good, okay. I do a good job of that at times, so... Okay, so you yeah, want a song just... that's going to piss people off. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. Just give me any Christmas song. Doesn't matter which. 
I'll remember that. If I ever see you at a, like a big event or anything, I'm going to request a Christmas song for when you come out onto the stage, all right? <laughs> Sounds good um, to me. Huber, what do you reckon? Um, not for my cast, but uh, for my team, I would take stronger from the score. It's basically describing the current situation. So we will keep trying and let's see. Good choice. I'd come out with a Cisco thong song. Let's wrap this up. Um, thank you so much, everybody. This has been the debrief. This has been play date number seven here for the Rainbow Six Northern Premier League. Um, I've absolutely loved it. It's whistled by, and every single match that we hyped up to be a banger did deliver. So thank you, everybody, for watching. We have still got play date eight to come this week. We'll be getting stuck into that tomorrow at the exact same time. So we will see you then. Huber, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure having you on the debrief, man. It was also a pleasure being on here. Good. You have to come back again. Fresh. Whip it. See you soon. Bye for now, everybody. One look at the patience, he just has to send away two of the lineup. One, two! Oh, Doki! What a play! That is why he is one of the best players in the world right now. Have now adapt and he can swing this with the Ella Striker, and they're not ready for with the Ella SMG. Botted Tyrant fires the oh. on the second shot. He's dropped the pistol. He's dropped into pro on the ten oh. seconds oh. left. Tyrant, what a round! He's in position to strike. He's able to land his shots here. He got a huge oh. swing. Picks up two. That's surprising that no he didn't fall back at that point. And now we're left in a very tight situation. Ryan has just walked his way through. He gets two. Unica is going to take a little bit of damage as well. But oh, with his back against Unica, Rock is going to go down, but instantly traded. Harold with a double there. That's huge.